Part three, chapter seven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter seven. Two years before this, Pierre, on his return to Petersburg from his tour among his estates, found himself involuntarily at the head of the Petersburg Freemasons. He established dining lodges and burial lodges. He gained over new members, labored for the union of various lodges, and for the acquisition of original documents. He gave his money freely toward the building of a Masonic temple, and, so far as it lay in his power, pushed forward the collections for charity, in regard to which the majority of the members were penurious or unpunctual. He supported almost unaided the almshouse established by the order in Petersburg. His life, in the meantime, went on the same as before, with the same inclinations and dissipations. He liked the pleasures of the table, good eating and wines, and although he looked upon it as immoral and degrading, he could not keep himself from the gaieties of his bachelor friends with whom he mingled. Amid the fog of all his various occupations and enterprises, Pierre, however, before a year was over, began to be conscious that the Masonic ground on which he stood was giving way faster and faster under his feet, the more he tried to maintain himself upon it. At the same time, he felt that the more the ground on which he stood yielded under him, the more inextricably he was committed to it. When he first entered Freemasonry, he experienced the sensations of a man who unquestioningly sets his foot on the smooth surface of a bog. On bearing his weight upon it, he begins to sink. In order fully to persuade himself of the solidity of the ground whereon he stands, he sets down another foot, and slumps in more deeply than before, and, being caught in it, he, in spite of himself, wades in it up to the knee. Osip, or rather Iosip Alexievich, was no longer in Petersburg. Of late, he had done with the Petersburg lodges, and lived exclusively at Moscow. All the brethren, the members of the lodges, were Pierre's acquaintances in everyday life, and it was hard for him to see them as merely brothers, according to Freemasonry, and not as Prince B, and not as Ivan Vasilievich D, whom he knew in society, for the most part, as weak and insignificant men. Under their Masonic aprons and insignia, he could not help seeing their uniforms and the decorations which they had obtained in the world. Oft-times, when collecting the contributions and counting the twenty or thirty rubles received, for the most part in promises, from a dozen men, half of whom were able to pay as he himself was, Pierre remembered the Masonic oath, whereby each brother bound himself to give all his possessions to his fellow men, and then doubts would arise, though he would strive not to dwell upon them. He divided all the brethren whom he knew into four categories. In the first he placed those who took no interest in the transactions of the lodges, or in human affairs in general, but were exclusively absorbed in the mysterious doctrines of the order, absorbed in questions as to the threefold nature of God, or the three primordial elements of matter, sulfur, mercury, and salt, or as to the significance of the cube, and all the symbolism of Solomon's temple. Pierre reverenced this class of masons, to which belonged principally the older members of the Brotherhood, and Iosif Alexievich, in Pierre's opinion, but he could not share in their pursuits. His heart was not attracted by the mysterious side of masonry. In the second category he reckoned himself and those like him, seekers, inclined to waver, not yet successful in walking the straight and intelligible way of masonry, but all the time striving to walk in it. In the third category he placed the brethren, and they formed the majority, who saw in Freemasonry nothing but superficial formalities and ceremonies, and who insisted upon the strenuous fulfillment of these external forms, caring nothing for their real essence and significance. Such were Volarsky, and even the Grand Master of the Supreme Lodge. In the fourth category, finally, were reckoned also the great mass of the brethren, and especially those who had been admitted since he had. These were men who, according to Pierre's observation, believed nothing, desired nothing, and entered the brotherhood simply for the sake of bringing themselves into intimate relations with the rich young men endowed with influential connections who abounded in the lodges. Pierre began to feel dissatisfied with his activity. Masonry, at least masonry such as he knew it in Russia, it sometimes seemed to him, was founded on mere formalities. He did not dream of doubting masonry itself, but he was persuaded that Russian Freemasonry was on the wrong track, and had turned aside from its first principles. 
and therefore toward the end of that year pierre went abroad to become initiated into the highest mysteries of the order in the summer of eighteen o nine pierre returned to petersburg through correspondence carried on between our masons and those abroad it became known that Buzakoy had succeeded in winning the confidence of many individuals standing in the very highest ranks of the order, had been initiated into the deepest secrets, had been raised to the very highest degrees, and was bringing back to Russia notions of the greatest advantage for the co-fraternity. The Petersburg Masons all flocked around him, trying to get into his good graces, and it was intimated to all that he had something weighty in store which he was getting ready for them. A solemn meeting was called of the Lodge of the Second Degree, and Pierre promised to communicate the message with which he was charged by the supreme directors of the order. The session was crowded. After the ordinary business was concluded, Pierre got up and began his speech. "'Beloved brethren,' he began, flushing and hesitating, and holding in his hand his address already written, "'it is not enough to keep our secrets in the privacy of the Lodge Room. It is necessary to act.' to act. We have fallen into a state of torpor, and we must act. Here Pierre paused, and took to his manuscript. For the propagation of pure truth, and for securing the triumph of virtue, he read, we must purge men of their prejudices, and spread abroad regulations consonant with the spirit of the time. We must undertake the education of the young, and make ourselves one by indissoluble bonds with men of intellect. We must boldly, and at the same time prudently, contend with superstition, infidelity, and folly. We must organize among men devoted to our cause bands of workers united together by singleness of aim and possessed of power and strength. For the furtherance of these ends, we must weight the scale so that virtue and not vice will tip the beam. We must strive to make it possible for the virtuous man, even in this world, to receive the eternal rewards for his good deeds, but these mighty undertakings find a tremendous obstacle in existing political institutions. What, then, are we to do in such a state of affairs? Shall we use revolutionary methods? Shall we overturn all things, oppose force with force? No, we are very far from advising that. All violent reforms deserve censure, because they can never do away with evil so long as men are what they are, and therefore it is the part of wisdom not to employ violence. The whole aim of our fraternity should consist in making men consistent, virtuous, joined together in the unity of a conviction, a conviction that it is their duty everywhere and with all their might to oppose vice and folly and the wasting of their talents and virtues, to raise worthy men from the dust and unite them into one brotherhood. Only then our fraternity will secure the power of insensibly binding the hands of those who work disorder, and so direct them that they will not be aware of it. In a word, it is necessary to found a dominant form of government which shall propagate itself over the whole world without destroying social ties or preventing other forms of government from still continuing to maintain their own special rights and do everything except stand in the way of the mighty objects of our fraternity, which is to make virtue triumph over vice. This was the aim proposed by Christianity itself. It taught men to be wise and good and, for their own advantage, to follow the example and precepts of the best and wisest men. At a time when all were immersed in darkness, it was sufficient, of course, to have preaching alone. The novelty of the truth constituted its particular strength, but at the present day we are obliged to make use of far more powerful means. It is necessary now that a man, guided by his senses, should find in virtue a genuine charm. It is impossible to eradicate the passions. One must, therefore, strive to guide them to salutary ends, and, accordingly, it is requisite that every man should satisfy them within the limits of virtue, and our fraternity should furnish the means for this end. As soon as we have enrolled a considerable number of worthy men in every land, each one of them will bring around him two others, and all will be straightly united together and then all things will be possible for our fraternity, which has already been able to do much, though working secretly, for the advantage of humanity. This discourse produced not only a profound impression, but even a genuine excitement. The majority of the brethren affected to see in it the dangerous doctrines of the Illuminati, and Pierre was amazed at the coldness with which it was received. Footnote. The Illuminati. 
was a famous society of mystics founded by Professor Adam Weishaupt of Germany in 1776, and numbering 2,000 members, many of whom were Freemasons, prohibited by the Bavarian government in 1784. End footnote. The Grand Master began to raise objections to Pierre's theories. Pierre, with growing heat, tried to defend them. It was a long time since they had had such a stormy session. The members were divided into parties. Some accused Pierre and criticized him for preaching the mystical doctrines of the Illuminati. Others defended him. Pierre, for the first time, at this meeting, was struck by the endless variety of human minds, the result of which is that no truth presents itself alike to any two men. Even those who seemed to be on his side accepted him in their own way, with mental reservations and changes, with which he could not agree, since his chief desire was nothing else than to transfer his thoughts to others, exactly as he himself understood it. Toward the end of the meeting, the Grand Master, with some ill feeling, ironically called Buzakoy's attention to his heat, and remarked that it was not so much love toward humanity as it was the impulse of quarrelsomeness that had dragged him into the discussion. Pierre made no reply, and asked bluntly whether his scheme would be accepted. When he was told no, Pierre, without waiting for the usual formalities, left the lodge and went home. End of chapter 7 Part 3, Chapter 8 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 8. Pierre now found himself again the victim of the old melancholy which he dreaded so much. He spent the three days that followed the reading of his discourse at the lodge, at home on the sofa, seeing no one, and not once stirring out of doors. At this time he received a letter from his wife, who begged him to grant her an interview, described her sorrow at what had happened, and her desire to devote her whole life to him. At the end of the letter she informed him that she was about to return to Petersburg from abroad. Shortly after the receipt of this letter, one of the Masonic brethren, whom he respected less than the others, broke in upon his solitude, and, leading the conversation to Pierre's domestic grievances, took it upon himself to say to him, in the way of brotherly advice, that his severity towards his wife was unjust and that Pierre had swerved from the first rules of the brotherhood, which called for forgiveness of the penitent. At the same time also his mother-in-law, the wife of Prince Vasily, sent for him, begging him to call upon her, if only for a few minutes, in regard to a matter of supreme importance. Pierre saw that he was destined to be over-persuaded, that they were bound to have him reconciled to his wife, and indeed this was not wholly disagreeable to him, in the state of mind in which he found himself. It was all the same to him— he now felt that nothing in life was of great importance, and under the influence of the low spirits which had ruled him, he prized neither his own freedom nor his obstinate determination to punish his wife. No one is right, no one is to blame, and of course she was not to blame, he said to himself. If Pierre did not immediately agree to a reconciliation with his wife, it was simply because in this condition of melancholy in which he found himself, he had not the energy to take the first step in the matter. If his wife had come to him, he would simply not have driven her away. In comparison with what now occupied him, was it not a matter of supreme indifference to him whether he lived or did not live with his wife? Vouchsafing no reply either to his wife or her mother, Pierre, late one evening, started off and went to Moscow in order to have a consultation with Bazdeev. This is what Pierre wrote in his diary. Moscow, November 29. I have only just come from the benefactors, and I make haste to transcribe all my experiences with him. Iosif Alexievich lives in extreme poverty, and has been suffering for two years past with painful affection of the bladder. No one has ever heard him utter a groan or a word of complaint. From morning till late at night he spends all his time, except while at his most simple meals, devoting himself to scientific work. He received me courteously, and I sat down on the bed where he was lying. I gave him the grip of the knights of the East and of Jerusalem. He replied with the same, and with a benignant smile, asked me what I had learned and experienced in the Prussian and Scottish lodges. I told him everything that I knew. Then I related to him the proposal which I had made before our Petersburg lodge, and described the unfriendly reception which it had received, and the rupture which had arisen between me and the brethren. Iosip Alexievich said nothing for some little time, and was lost in thought, 
Then he expounded his views in regard to the whole matter, so that all the past was made plain to me as well as the way which lay stretched out before my feet. He surprised me by asking if I remembered the threefold object of the fraternity. One, the conservation and study of the mysteries. Two, self-purification and regeneration, so as to be able to receive them. And three, the regeneration of the human race through striving after such purification. What is the first and chief of these aims? Of course it must be self-purification and regeneration. Only thereby can we strive to make our way onward, independent of all circumstances. But at the same time this very aim constrains us to the most arduous labors, and often, being deceived by our pride, we lose sight of this aim, and strive either to penetrate the mystery which we are incapable of accepting on account of its purity, or else we make an effort toward improving humanity when we merely show in ourselves an example of turpitude and depravity. Illuminism is not pure doctrine, precisely for the reason that it has been carried away by the charms of social activity and has become puffed up with pride. From this standpoint, Iosip Alexievich criticized my discourse and all my activity. I agreed with him in the depths of my soul. During the course of our conversation, we touched on my domestic troubles, and he said to me, The chief obligation of a true mason, as I told you once before, consists in the perfecting of self. But oft times we imagine that if we were freed from all the hardships of life, we should soon attain this end. On the contrary, my dear sir, said he, only in the tumults of life can we attain the three chief ends. One, self-knowledge, for a man can learn to know himself only through comparison. Two, perfection, which is attained only by battling. And three, the chief virtue, love of death. Only the vicissitudes of life can teach us its falsity and stimulate our innate love of death, which is, in other words, our new birth into another and better life. These words were all the more impressive from the fact that Iosif Alexievich, in spite of his severe physical sufferings, had never felt the burdens of this life, and yet he loves death, though in spite of all the purity and loftiness of his nature, he never feels that he is yet sufficiently prepared for it. Then the benefactor fully explained to me the grand square of creation and demonstrated that the numbers three and seven were the foundation of all other things. He counseled me to avoid a breach with the Petersburg brethren, to take upon myself only the obligations of the second degree, and while winning the brethren away from the dominion of pride, to strive to keep them on the straight road toward self-knowledge and perfection. Moreover, he advised me, above all things, to keep a strict watch over myself, and for this purpose he gave me this notebook, in which I am now writing, in which I am henceforth to keep account of all my actions. Petersburg, December 5. Again I am living with my wife. My mother-in-law, with tears in her eyes, came to me and said that Ellen was back, and that she begged me to hear her, that she was innocent, that she was unhappy at my putting her away, and many such things. I was well aware that if I once allowed myself to see her, I should not have the force to repulse her request. In my perplexity I did not know whose help and advice to seek. If the benefactor had been here, he would have told me. I shut myself up alone in my room, read over Iosip Alexievich's letters, recalled my conversations with him, and, taking all things together, I came to the conclusion that I had no right to refuse her request, and that if it was my duty to offer the hand of help to every one, all the more was it to a person so closely united to me, and that I was in duty bound to bear my cross. But if I pardoned her for the sake of right doing, then my reunion with her must have merely a spiritual end and aim, and thus I made up my mind, and thus I wrote to Iosip Alexievich, I told my wife that I would beg her to forget all the past, that I would beg her to pardon me for anything in which I had been blameworthy toward her, and that I had nothing to forgive. It was a pleasure for me to tell her that. No one need for her to know how trying it was for me to see her again. I have taken up my abode in the upper rooms of the great mansion, and I rejoice in a pleasant sense of regeneration. End of chapter 8 Part Three, Chapter Nine of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Nine. In those days, as has always been the case, high society, which met at court and at the fashionable balls, was divided into a number of inner circles, 
each having its own distinctive peculiarities. The most extensive of these cliques was the French Circle, based on the Napoleonic Alliance, and led by Count Rumietzdorf and Kolenkor. Ellen immediately took a most prominent position in this clique, as soon as she and her husband resumed their residence together at Petersburg. Her salon was frequented by the gentlemen of the French legation, and by the great collection of people distinguished for their amiability and wit, who were in that swim. Ellen had been at Erfurt at the time of the notable meeting between the emperors, and had there made acquaintance of all the Napoleonic celebrities of Europe. She had enjoyed a most brilliant success. Napoleon himself remarked her presence at the theatre, and said of her, C'est un superbe animal. Pierre was not surprised at her success, as far as beauty and elegance were concerned, because, as time went on, she grew more beautiful than ever. But he was amazed that his wife, in the course of two short years, should have succeeded in acquiring the reputation of being une femme charmante, aussi spirituelle que belle. The distinguished Prince de Lange wrote her eight-page letters. Bilibin treasured up his witticisms so as to get them off for the first time at the Countess Buzakaya's. To be received at her salon was regarded as equivalent to a diploma of wit and intelligence. Young men read books previous to making their appearance there so as to have some special subject to talk about, and the secretaries of legation, and even the ambassadors, confided diplomatic secrets to her, so that Ellen was a power in a certain way. Pierre, who knew how stupid she really was, had a strange feeling of perplexity and fear when he appeared, as he sometimes did, at her receptions and dinner parties, where the conversation ran on politics, poetry, and philosophy. On such occasions he experienced a feeling such as a juggler must have, who is all the time afraid lest somehow or other his deception should be found out. But either because stupidity is the one thing needful in the management of such a salon, or because those who are deceived find a certain amount of satisfaction in the deception itself, the secret was not betrayed, and Elena Vasilyevna Buzakaya's reputation of being une femme charmante et spirituelle was so firmly established that she could say the most astonishing trivialities and nonsense, and all professed themselves charmed with every word that fell from her lips, and discovered in them a depth of thought which she herself did not begin to suspect. Pierre was precisely the kind of husband— which such a brilliant woman of the world ought by good rights to have. He was a queer, absent-minded fellow, a grand seigneur of a husband, interfering with no one, and not only not spoiling the lofty tone proper to such a drawing-room, but serving as an admirable background against which to display his wife's elegance and tact. Pierre, during these two years, in consequence of perpetually concentrating his mind on transcendental interests, and of his genuine contempt for all things else, assumed in the, to him uninteresting, society which his wife gathered around her, that tone of abstraction and absent-mindedness, combined with affability toward all, which cannot be acquired by art, and which somehow commanded involuntary respect. He walked into his wife's drawing-room as though it were the theatre, and he knew every one, toward all he was equally cordial and equally reserved. Sometimes he joined in the conversation, if it interested him, and then he blurted out his opinions with that thick utterance of his, regardless of the inappropriateness of his ideas, or the presence of Le Monsieur de l'Ambassade. But it was a foregone conclusion in regard to that queer husband, de la femme la plus distinguée de Petersburg, that no one should take his idiosyncrasies seriously. Among the young men who daily frequented Ellen's society after her return from Erfurt, Boris Drubetskoy, who was now on the highest road to success in the service, was the most assiduous in his visitations to the Bozikois. Ellen called him Mon Page, and treated him as though he were a boy. The smiles that she gave him were just like those that she showered upon everyone else, but occasionally Pierre had an unpleasant feeling at the sight of it. Boris treated Pierre with a peculiar and rather grave deference that was perfectly proper. This shade of deference also disquieted Pierre. He had suffered so keenly three years before from the affront that his wife had put upon him, that he now saved himself from the possibility of a repetition of it, in the first place, by renouncing the idea of being his wife's husband, and in the second place, by not allowing a suspicion of her to enter his head. No, now that she has become a bas bleu, a blue stocking, she will never be troubled again with such temptations, he would say to himself. There is no example of a bas bleu having love affairs, he would assure himself, as though it were an axiom in which he had no question, though he could not have told where he had obtained it. 
but strangely enough boris's presence in his wife's drawing-room and he was there almost constantly affected him physically it seemed to paralyze all of his limbs to waken all his self-consciousness and take away his freedom of motion such a strange antipathy thought pierre and yet he used to please me very much in the eyes of the world pierre was a great baron the somewhat blinded and ridiculous husband of a distinguished wife a queer genius who accomplished nothing did no one any harm and who was on the whole a very fine and good young man but in the depths of pierre's soul during all this time there was going on the complicated and arduous labor of internal development which brought him into the knowledge of many secrets and made him pass through many joys and many doubts End of chapter nine part three chapter ten of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter ten he continued his diary and here are some extracts from what he wrote at that time december six rose at eight o'clock read in the gospels then went to a committee meeting pierre by his benefactor's advice had entered the service as a member of one of the committees came back to dinner, dined alone. The countess had many guests, who were disagreeable to me, ate and drank moderately, and after dinner copied some documents for the brethren. In the afternoon I went down to the drawing-room and related a ludicrous story about B, and only when it was too late and everybody laughing heartily did I remember that I should not have done so. Went to bed in happy and contented frame of mind. Almighty Lord, help me to walk in thy paths, one to conquer angry passions by gentleness and moderation two carnal desires by self-restraint and aversion three to shun vanity but not to shut myself off from a the conditions of service of the state b from family affairs c from dealings with friends and d from domestic economy december seven arose late and after i woke up lay for a long time indulging in slothfulness my god help me and strengthen me so that i may walk in thy ways read the holy gospels but without the proper feeling brother yurasov came we talked about the vanities of the world told about the emperor's new plans i began to criticize them but remembered our regulations and the words of the benefactor in regard to the obligations of a genuine mason to be a zealous worker in the government when his services are required and a calm observer of what he cannot approve my tongue is my enemy Brothers G, V, and O came to see me. It was a meeting preparatory to the initiation of a new brother. They insisted upon clothing me with the office of Rater. I feel myself weak and incompetent. Then the conversation turned on the significance of the seven pillars and seven steps of the temple, seven sciences, seven virtues, seven sins, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Brother O was very eloquent. The initiation took place in the evening. The new arrangement of the lodge-room made a magnificent spectacle. Boris Dubritskoy was the adept. I was his sponsor, and I was also Rater. A strange feeling agitated me while I was with him in the dark room. I detected in myself a feeling of hatred toward him, which I vainly strove to overcome, and I should wish really to save him from evil and win him over to the side of truth, but hard thoughts about him arose in my mind." It seemed to me that his sole aim in joining the fraternity was that he might get into closer relations with certain men, creep into favor with those who belong to our lodge, besides the fact that he has several times asked me whether N or S belong to our lodge, which I could not answer him, beside the fact that, from my observation of him, he is not qualified to feel proper reverence for our holy order, and is too much occupied and content with the external man to desire the improvement of the spiritual. I had no grounds to base my objections upon, but he seemed to me insincere, and all the time that I was alone with him in the dark chamber it seemed to me that he was scornfully smiling at my words, and I had a strong temptation really to pierce him with the sword which I held at his bared breast. I could not speak with any fluency, and I could not frankly confess my doubts to the brethren and the Grand Master. May the great architect of the universe aid me to find the true way which leads for the labyrinth of lies." After that there was a gap of three pages in the diary, and then came what follows. Had an instructive and long talk today with Brother V, who advised me to hold fast by Brother A. 
Many things were revealed to me, though I am so unworthy. Adonai is the name of the creator of the world. Elohim is the name of the one who directs the universe. The third name, the unspeakable name, means the all. These talks with Brother V strengthen me, enlighten me, and confirm my feet in the path of virtue. In his presence there is no chance for doubt. How clear to my mind is the distinction between the wretched knowledge of the general sciences and our sacred, all-embracing science. Human science constantly subdivides, so as to grasp, constantly destroys, so as to scrutinize. In the holy science of our brotherhood, everything is coordinated, everything is recognized by its unity and its life. The trinity is the three primordial elements of all things, sulfur, mercury, and salt. Sulfur has an unctuous and fiery quality. Taken in conjunction with salt, its fiery nature arouses a longing in it, by means of which mercury is attracted, seizes it, and thereby arise various bodies. Mercury is the living and volatile spiritual being. Christ, the Holy Spirit, He. December 15. Awoke late, read the Holy Gospels, but without being stirred. Afterward I went out and walked up and down the hall, tried to think, but instead my imagination brought up an occurrence that happened four years ago. After our duel, Mr. Dolokhov and I met in Moscow, and he said that he hoped that I was now enjoying complete peace of mind, in spite of the absence of my wife. At that time I made him no answer. Now I recalled all the circumstances in my heart of hearts, reviling him with the most angry words and the most cutting sarcasms. I came to my senses and banished this thought only when I found myself stirred up to wrath, but I have sufficiently repented of this. After this, Boris Dubrotskoy came in and begged to relate his various adventures. From the first instant I was annoyed at his visit and contradicted him. He retorted, I grew angry and said a great many disagreeable and even hateful things. He said no more, and I recollected myself only when it was too late. My God, I cannot tell at all how to treat him. The cause of this is my self-conceit. I regard myself as superior to him, and consequently I behave a thousand times worse than he does since he condones my rude behavior, while I feel nothing but contempt for him. My God, enable me in his presence better to realize my own shortcomings, and so to order my life that he too may find advantage in it. After dinner I had a nap, and while I was going to sleep I distinctly heard a voice saying in my left ear, Thine is the day. It seemed to me in my dream that I was walking in darkness, and suddenly I was surrounded by dogs, but I proceeded without fear. Suddenly one small one seized me by the left thigh and did not let go. I tried to throttle him. I had just succeeded in getting rid of him when another, still larger, began to snap at me. I tried to lift him up, and the higher I lifted him, the larger and heavier he grew. And suddenly Brother A came along, and, taking me by the arm, drew me with him and brought me to an edifice to enter which it was necessary to cross a narrow plank. I stepped upon it, and the plank tipped and fell, and I tried to climb the fence, the top of which I could hardly reach by stretching up my arms. At last, after excessive efforts, I climbed up in such a way that my legs were on one side and my body on the other. I managed to look around and saw that Brother A was standing on the fence and directing my attention to a great alley and garden, and within the garden was a large and beautiful edifice. Then I woke up. Lord, mighty architect of nature, help me to defend myself from the dogs, my passions, and from the last of them, who united in himself the strength of all the others, and aid me to enter that temple of virtue, the sight of which I attained in my vision. December 17. In a vision, it seemed to me that Iosip Alexievich was sitting in my house, and I felt very glad and was anxious to entertain him. It seemed to me that I went on chatting irreverently, and suddenly remembered that this would not be pleasing to him, and I felt anxious to approach him and embrace him. But as soon as I came close to him, I saw that his face was transfigured. He appeared youthful, and in a low tone repeated something from the teachings of the order, so low, in fact, that I could not understand what he said. Then we seemed all to leave the room, and a marvelous thing occurred. We were sitting or lying on the floor. The benefactor said something to me, and I seemed to be anxious to manifest my tenderness towards him, and without listening to his discourse I tried to realize the condition of my inner man and the mercy of God which had overshadowed me. And the tears stood in my eyes, and I was glad that he noticed it. But he glanced at me with a look of annoyance and sprang up, breaking off his discourse. 
I was crestfallen and asked if what he had said applied especially to me, but he made no reply, and then he turned a benignant face upon me, and immediately we seemed to be in my sleeping room, and he asked me, Tell me honestly what is your strongest temptation. Haven't you ever told me? It seems to me that you have. I was mortified at his question, and replied that sloth was my chief sin. He shook his head incredulously, and I seemed to be still more confused, and replied that though I lived with my wife, as he had advised, still I did not love her. To this he replied that a man ought not to deprive his wife of the affection which was her due, and gave me to feel that this was an obligation. But I replied that I was ashamed to begin now, and suddenly everything vanished. When I awoke I found myself repeating the text of Holy Writ, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Iosif Alexievich's voice was youthful and bright. On that very same day I received a letter from the benefactor, in which he wrote of the obligations of the married state. December 21. I had a dream from which I awoke with a throbbing heart. I seemed to be in my own mansion in Moscow, in the great divan room, and Iosif Alexievich seemed to me to be coming out of the dining room, and I immediately saw that a strange change had taken place in him, and I hastened to meet him, and it seemed to me that I kissed his cheek and his hand, and he said, Have you noticed that my face looks different? I gazed at him while still holding him in my embrace, and it seemed to me that his face was youthful, but there was no hair on his head, and his features were greatly altered. And it seemed to me that I replied, I should have known you had I met you anywhere, and at the same time I ask myself, Am I telling the strict truth? And suddenly I see that he has fallen like a corpse. Then he gradually came to his senses and went with me into the great library, holding a great parchment book in manuscript, and he seemed to say, This I have written. And he gave it to me with a low bow. I opened the book, and on all the pages of this book were exquisite illustrations, and it seemed to me that I recognized that these pictures represented the adventures of the soul with her beloved, and among them I seemed to see one representing a beautiful damsel flying through the clouds in diaphanous raiment and with a transparent body, and I seemed to be aware that this damsel illustrated the song of songs. And as I looked at these pictures it seemed to me that I was doing wrong, and yet I could not tear myself away. Lord, aid me. My God, if this, thy abandonment of me, is thy work, then thy will be done. But if I myself am to blame, then teach me what I must do. I must perish in my own corruption, if thou wholly abandonest me. End of chapter 10Part 3, Chapter 11 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 11 The Rostovs' financial affairs had not improved in the course of the two years while they had been living wholly in the country. Although Nikolai had persistently kept to his resolve and continued to serve in an obscure regiment where he had no chance of advancement and therefore spent comparatively little money, Still, the scale of life at Otradnoya was so large and, above all, Vitenka's management was so bad that the debts rolled up more and more each year. The old count evidently saw but one means of relief. That was a government employment, and he went to Petersburg to get a situation, and at the same time, as he expressed it, to give the girls one last season's amusement. Shortly after the Rostovs reached Petersburg, Berg had proposed for Vera, and his proposal had been accepted. In spite of the fact that in Moscow, the Rostovs moved in the highest society, without thinking or inquiring what the society was to which they belonged, they found in Petersburg that their position was somewhat irregular and unsettled. In Petersburg, they were regarded as rather ridiculous provincials, and many people who had accepted their hospitality at Moscow without question now did not deign to notice them. The Rostovs entertained as freely at Petersburg as they had done at Moscow, and their dinners were shared by a most heterogeneous conglomeration of individuals. For example, some of their neighbors at Otradnoya, landed proprietors of good standing but not rich, and their daughters, and a Frailina Peronskaya, Pierre Buzukoy, and the son of their district postmaster, who had a government appointment at Petersburg. Among the men who were on a footing of familiarity at the Rostovs were Boris, Pierre, whom the old count had met on the street one day and brought home with him, and Berg, 
who spent whole days at the Rostovs, and showed the Countess Vera those attentions which every young man is expected to show on the eve of a proposal. It was not without effect that Berg had shown every one the arm wounded at Austerlitz, and affected to hold his wholly unnecessary sword in his left hand. He described the occurrence so persistently, and made it a matter of such grave importance, that all came to believe in the genuineness and merit of his action, and Berg received two rewards after Austerlitz. In the campaign in Finland, he had also succeeded in distinguishing himself. He picked up a fragment of shell, which had just killed one of the general-in-chief's aides, and carried this fragment to the chief, and, in exactly the same way as after Austerlitz, he persisted in giving everyone such detailed accounts of his behavior, that all finally came to believe with him that this must have taken place also, and again, after the war in Finland, he received two rewards. In 1809 he was already captain of the guard, and held a most advantageous place in Petersburg. Though there were some skeptics who smiled significantly when Berg's merits were spoken of in their presence, it was impossible not to admit that Berg was a strict, brave officer, of excellent standing at headquarters, and a highly moral young man, with a brilliant career before him, and already enjoying an exceptional position in society. Four years before, Berg, happening to fall in with a comrade, also a German, in the parterre of one of the Moscow theatres, had called his attention to Vera Rostova, and said in German, Das soll mein Weib werden. She is to be my wife. And from that moment he had laid his plans to marry her. Now that they were in Petersburg together, he compared his own position with the Rostovs, and came to the conclusion that his time had come, and he proposed. Berg's proposal was received at first with a surprise that was anything but flattering to him. It seemed at first thought strange that the son of an obscure country nobleman should offer himself to a Countess Rostova. But one of Berg's most characteristic traits was such a naive and good-natured egoism that the Rostovs soon came involuntarily to feel it must be an excellent thing if he himself were so anxious about it, and it kept presenting itself before them in a more and more favorable light. Moreover, the Rostovs' affairs were in a greatly shattered condition, so that there was little attraction for wooers. And worse than all, Vera was already twenty-four, and although she had been everywhere and was undoubtedly a pretty and attractive girl, she had never before received an offer. So the consent was granted. Now you see, said Berg to a comrade whom he called his friend, simply because he knew that it was fashionable for men to have friends, you see I have waited all carefully, and I should not think of marrying if I had not arranged everything or if it interfered with any one. But now, on the contrary, my Papenka and Mamenka are secure. I have got them that Usufrucht estate on the Baltic frontier, and I can live in Petersburg on my salary, together with what comes from her estate, for I am careful and economical. We can live very well. I don't marry her for money. I don't call that sort of thing honorable, but it's no more than fair for the wife to contribute her portion and the husband his. I have my appointment, she, her connections, and her little property. That's something in these days, isn't it? But best of all, she is a jewel of a girl, and she loves me. Berg reddened, and added with a smile, and I love her because her character is well balanced, very admirable. Now there's her sister, the same family, but a very different person, a most disagreeable character, and no sense at all, and that kind of thing, you know, disagreeable. But my affianced, well, You'll have a chance to see her, continued Berg. He had it in his mind to say, you will dine with us some day, but he saved himself and said, you will take tea with us, and doubling up his tongue, he deftly sent forth a little ring of tobacco smoke, absolutely typical of his dreams of happiness. After the first feeling of dissatisfaction, which Vera's parents felt at Berg's proposal, the festivity and happiness usual in such circumstances were redoubled, but the joy was not genuine. It was artificial. The relatives confessed to mixed feelings of perplexity and shame. There was an undercurrent of regret that they had never been quite fond of Vera, and that they were now only too glad to get her off their hands. The old count, most of all, was perplexed. He probably would not have been able to tell what caused him this perplexity, but the real cause of it was his finances. He really did not know how he stood or how much he owed, and what he should be able to give as Vera's dowry. When the daughters were born, each had received a portion, about three hundred souls, but one of those estates had already been sold and the other was mortgaged, and the payments were so behindhand that it was bound to be foreclosed and therefore could not be granted as a dower, nor was there any money to spare. 
Berg had already been the accepted bridegroom for more than a month, and only a week remained before the wedding, and still the Count had not been able to face the dreaded question of the dowry, and had not broached the subject to his wife. At one time the Count thought of giving Vera his raisin property, at another of selling a forest, then of raising money on a note. One morning a few days before the wedding, Berg came early to the Count's private room, and with a pleasant smile respectfully asked his future father-in-law, what he was going to give as the Countess Vera's marriage portion. The Count was so confused at this long-anticipated question that he answered at haphazard whatever first came into his head. I like it in you that you are careful. I like it. You shall be satisfied. And patting Berg on his shoulder, he got up, thinking to put an end to the matter. But Berg, still smiling pleasantly, explained that unless he could know definitely what would be Vera's dowry, and unless a portion of it at least were paid over beforehand, he should be under the necessity of withdrawing from the offer. You will certainly agree with me, Count, that if I should permit myself to enter the marriage relation without having a definite knowledge of what means I shall have for the maintenance of my wife, I should be acting a bum. The conversation ended by the Count, who wished to appear generous, and also to avoid future demands, saying that he would give him a note for 80,000 rubles. Berg, sweetly smiling, kissed him on the shoulder, and declared that he was very grateful but that he could never make himself ready for his new life unless he had thirty thousand in ready cash. Or only twenty thousand would do, Count, he added. In that case the note would be for only sixty thousand. Well, very good, said the Count hastily. Only you will allow me, my dear fellow, to give you the twenty thousand and the note for eighty thousand besides. That's the way we'll do it. Kiss me. End of chapter 11「Part three, Chapter twelve of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter twelve. Natasha was now sixteen, and the year, eighteen o nine, was the very one to which she had counted up on her fingers four years before, at the time when she and Boris had exchanged kisses. Since that time she had not once seen Boris. Before Sonya, and always with her mother, when Boris was mentioned, she had freely declared, that all that had gone on before was childish nonsense, as though it were a settled matter, of which there was no use talking, and long ago forgotten. But in the deepest depths of her heart, she was tormented by the question whether the promise that bound her to Boris was to be considered in jest or in earnest. From the very time when Boris had first gone to join the army, he had not seen any of the Rostovs. He had been at Moscow several times, and had passed not very far from Otranoya, but not once had he been to see his old friends. Natasha had several times wondered why he had never been near them, and her surmises had been strengthened by the melancholy tone in which her elders spoke of him. In these degenerate days, old friends are easily forgotten, said the countess more than once, when Boris had been mentioned. Anna Mikhailovna had also been more rarely of late at the Rostovs, she seemed to hold herself especially on her dignity, and always spoke enthusiastically and boastfully of her son's merits, and the glittering career which he was now pursuing. When the Rostovs came to Petersburg, Boris came to call upon them. The thought of meeting with them was not without emotion. His romance with Natasha was the most poetical recollection that he had of his youth, but at the same time he went there with a firm determination to give both her and her parents clearly to understand that those youthful relations between him and Natasha could not be considered binding upon either of them. He had a brilliant position in society, thanks to his intimacy with the Countess Buzokaya, a brilliant position in the service, thanks to the patronage of an eminent individual, whose confidence he fully enjoyed, and he had now fully elaborated plans for making a marriage with one of the wealthiest heiresses in Petersburg, which, indeed, he might very easily do. When Boris reached the Rostovs, Natasha was in her room. When she was informed of his presence, she went to the drawing-room almost on a run, blushing and beaming with a more than gracious smile. Boris remembered Natasha as a little girl, who wore a short dress, and had dark, flashing eyes under her bangs, and with a wild, merry laugh. That was just as he had last seen her, four years before, and consequently, when an entirely different Natasha came into the room, he was taken aback, and his face expressed solemn amazement. This expression on his face was a triumph for Natasha. "'Well, would you have known your mischievous little playmate?' asked the Countess. Boris kissed Natasha's hand, and said that he noticed a great change in her. "'How handsome you have grown! 
Why shouldn't I? replied Natasha's laughing eyes. Don't you think that Papa seems much older? she asked. Natasha sat there, listening to the conversation between Boris and the Countess, and silently studying the husband of her childhood's ideal, even to the minutest particulars. Boris was conscious of her study and affectionate gaze fixed upon him, and occasionally he stole a glance at her. His uniform, his spurs, his cravat, the cut of his hair, all were most fashionable and comme font. Natasha instantly noticed this. He sat somewhat toward the edge of the easy chair, nearest the countess, with his right hand smoothing the immaculate, neat-fitting glove that he wore on his left, and he spoke, with a peculiarly delicate compression of the lips, about the gaieties of Petersburg high life, and he treated the old times in Moscow, and his Moscow acquaintances, with a gentle irony. It was not without design, Natasha felt sure, he mentioned the names of the highest aristocracy, whom he had met at the ball of the ambassadors, or his invitations to the N. N.'s and the S. S.'s. Natasha sat silent all the time, looking askance at him. This glance of hers confused and troubled Boris more and more. He kept turning frequently toward her, and stumbling in the midst of his stories. He did not stay more than ten minutes, and then got up to take his leave. All the time those keen eyes, full of mockery, looked at him with a peculiar challenging expression. After this first visit of his, Boris confessed to himself that Natasha was just as fascinating as ever, but that it was his duty to renounce this feeling, because to marry her, an almost dowerless maiden, would be the ruin of his career, and the renewal of their former friendship without intention of marrying her would be an ungrateful trick. Boris resolved in his own mind to avoid meeting Natasha, but, notwithstanding this resolution, he went again in a few days, and kept going more and more frequently, and at last spent whole days at the Rostovs. He kept trying to persuade himself that he would soon have a chance to come to an explanation with Natasha, and tell her that what was past must be forgotten, that, in spite of everything, she could not be his wife, that he had no property, and their friends would never consent to their union. But he kept putting it off, and finding it more and more awkward to bring about this explanation. Each day he became more and more perplexed. Natasha, so far as her mother and Sonya could judge, was in love with Boris just as much as ever she had been. She sang for him all her favorite pieces, showed him her album, begged him to write in it, and while she never cared to talk about the past, she always made him feel how charming the present was. Each day Boris was more and more involved in the fog of uncertainty, never saying what he had resolved to say, absolutely at sea as to what he should do, or why he went there, and how it would all end. He even ceased to frequent Ellen's, though he daily received reproachful notes from her, but still he spent most of his spare time at the Rostovs. End of chapter 12part three chapter thirteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter thirteen one evening when the old countess in nightcap and dressing sack with her false curls removed and with one thin strand of white hair escaping from under her white calico cap was performing the low obsciences of her evening devotions on a rug sighing and groaning the door of her room creaked on its hinges and Natasha came running in, with her bare feet in slippers, and also in a dressing jacket and curl papers. The countess glanced around, and a frown passed over her face. She went on repeating her last prayer. If this couch become my tomb. Her devotional frame of mind was destroyed, however. Natasha, with rosy cheeks, and full of animation, when she saw that her mother was saying her prayers, suddenly paused, made a curtsy, and involuntarily poked out her tongue to express her annoyance at her carelessness. Then, perceiving that her mother still went on with her devotions, she ran to the bed on her tiptoes, kicked off her slippers, by rubbing one dainty little foot against the other, and sprang into that couch which the countess was so afraid would be her tomb. This couch was a lofty feather bed, with five pillows, each smaller than the other. Natasha jumped into the middle, sinking deep into the feather mattress, rolled over next to the wall, and began to creep under the bedclothes, snuggling down, tucking her knees up to her chin, then giving animated little kicks, and laughing almost aloud, now and again uncovering her head and looking at her mother. The countess finished her prayers, and with a stern face came to the bed, but seeing that Natasha's head was hidden under the bedclothes, she smiled her good, amiable smile. "'Nu, nu, nu,' said the mother. "'Can we talk now? Say yes,' cried Natasha. 
There, now, one kiss in thy neck, just one more, and that will satisfy me. And she threw her arms around her mother and kissed her under the chin. In her treatment of her mother, Natasha seemed to be very rough in her manner, but she was so dexterous and graceful that whenever she seized her mother in her arms, she always did it in such a way as not to hurt her or disturb her at all. "'Well, what have you to tell me tonight?' asked the Countess, settling back upon the pillows and waiting until Natasha, rolling over and over, should cuddle down close to her, drop her hands, and become serious." These visits from Natasha, which took place every night before the Count came from his club, were a great delight to both mother and daughter. "'What is there to tell tonight? I want to speak to you about—' Natasha stopped her mother's mouth with her hand. "'About Boris? I know,' said she gravely. "'That's what made me come. No, but you tell me,' she took away her hand. "'Go on, Mamma. He's nice, isn't he?' "'Natasha, you are sixteen. At your age I was already married.' You say that Boris is nice. He is very nice, and I love him like a son. But what do you wish? You have entirely turned his head, that's evident. As she said this, the countess looked at her daughter. Natasha lay looking fixedly at one of the carved mahogany sphinxes which ornamented the bedposts. The countess could only see her daughter's profile. It seemed to her that the sweet face had a particularly grave and thoughtful expression. Natasha was listening and pondering. Well, what is it? You have entirely turned his head. What made you do so? What do you want of him? You know that you cannot marry him. Why not? asked Natasha, without altering her expression. Because he is very young, because he is poor, because he is a relative, because you yourself are not in love with him. How do you know I'm not in love with him? I know. Now, this is not proper, darling. But if I am determined on it, began Natasha, do cease talking nonsense, said the countess. Yes, but suppose my mind is made up. Natasha, I am in earnest. Natasha did not allow her to finish. She seized the countess's plump hand and kissed it on the back, and then on the palm, then turned it over again and began to kiss it on the knuckle joint of each finger in succession, then on the middle joints, then again on the knuckles, repeating in a whisper, January, February, March, April, May. Tell me, Mamma. Why don't you go on? Speak, said she, looking at her mother, who with affectionate eyes gazed at her daughter, becoming so engrossed in this contemplation that she forgot what she was going to say. It isn't proper, Dushamoya. People won't remember anything about your affection as children, but if he is seen to be so intimate with you now, it might injure you in the eyes of other young men who come to the house. And worst of all, it is torturing him all for nothing." Perhaps he might, by this time, have found some rich girl to marry, but now he is quite beside himself. Beside himself, repeated Natasha. I will tell you my own experience. I once had a cousin. I know, Kirill Matveyevich, but he is an old man, isn't he? He hasn't always been old. But see here, Natasha, I am going to talk with Boris. He must not come here so much. Why mustn't he, if he likes to? "'because I know that this cannot come to any good end. "'How do you know? "'No, Mamma, you must not speak to him. "'What nonsense!' exclaimed Natasha, "'in a tone of one who is about to be deprived of a possession. "'Well, I won't marry him, but do let him come, "'for he enjoys it, and so do I.' "'Natasha looked at her mother with a smile. "'Not with any intentions, but this way,' she repeated. "'What do you mean by this way, my dear?' "'Yes, this way,' It is perfectly understood that he is not to marry. Well, this way. Yes, this way, this way, repeated the countess, and she went into an unexpected fit of good-natured laughter, her whole body shaking, as old people will. Come, Mamma, stop laughing at me, cried Natasha. You make the whole bed shake. You are awfully like me. You laugh just as easily as I do. Do stop. She seized the countess's two hands, kissed the joint of the little finger of one of them for June, and went on kissing July and August on the other hand. Mamma, but he's very, he's so very much in love. You think so, do you? Was anyone ever much in love with you? And he's very nice, very, very nice, isn't he? Only he's not quite to my taste. He's so narrow, just like the dining-room clock. You know what I mean, don't you? Narrow, you know grayish and serene. What nonsense you do talk, 
exclaimed the countess. Natasha pursued. Don't you understand what I mean? Nikolenko would understand me. There's Buzakoy. He's blue, dark blue and red, and he is four square. And are you coquetting with him too? asked the countess, laughing again. No, he's a Freemason. I found it out. He is splendid, dark blue and red. How can I make you see it? Grafenyushka, little countess, aren't you asleep yet? cried the count at this moment at the door. Natasha jumped out of bed, seized her slippers in her hand, and escaped barefooted to her own room. It was long before she could go to sleep. She kept thinking how strange it was that no one could ever understand things as she understood them, or read what was in her mind. Sonya, she thought, gazing at the young girl who, with her tremendous long pigtail, lay asleep curled up like a little kitten. No, not even she. She is virtue itself. She is in love with Nikolenka, and that's all she cares about, and Mama can't understand, either. That is so strange, how intelligent she is, and how... She's pretty, Natasha went on, speaking of herself in the third person, and imagining that some very intelligent, extraordinarily intelligent, and most handsome man was saying this about her. She has everything, everything, this man of her imagination was saying. She is unusually intelligent, lovable, and pretty, besides, extraordinarily pretty and graceful. She can swim, she can ride horseback splendidly, and what a voice, one might say a marvelous voice. She sang her favorite snatch from a Cherubini opera, then threw herself into bed, smiling at the happy thought that she should be asleep in a moment, called to Dunyasha to put out the light, and even before Dunyasha had left the room, she had already passed to cross into that other, still happier world of dreams, where all things were just as bright and beautiful as in reality, but still more fascinating because so different. On the next day, the countess, calling Boris to her, had a talk with him, and from that time forth he ceased to be a frequent visitor at the Rostovs. End of chapter 13Part three, chapter fourteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter fourteen. On the thirty first of December, O.S., on the very eve of the new year, nineteen ten, Le Ravillon, a ball was given by a grandee of Catherine's time. The diplomatic corps and the emperor had promised to be present. The grandee's splendid mansion on the English quay was illuminated, with countless windows all ablaze. At the brilliantly lighted, red-carpeted entrance stood a guard of police, comprising not alone gendarmes, but even the chief of police and half a score of officers. Carriages drove away, and new ones kept taking their places, with red-liveried lackeys, and lackeys with plumes in their hats. From the carriages descended men in uniforms, and men adorned with stars and laces, and as the steps were let down with a bang, ladies in satins and ermine cloaks hastily and noiselessly picked their way over the carpeted entrance. Almost every time when a new equipage drove up, a flurry of excitement ran through the crowd, and hats were removed. The sovereign? No, a minister, prince so-and-so, an ambassador. But did you see his plume? Such were the remarks heard in the crowd. There was one man better dressed than the rest, and he seemed to know who everybody was, and called by name the famous grandees of the time. Already a third of the guests had arrived, but at the Rostovs, who were also invited, hasty preparations were still in progress. Many had been the rumors and anticipations in the Rostov family about this ball, many the apprehensions lest they should not get their invitation, lest their dresses should not be ready, and everything ordered as it should be. Maria Ignatyevna Peronskaya, an old friend and relative of the countess, was to accompany the Rostovs to the ball. She was a lean and sallow Frilina, who belonged to the Empress Dowager's court, and took charge of her country cousins, the Rostovs, in their entry into Petersburg high life. They were to call for her at ten o'clock in the evening, at her residence on the Taurid Gardens, and now it only lacked five minutes of ten, and still the ladies were not dressed. This was the first great ball to which Natasha had ever been in her life. She had got up at eight o'clock that morning, and had been all day long in a state of the wildest excitement and bustle. All her energies, from earliest morning, had been expended in the effort to have all of them, herself, Sonya, and her mamma, dressed to perfection. Sonya and the countess trusted themselves entirely into her hands. 
The countess was to wear a dark red or masaka dress of velvet. The two girls, gowns with pink silk overskirts and roses in their corsages, while their hair was to be coiffed à la griche. The most important part had been already done. Their feet, hands, arms, necks, and ears had been washed, perfumed, and powdered with extraordinary care. On their feet they wore open-work silk stockings and white satin slippers with bows. Their toilettes were almost finished. Sonya had her dress on, and so had the countess, but Natasha, who had been helping the others, was behindhand. She was still sitting in front of the mirror in a pannier that covered her slender shoulders. Sonya, already dressed, was standing in the middle of the room, fastening on a last bow with a pin that hurt her dainty fingers as she tried to press it, squeaking through the ribbon. "'Not that way! Not that way, Sonya!' cried Natasha, turning her head suddenly and putting her hands up into her hair, which the maid, who was dressing it, did not have time to let go of. "'Don't pull the bow that way. Come here!' Sonya sat down in front of her. Natasha pinned the bow in a different position. "'If you please, Baryshnya, I can't arrange your hair this way,' exclaimed the maid, still holding her dark locks. "'Oh, good gracious! Wait, then. There, that's the way, Sonya.' "'Are you almost ready?' asked the countess. "'It's ten o'clock already.' "'In a minute! In a minute! And are you all ready, Mamma? "'Only have my headdress to put on. "'Don't you do it without me,' cried Natasha. "'You won't get it right.' "'Yes, but it's ten o'clock.' It had been agreed upon that they should reach the ballroom at half-past ten, and Natasha still had to get on her dress, and they had to drive to the Torrid Gardens. As soon as her hair was done, Natasha, in her short petticoat, which showed her ball slippers, and wearing her mother's dressing jacket, ran to Sonya and examined her critically. Then she hurried to her mother. Bending her head down, she put on it her headdress, and, giving her gray hair a hasty kiss, she scurried back to the maids, who were putting the last touches to her skirt. The delay had been caused by Natasha's skirt, which was too long. Two maids were at work on it, hastily biting off the ends of the thread. A third, with her mouth full of pins, was hastening from the Countess to Sonya, and a fourth was holding up high in the air the completed crepe gown. Mavrushka, hurry up, you old dove! Give me the thimble, Baryshnya. Are you almost ready? asked the Count, coming to the door. Here is some perfume for you. Peronskaya will be on a fume. "'There, it is done,' cried the maid, lifting up with two fingers the completed crepe dress, and giving it a puff and a shake, by this motion expressing her sense of the airiness and purity of which she held. Natasha began to put the garment on. "'In a minute, in a minute! Don't come, Papa!' she cried to her father, who was just opening the door. Her head at that very moment was disappearing under the cloud of crepe. Sonya closed the door, but in a moment the Count was admitted. He wore a blue dress-coat, short clothes, and buckled shoes, and was scented and pomaded. "'Ach, Papa, how handsome you look! Charming!' cried Natasha, as she stood in the middle of the chamber and adjusted the folds of her skirt. "'Excuse me, Barnishnya, excuse me,' said one of the maids, who was on her knees, pulling the skirts, and she shifted the pins from one side of her mouth to the other with a deft motion of her tongue. "'It's too, too bad,' cried Sonya, with despair in her voice, scrutinizing Natasha's dress, it's too bad. It's over long now. Natasha made a few steps so as to look into the pier glass. The skirt was indeed too long. Good gracious, said Arina. It isn't too long at all, said Mavrusha, crawling along the floor after her young lady. Well, if it's too long, let us tack it up. We can do it in a second, said Danyusha, in a decisive tone, taking a needle from the bosom of her dress and again squatting down on the floor to baste up the bottom of the skirt. At this instant the countess, in her headdress and velvet robe, came timidly into the room with noiseless steps. "'Oh, oh, my beauty!' cried the count. "'You are the best of them all!' He tried to give her a hug and a kiss, but she blushed and pushed him away so as not to rumple her dress. "Mamma, your headdress wants to be more to one side,' cried Natasha. "'I will pin it on,' and she sprang forward so quickly that the maids who were at work on the skirt did not have time to let go and a piece of the crepe was torn." "'Good gracious! What have you done? Truly it was not my fault!' "'No matter. It won't be seen,' said Dunyasha. "'Oh, my beauty! A real queen!' cried the old Nyanya, looking in at the door. "'And Sonyushka, too. Well, they are beauties!' By a quarter past ten, finally, all were seated in the carriage and on their way, but they had still to stop at the Torrid Gardens. Peronskaya was all ready and waiting for them. 
Notwithstanding her advanced age and her lack of charms, almost exactly the same thing had taken place in her case as with the Rostovs, though, of course, with no haste and flurry, for this was an old story with her. But her scraggly old form had been washed and scented and powdered in just the same way, and she had been just as scrupulous in washing behind her ears, and just as at the Rostovs, her ancient maid had enthusiastically contemplated the adornment of her mistress, when dressed in her yellow robe with the imperial monogram she had come down into the drawing-room. Perinskaya could not find words enough to praise the Rostovs' toilet. The Rostovs also extolled her taste and her toilet, and at last, at eleven o'clock, carefully safeguarding their hair and their dresses, they stowed themselves away in the carriage and drove off. End of chapter 14「Part three, Chapter fifteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter fifteen. Natasha, since that morning, had not had a moment to herself, and not once had she taken time to think of what was before her. In the raw, chill atmosphere, in the narrow, dimly lighted, swaying carriage, she, for the first time, clearly saw in her imagination what was waiting for her there, at the ball, in the lighted halls, the music, the flowers, the dances, the sovereign, all the gilded youth of the city. Fancy pictured it in such attractive colors that she could hardly believe that it was going to be realized. It was all in such vivid contrast with the impressions of the chill, the narrowness, and the darkness of the carriage. She realized all that was awaiting her only at the moment when, having passed along the red-carpeted entrance, she went into the vestibule and took off her furs, and, together with Sonya, preceded her mother up the grand staircase lined with flowering plants. Then only it came over her with what propriety she must behave at a ball, and she tried to assume that dignified manner which she felt to be the proper thing for girls on such an occasion. But, fortunately, she was conscious that her eyes were wandering, she could not distinguish anything clearly. Her heart was beating a hundred a minute. Her pulses throbbed almost painfully. It was impossible for her to assume any such manner, and it would have been ridiculous in her. And so she passed along, dying with excitement, and trying with all her might to hide it, and this was the very manner which was, most of all, becoming to her. Behind them, and in front of them, other guests were mounting the stairs, also talking in low tones, and dressed in ball costumes. Great mirrors on the landings reflected visions of ladies in white, blue, and pink gowns, with diamonds and pearls on their bare arms and bosoms. Natasha glanced into the mirrors, but she could not distinguish herself from among the others. All were commingled and confused in one glittering procession. As they reached the door leading into the first drawing-room, a continuous roar of voices, footsteps, and greetings deafened Natasha. The lights and brilliant toilets still more dazzled her. The host and hostess, who had already for hours been standing near the entrance and repeating over the same words of welcome, Chame de vous voir, met the Rostovs and Perinskaya in the same way. The two young girls, in their white dresses, each with a single rose in her dark locks, went in and curtsied exactly alike. But involuntarily the hostess let her glance rest longer on the gentle little Natasha. She gazed at her with a smile the expression of which had something in it quite different from the set smile of the hostess. As she looked at her, she perhaps remembered the golden days of her girlhood, which would never more return, and her own first ball. The host also followed Natasha with his glance, and asked the Count which of the two was his daughter. Charmante, said he, kissing his fingertips. In the great ballroom, the guests were crowded together near the entrance, awaiting the coming of the sovereign. The countess took her place in the front row of this group. Natasha had had her ears open, and she was conscious that several had asked who she was, and found it pleasant to look at her. She realized that she was making a pleasant impression on those whose eyes followed her, and this fact somewhat calmed her agitation. There are some just like ourselves, some not as good, she thought. Peronskaya was pointing out to the countess the most notable people in the ballroom. There, that's the Dutch ambassador, said Perinskoya, directing the countess's attention to a gentleman with crisp silver-white hair, closely trimmed. He was surrounded by ladies whom he had just set to laughing by some story or other. Ah, and there is the Staritsta of Petersburg, the Countess Buzakaya, she exclaimed, indicating Ellen, who had just entered. How handsome she is! 
she does not stand second even to Maria Anatovna. Just see how young and old stare after her. She's both handsome and intelligent. They say Prince has quite lost his heart to her. And see those two, there. They are not pretty at all, but what a following they have. She indicated a lady and her extremely plain daughter, who were just crossing the ballroom. That girl is the daughter of a millionaire, said Perinskaya, and there are her suitors. That's the Countess Buzakaya's brother, Anatol Kuragin, said she, referring to a handsome young cavalryman who was just then passing them, holding his head very high and not deigning to give the ladies a look. How handsome he is, isn't he? They say he's going to marry this heiress, and your cousin, Drubetskoy, is also after her. They say she has millions. Who? That man there? That is the French ambassador himself, she replied to the countess, who had asked who Collingcourt was. Just see, he is like some czar. And yet they are all so charming, these French, all very nice. Ah, there she is. No, after all, there is no one who can be compared to our Maria Anatovna. How simply she is dressed. Charming. And that stout man yonder, in spectacles, is the universal Freemason, said she, pointing out Buzakoy. Compare him with his wife. What a ridiculous creature. Pierre walked along, his stout form swaying and pushing through the throng, bowing to right and left, carelessly and good-naturedly, as though he were making his way through the swarms of a marketplace. He passed along, evidently in search of someone. Natasha was glad to see Pierre's well-known face, even if he was a ridiculous creature, to use the words of Peronskaya, and she knew that it was her party, and herself in particular, of whom Pierre was in search. Pierre had promised that he would attend the ball and find partners for her. But before he reached where they stood, Pierre stopped near a short and very handsome dark-featured cavalryman in a white uniform, who was standing by the window and conversing with a tall individual with stars and a ribbon. Natasha instantly recognized the shorter of the two men. It was Bolkonsky, who seemed to her to have grown younger, gayer, and handsomer. There's another of our acquaintance, Bolkonsky. Do you see him, Mamma? asked Natasha, pointing to Prince Andrei. Do you remember? He spent a night with us at Otranoya. Ah, indeed. So you know him, then? asked Peronskaya. I cannot endure him. Il fait de prendre le puri et le bouton. There's no end to his pride. He's exactly like his Papenka. And now he's hand in glove with Speransky. They are concocting all sorts of schemes. See how he treats the ladies. One just spoke to him, and he turns his back on her. I'd give him a lesson if he treated me as he did those ladies. End of chapter 15《Part Three, Chapter Sixteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Sixteen. Suddenly there was a general stir. A whisper ran through the throng, which pressed forward and then divided again, making two rows, between which came the sovereign to the strains of the band, which just then struck up. He was followed by the host and hostess. The sovereign passed along quickly, bowing to the right and left, as though anxious to have done as soon as possible with these first formalities. The musicians played a polonaise, then famous, on account of the words which had been set to it. These words began, Alexander, Yelizaveta, you enrapture us. The sovereign entered the drawing-room. The throng pushed toward the doors. Several personages, with anxious faces, in great haste, rushed hither and thither, the throng again closed around the drawing-room door, where the sovereign made his appearance, engaged in conversation with the hostess. A young man, with an expression of annoyance on his face, came along and begged the ladies to step back. Several ladies, with eager faces showing absolute disregard of all the conventional rules of good breeding, pushed forward, to the imminent risk of their toilets. The gentlemen began to select partners and get into position for the polonaise. Space was cleared, and the sovereign, with a smile, stepping out of time, passed into the ballroom, leading the lady of the house by the hand. They were followed by the host, with Maria Antonovna Narishkina, then the ambassadors and ministers and various generals, whom Peronskaya indefatigably called by name. More than half of the ladies had partners and were already dancing or beginning to dance the polonaise. Natasha felt that she and Sonya, as well as her mother, were left in the lurch, 
with that minority of ladies who lined the walls and were not invited to take part in the polonaise. She stood with her slender arms hanging by her sides, with her maidenly bosom, as yet scarcely defined, regularly rising and falling with long inspirations, and she looked straight ahead with brilliant eyes full of alarm, indicating that she was ready for utter enjoyment or desperate disappointment. She was not interested now in the sovereign or in any of those distinguished personages whom Perenskaya was calling to their attention. She had only one thought. Isn't anyone coming to invite me? Can it be that I am not going to have a single dance? Won't any of those men notice me? Of those men who now do not seem to see me, or if they see me, look at me as much as if to say, Oh, she's nothing. She's nothing to look at. No, it cannot be, she said to herself. They must know how much I am longing to dance, and how splendidly I dance, and how much they would enjoy it if they danced with me. The strains of the polonaise, which had now lasted some little time, began to have a melancholy cadence in Natasha's ears, as though connected with sad memories. She felt like having a good cry. Perenskaya had left them. The Count was at the other end of the ballroom. She and Sonya and the Countess were as much alone in this throng of strangers as though they were in the woods. No one took any interest in them or looked out for them. Prince Andrei passed them with a lady on his arm, and evidently did not recollect them. The handsome Anatole, smiling, said something to the lady with whom he was promenading, and looked into Natasha's face as one looks at a wall. Twice Boris passed them, and each time turned his head away. Berg and his wife, who were not dancing, joined them. Natasha felt mortified to death at this family gathering, there, at the ball, as though they had no other place for family confidences than in a ballroom. She did not look at Vera, or listen to what she had to say about her emerald green dress. At last the sovereign sat down, near his last partner. He had danced with three, and the music ceased. The officious adjutant bustled up to the Rostovs, begging them to move back a little more, and this although they almost touched the wall, and then from the gallery was heard the clear-cut rhythm of the smooth and enticing valse. The sovereign, with a smile, glanced down the ballroom. A moment passed, and no one had as yet begun. The adjutant, who acted as master of ceremonies, approached the Countess Buzakaya and asked her to dance. She accepted with a smile, and then, without looking at him, laid her hand on his shoulder. The adjutant, who knew what he was about, calmly, deliberately, and with all the self-confidence in the world, placing his arm firmly around her waist, at first started off with her in the glissade around the edge of the circle. Then, when they reached the end of the ballroom, he took her right hand with his left, turned her around, and, while the sounds of the valse grew more and more rapid, the clicking of the adjutant's spurs could be heard, as his agile and skillful feet beat the time of the rhythm. While on the third beat, at every turn, his partner's velvet dress floated out and seemed to fly. Natasha gazed at them, and was ready to weep that it was not she herself who was leading this first valse. Prince Andrei, in the white uniform of a colonel of cavalry, in silk stockings and shoe buckles, stood, full of life and radiant with happiness, in the front row of the circle, not far from the Rostovs. Baron Firhoff was talking to him about the first meeting of the Imperial Council, which had been appointed for the next day. Prince Andrei, as an intimate friend of Speransky, and one who had shared in the labors of the Legislative Committee, would be very likely to be able to give authentic information in regard to the approaching session, concerning which there were many conflicting rumors. But Prince Andrei was not giving heed to what Firhoff was saying, and looked now at the sovereign, and now at the various gentlemen, who were all ready to dance, but had not the necessary courage to take the floor. Prince Andrei was observing these gentlemen, who showed such timidity in the presence of their sovereign, and the ladies, whose hearts were sinking within them, with desire of being invited. Pierre came up to Prince Andrei and took him by the arm. "'You are always ready for a dance. My protégé, the little Rostova, is here. Do invite her,' said he. "'Where?' asked Bolkonsky. "'I beg your pardon,' he added, turning to the baron. "'We will finish this conversation at another time. But at balls it is our duty to dance.' He went in the direction indicated by Pierre. Natasha's despairing, melancholy face attracted Prince Andrei's attention. He recognized her and divined her feeling, and realizing that she was just coming out and remembering her conversation, he went with a beaming countenance up to the Countess Rostova. "'Allow me to make you acquainted with my daughter,' said the Countess with a blush. 
"'I have had the pleasure of meeting her before, but perhaps the Countess does not remember me,' said Prince Andrei, with a low and respectful bow, entirely belying Perinskaya's spiteful observation about his rudeness. Approaching Natasha, he started to put his arm around her waist, even before he had actually invited her to dance with him. Then he proposed that they should take a turn of the valse. Natasha's face, with its melancholy expression ready to sink to despair or become radiant, was suddenly lighted up with a happy, childlike smile of gratitude. "'I have been waiting long for you,' this timid and radiant young maiden seemed to say, by this smile flashing out from under the tears that had been almost ready to start as she put her hand on Prince Andrei's shoulder. They were the second couple that ventured out upon the floor. Prince Andrei was one of the best dancers of his time. Natasha danced exquisitely, her dainty little feet, shod in her satin slippers, performed their duty with perfect ease and agility, as though they had wings, and her face was beaming with triumphant delight. Her neck was angular, and her arms were thin and far from pretty, compared with Ellen's charms. Her shoulders were slim, her figure undeveloped, her arms slender, but Ellen seemed to be already covered with an enamel left by the thousand glances that had glided over her form, while Natasha seemed like a maiden who for the first time appeared in a dress decollete, and who would feel very much ashamed if she were not assured that it was the proper thing. Prince Andrei liked to dance, and as he was anxious to escape from the political and philosophical talk into which people insisted in dragging him, and anxious to break up, as soon as possible, that tiresome circle of people, abashed by the presence of the sovereign, he was ready to dance, and he chose Natasha because Pierre had suggested her, and because she happened to be the first among all the pretty women upon whom his eyes fell. But as soon as he held this slender, supple form in his arms, and she started away so close to him, and smiled up into his face, the effect of her charm mounted into his head like wine. When they stopped to get breath, and he released her, and they began to look at the dancers, he felt as though he had been inspired with new energy and fresh life. End of chapter 16「Part Three, Chapter Seventeen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Seventeen. Following Prince Andrei's example, Boris came and invited Natasha to dance with him. Also, the master of ceremonies who had opened the ball, and several other young men, and Natasha, turning her superfluity of partners over to Sonya, flushed and beamed with delight and did not miss a single dance throughout the rest of the evening. She did not notice, and she did not heed the incidents that attracted the attention of everybody else at the ball. She did not once remark how the emperor had a long conversation with the French ambassador, or how he showed signal favor to a certain lady who was present, or how the European prince so-and-so, and so-and-so, -and -so said and did this, that, and the other, or how Ellen enjoyed a brilliant success and attracted the special attention of such and such a person. She did not even see the sovereign, and only once noticed that he had withdrawn by the fact that after his departure the ball became livelier than ever. Just before supper Prince Andrei danced one of the jolliest of cotillions with Natasha. He took occasion to remind her of their first meeting, on the Otradnoya driveway, and how she could not go to sleep that moonlight night, and how he had involuntarily overheard what she said. Natasha blushed at this reminiscence, and tried to excuse herself, as though it were something of which she ought to be ashamed, that Prince Andrei had accidentally overheard her. Prince Andrei, like all men who have grown up in society, liked to meet anyone who was free from the stereotyped imprint of fashionable high life, and such a person was Natasha, with her naive astonishment, her enjoyment, and her modesty, and even her mistakes in speaking French. He treated her, and spoke to her, with a peculiar delicacy and affectionate courtesy. As he sat next to her, talking upon the simplest and most insignificant topics, Prince Andrei admired the radiant gleam in her eyes, and her smile, answering not what was said to her so much as to her inward happiness. If, by chance, Natasha were invited to dance, and got up with a smile, and went flying across the room, Prince Andrei found a special delight in watching her fawn-like grace. In the midst of the cotillion, Natasha, having just danced out one figure, came back to her place with a long sigh, all out of breath. A new cavalier again invited her out. 
she stood up panting and was apparently on the point of refusing but instantly placed her hand on the cavalier's shoulder and gave prince andrei a smile i should very much like to get my breath and sit with you i am tired but you see how i am in demand and that pleases me and i am happy and i love you all and you and i understand it all this and much more besides this smile of hers seemed to say when her partner brought her back natasha chasseed across the room to choose two ladies for the figure if she speaks to her cousin first and then to the other lady she shall be my wife said prince andrei unexpectedly even to himself as he followed her she went to her cousin first what nonsense sometimes enters one's head thought prince andrei but it is quite evident that this maiden is so sweet and so unlike anybody else that she won't be kept dancing here for a month she'll be engaged or married there's no one like her here he thought as natasha smoothing out the petals of a rose in her corsage that had been crushed came back and resumed her place next to him at the end of the cotillion the old count in his blue coat came up to the dancers he invited prince andrei to call and see them and he asked his daughter if she had been having a good time natasha at first did not reply except by a smile which had a sort of reproach in it as much as to say how can you ask such a question the jolliest time i ever had in my life said she and prince andrei noticed how she made a quick motion to raise her slender arms as if to embrace her father and instantly dropped them again natasha was happier than she had ever been in her life before she had reached that lofty height of bliss when a person becomes perfectly good and lovely and cannot believe in the existence or possibility of wickedness unhappiness and sorrow pierre at this ball for the first time had a realizing sense of the false position in which he was placed by the status occupied by his wife in court society he was morose and in despair a deep frown furrowed his brow and as he stood by the window he glared through his spectacles and yet saw nothing natasha as she went down to supper passed by him his gloomy unhappy face struck her she paused in front of him she felt a desire to help him to share with him the superfluity of her own happiness how jolly is it count said she isn't it pierre gave her a distracted smile evidently not understanding what she said yes i am very glad he replied how can any one be dissatisfied with anything wondered natasha especially such a good fellow as at Buzakoy. in natasha's eyes all who were at the ball were alike good sweet lovely men full of affection toward each other hatred was out of the question and therefore all ought to be happy end of chapter seventeen part three chapter eighteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter eighteen on the next day prince andrei remembered the ball of the evening before but it soon passed out of his mind yes it was a very brilliant ball and besides yes the little rostov girl was very captivating there's something peculiarly fresh about her very original and unpetersburg like that was the extent of the thought that he gave to the ball and after he had drunk his tea he sat down to his labors but either because of his weariness or his sleepless night the day was unpropitious for work and he could not accomplish anything and what he did was unsatisfactory as was often the case with him and he was glad when word was brought that some one had come to visit him the visitor was bitsky who had served on various committees and frequented all the different cliques of petersburg society he was a zealous supporter of the new ideas and of speransky and was known about town as an indefatigable gossip-monger one of those men who follow the fashion in their opinions as in their clothes and who accordingly are regarded as the most eager partisans of the latest doctrines scarcely giving himself time to remove his hat he rushed eagerly into prince andrei's room and on the instant rattled off into a stream of talk he had only just learned the details of the session of the imperial council that had taken place that morning opened by the sovereign and he began to tell about it with all enthusiasm the sovereign's speech had been extraordinary the sort of speech as only a constitutional monarch could have given the emperor said in so many words 
that the court and the senate were now the members of the government and declared that the administration should have its basis not in arbitrary will but on firm principles the sovereign declared that the finances should be reorganized and the budgets made public said bitsky laying a special emphasis on the important words and opening his eyes significantly yes the event of to-day marks an era a magnificent era in our history he said in conclusion prince andrei listened to the story of the opening of the imperial council which he had been looking forward to with much impatience and to which he attributed so much importance and he was amazed that this event now that it was really accomplished not only did not stir him but seemed to him worse than idle he listened to bitsky's enthusiastic account with quiet irony the most obvious thought that came into his head was what concern is it to me or to bitsky indeed what concern is it of ours that the sovereign deigned to say something in the council can it make me any happier or any better and this obvious criticism suddenly destroyed for prince andrei all the interests that he had formerly taken in the reforms prince andrei had been invited to dine that day at speransky's en petit comité as he himself expressed it when he gave him the invitation the idea of this dinner in the intimate and home circle of a man for whom he felt such an admiration had before this been exceedingly attractive to prince andrei the more from the fact that hitherto he had never seen speransky in his family life but now he lost all desire to go at the hour set for the dinner however prince andrei reached speransky's own small house near the torrid gardens prince andrei was a little late when he was shown into the parquetry floored dining-room of the modest little residence distinguished for its extraordinary its rather monastic primness where all the gentlemen constituting speransky's petit comité being his most intimate friends had promptly assembled at five o'clock there were no ladies present except speransky's young daughter and her governess as prince andrei was in the vestibule he heard a clear precise ha 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 a laugh that afterward reminded him of actors on the stage some one whose voice sounded like speransky's rang out distinctly ha 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 prince andrei had never heard speransky laugh heartily and the clear ringing laugh of the great statesman struck him strangely prince andrei went into the dining-room all the company were gathered around a lunch-table standing between two windows and spread with zakuska speransky in a grey coat with a star and wearing the same immaculate white waistcoat and high white stock in which he had appeared at the memorable meeting of the imperial council stood at the table his face beaming with pleasure the gentlemen formed a circle around him magnitsky addressing mikhail mikhailovitch was relating an anecdote speransky listened and began to laugh even before magnitsky reached the point of his story at the moment prince andrei entered the room magnitsky's words were drowned in another roar of merriment stolupin's deep voice rang out as he bit up a morsel of bread and cheese zervais bubbled over with tinkling laughter and above all rang out speransky's loud deliberate ha 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 speransky still laughing gave his soft white hand to prince andrei very glad to see you prince said he one minute said he turning to magnitsky and interrupting the story he was telling we have made an agreement this time dinner is for recreation and not a word about business and again he turned to the narrator and again broke out into laughter prince andrei with amazement and sorrowful disenchantment listened to this guffawing and gazed at the hilarious speransky it seemed to prince andrei that this was not speransky but another man all the mystery and charm which he had hitherto discovered in speransky suddenly seemed commonplace and repulsive the conversation at the table did not flag for a moment and seemed to consist of little more than a string of ludicrous stories magnitsky had scarcely time to cap the climax of his story when some one else manifested his readiness to tell something that was even funnier the anecdotes were for the most part if not exactly confined to the world of officialdom at least related to individuals in the service it seemed as though in this gathering the insignificance of such characters was so thoroughly taken for granted that the only way in which it was worth while to speak of them was to cover them with good-natured ridicule speransky related how at the council meeting that morning one of the statesmen who happened to be deaf on being asked his opinion replied that he was entirely agreeable gervas related a long incident in connection with the census wherein remarkable stupidity had been shown by all persons concerned 
Stolupin, who had an impediment in his speech, joined the conversation and began eagerly to speak of the abuses of the former order of things, but, as this threatened to give too serious a character to the talk, Magnitsky chafed him on his earnestness. Gervais perpetrated a pun, and again the talk assumed its former hilarious character. Evidently Speransky, after his labors, liked recreation and amusement in a jolly circle of friends, and all his guests, knowing this characteristic of his, did their best to make him enjoy himself, and at the same time to enjoy themselves. But this gaiety seemed to Prince Andrei forced, and the opposite of gay. The ringing tones of Speransky's voice impressed him unpleasantly, and his incessant laughter had a false ring to it that strangely wounded his sensibilities. Prince Andrei could not laugh, and he was afraid that he should appear like a killjoy in the company, but no one noticed that he did not participate in the general merriment. It seemed to him that all were extremely gay. He tried several times to put in his word, but each time it was tossed back, as it were, like a cork tossed out of the water, and he had no success in jesting like the others. There was nothing wrong or ill-judged in what they said. There was wit and sense displayed, and it ought to have been really worth laughing at, but something, whatever it is, that constitutes the salt of gaiety, was lacking. But, worse than all, they did not seem to realize that it was. After dinner, Speransky's little daughter, with her governatka, withdrew. Speransky caressed the little girl with his white hand and kissed her, and even this action seemed to Prince Andrei full of affectation. The gentlemen, after the English fashion, remained sitting at the table over their port wine. The conversation had turned on Napoleon's management of affairs in Spain, and as all agreed in approving of it, Prince Andrei took it upon him to disagree with them. Speransky smiled, and, evidently wishing to change the subject, told a story which was totally irrelevant. Then silence ensued for several moments. Before they left the table, Speransky recorked a bottle in which a little wine was left, and saying, good wine is expensive these days, handed it to the servant and pushed back his chair. All arose and, talking noisily, passed into the drawing-room. Speransky was handed two envelopes brought by a courier. He took them and went into his private room. As soon as he had left, the general gaiety subsided and the guests began to talk together in subdued tones on matters of real interest. "'Well, then, now for recitation,' exclaimed Speransky, coming back from his private room. "'Wonderful talent,' said he, addressing Prince Andrei. Magnitsky immediately assumed an attitude, and began to recite some satirical verses, which he had written in French, upon certain well-known personages in Petersburg, and several times he was interrupted by applause. At the end of this recitation, Prince Andrei went to Speransky to take leave. "'Where must you be going so early?' asked Speransky. "'I promised to spend the evening.' All were silent." Prince Andrei looked into Speransky's mirror-like and impenetrable eyes, and it seemed to him ridiculous that he had ever expected anything great from this Speransky, or of the work which he had undertaken to perform, or how he could ever have attributed any importance to what Speransky was doing. It was long before that dry, measured laugh of his ceased to ring in his ears, even after he had taken his leave of Speransky. On his return home, Prince Andrei began to live over his life in Petersburg during the four months past, as though it were something new. He recalled his labors, his rounds of solicitation, the history of his project of the military code, which had been brought to notice and then quietly laid on the table for the sole reason that another one of very wretched character had already been compiled and placed before the sovereign. He recalled the meetings of his committee, of which Berg was a member, he recalled how strenuously and at what length everything that touched upon the outside forms and proceedings of their meetings had been discussed, and how careful they had been to avoid everything that reached the essence of the matter. He recalled his judicial labors, and what pains he had taken to translate articles on the Roman and French course of procedure into Russian, and he grew ashamed of himself. Then his imagination vividly brought up before his mind his estate in Bogucharovo, his projects in the country, his journey to Ryazan. He recalled his musics and their head man, and he applied to them his theory of the individual rights which he had so carefully elaborated into paragraphs, and he was amazed at himself that he could have wasted so much time in such idle work. End of chapter 18
Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 19 On the following day Prince Andrei went to make calls upon several families where he had not been as yet, and in the number upon the Rostovs, whose acquaintance he had renewed at the last ball. Not only was he required by the laws of politeness to call at the Rostovs, but he also had a strong desire to see in her own home this original and lively young girl, of whom he had such pleasant recollections. Natasha happened to be the first who came down to see him. She wore a simple blue morning dress, and it seemed to Prince Andrei that it was even more becoming to her than the one she had worn at the ball. She and the rest of the family received Prince Andrei simply and hospitably, as an old friend. The whole family, which he had at first been inclined to criticize severely, now seemed to him charming, simple-hearted, cordial people. The old count showed such genuine and unbounded hospitality, and his good nature was so contagious, especially there in Petersburg, that Prince Andrei could not with good grace refuse his invitation to dinner. "'Yes, they are excellent people,' said Bolkonsky to himself. "'Of course they cannot appreciate what a treasure they possess in Natasha, but they are good, kindly people, and they make a most admirable background against which to bring out all the charm of this wonderfully poetical young girl, so overflowing with vivacity. Prince Andrei felt that in Natasha existed a peculiar and unknown world, full of unrealized delights, that unknown world of which he had caught the first glimpse as he drove through the Otrandoya Avenue, and then again at the window that moonlit night, when he had been so stirred by it. Now this world no longer excited his curiosity, no longer was it a strange world, but, as he entered into it, he realized that new delight was awaiting him. After dinner, Natasha, at the Count's request, went to the harpsichord and began to sing. Prince Andrei took up his position by the window and listened, while occasionally exchanging words with the other ladies. When she reached the middle of a long cadenza, Prince Andrei stopped talking and, to his amazement, found that he was choked with tears a thing which he would not have believed possible for him. He looked at Natasha as she sang, and a new and joyous feeling arose in his heart. He was happy, and at the same time rather melancholy. He was ready to burst into tears, and yet he could not really have told why he felt like weeping. For what? His former love? For the little princess? For his disappointed illusions? For his hopes of the future? Yes and no— the chief reason that he felt like weeping was the sudden awakening to that strange and vivid contradiction between the boundlessly immense and infinite that existed in him and the narrow and limited world to which he felt that he himself and even she belonged. This contrast tormented and at the same time overjoyed him while she was singing. As soon as Natasha finished her song, she went to him and asked him frankly how he liked her voice. She asked the question and was overwhelmed with confusion the moment she had spoken realizing when it was too late that she ought not to have asked it he smiled as he looked at her and replied that he liked her singing just as he liked everything else that she did it was late that evening before prince andrei left the rostovs he went to bed as usual but soon found that he had a sleepless night before him now he would relight his candle and sit up in bed then he would get up then he would lie down again still he was not in the least oppressed by this sleeplessness his soul was so full of new and joyful sensations that it seemed to him as if he had just emerged from a sultry chamber into God's free world. Nor did it once occur to him that he was in love with the young Countess Rostova. He did not think of her, he only imagined her himself, and the consequence of this was that all his whole life presented itself to him in a new light. Why am I struggling? Why am I toiling and moiling in this narrow, petty environment when life— all of life, with all its pleasures, is open before me, he asked himself. And for the first time for long months, he began to devise cheerful plans for the future. He decided that it was his duty to undertake personally the education of his son, to find him an instructor and put him into his hands. Then he would quit the service and travel abroad, and see England, Switzerland, and Italy. I must make the most of my freedom, since I feel myself so overflowing with strength and energy, he said to himself. Pierre was right in saying that one ought to believe in the possibility of happiness, and now I believe it is so. Let the dead bury their dead, but while we are alive, let us live, he thought. End of chapter 19
Part three, chapter twenty of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter twenty. One morning, Colonel Adolf Berg, with whom Pierre was acquainted, just as he was acquainted with every one in Petersburg and Moscow, came to see him. He was dressed in an immaculate and brand new uniform, with little love locks curling round over his temples, and pomaded there, just as the sovereign wore them. I have just come from calling upon the countess, your wife, and I was so unfortunate in not being able to have my request granted. I hope, count, that I shall be more successful with you, he said with a smile. What would you like, colonel? I am at your service. I am now quite completely settled into my new rooms, count, pursued Berg, evidently convinced in his own mind that this communication could not fail to be an agreeable piece of news. And, consequently, I wanted to have a little reception for my friends, and my wife's he smiled more effusively than ever i wanted to ask the countess and yourself to do me the honour to come and take tea with us and and have supper only the countess elena vasilyevna who considered the society of such people as the bergs beneath her could have had the heart to refuse such an invitation berg explained so clearly why he desired to gather round him a small and select company and why it would be pleasant and why he grudged money spent on cards and other disreputable occupations, but was willing to go to large outlay in entertaining good company that Pierre could not think of refusing, and agreed to be present. Only don't come late, Count, if I may be so bold as to beg of you. At ten minutes to eight, I beg of you. We will have some whist. Our general will come. He is very good to me. We will have a good supper, Count, so please do me the favor. Contrary to his usual habit of being late, Pierre that evening reached the Bergs at quarter to eight, five minutes before the appointed time. The Bergs, having made every provision for the reception, were all ready and waiting for their guests to come. Berg and his wife were sitting together in their library, all new and bright, and well provided with statuary and paintings and new furniture. Berg, in a nice new uniform, tightly buttoned up, was sitting near his wife, explaining to her that it was always possible and proper to have acquaintances among people of high station, that being the only real advantage in having friends. You can always find something to imitate, and can ask any sort of advice. You see, that's the way I have done ever since I was first promoted. Berg did not reckon his life according to his years, but according to the various steps of promotion. My comrades have amounted to nothing, but at the first vacancy I shall be made regimental commander, and then I have the happiness of being your husband. He got up and kissed Vera's hand, but before he did so he straightened out the corner of a rug that was turned up. And how have I accomplished all this? Principally by exercising a choice in my acquaintances. Of course, though, one has to be straightforward and punctual. Berg smiled with the consciousness of his superiority over a weak woman, and relapsed into silence, saying to himself that his wife, lovely as she was, was, nevertheless, a feeble woman, unable to appreciate the full significance of the dignity of being a man, ein Mann zu sein. Vera, at the same time, smiled with a similar consciousness of her superiority over her good, worthy spouse, who nevertheless, like the rest of his sex, was quite mistaken, she thought, in his understanding of the meaning of life. Berg, judging by his wife, considered that all women were weak and unintellectual. Vera, judging by her husband alone, and making wider generalizations, supposed that all men considered no one but themselves wise, and, at the same time, had no real understanding, and were haughty and egotistical. Berg got up, and embracing his wife carefully, so as not to rumple her lace pearline, for which he had paid a high price, kissed her on the center of the lips. "'There is one thing. We must not begin to have children too soon,' said he, by an unconscious correlation of ideas." Yes, replied Vera. That's exactly what I want. We must live for society. The Princess Yusupovaya has one exactly like this, said Berg, laying his finger on the lace perrine with his honest, happy smile. At this time, Count Buzikoy was announced. The young couple exchanged congratulatory glances, each arrogating the credit of this visit. This is what comes of understanding how to form acquaintances, said Berg. This comes of having tact. Now, I beg you, don't interrupt me when I am talking with guests, said Vera, because I know how to receive each one and what to talk to them about. Berg also smiled. Of course, 
but sometimes among men there must be conversation for men said he pierre was shown into the new drawing-room where one could not possibly take a seat without destroying the symmetry neatness and order that reigned there and consequently it was perfectly comprehensible and not to be wondered at that it required much magnanimity of berg to allow this symmetry of chair or sofa to be disturbed for his beloved guest or that by reason of finding himself in a state of painful irresolution in regard to it he should have allowed his guest to solve the problem in his own way pierre accordingly broke into the cemetery by pushing out a chair and immediately after berg and vera came in and began to talk each interrupting the other and trying to entertain their guest vera deciding in her own mind that pierre would naturally be interested in the french embassy immediately began to talk about it berg deciding that a more virile subject must be chosen broke into his wife's discourse by raising a question in regard to the war with austria and found himself involuntarily digressing from the abstract topic to various concrete proposals which had been laid before him in regard to taking part in the austrian campaign and the reasons which had led him to decline them although the conversation was desultory and vera was indignant that this masculine element should have been introduced both husband and wife had a feeling of satisfaction that though as yet there was only one guest still the evening had begun auspiciously and that their reception was going to be like every other reception with talk tea and brightly lighted candles as like in fact as two drops of water shortly after this boris appeared he having been berg's former comrade he treated berg and vera with a shade of superiority and condescension boris was followed by a colonel and his lady then berg's own general then the rostofs and the reception by this time without a shadow of a doubt began to resemble all other receptions berg and vera could not refrain from a blissful smile at the sight of this stir in the drawing-room at the clatter of disconnected snatches of conversation at the rustle of silken dresses and the greetings everything was just as it would be everywhere else especially so was the general who could not find enough to say in praise of berg's apartments and patted him on the shoulder and with fatherly authority arranged the disposition of the tables for boston the general then sat down next count ilya andreyitch as being next to himself the guest of the greatest importance the old people gathered in groups by themselves the young people by themselves the hostess took her place at the tea-table which was laid out with exactly the same kind of macaroons in a silver cake basket as the panins had had at their reception in fact everything was the same as at all receptions End of chapter 20part three chapter twenty one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter twenty one pierre as one of the most distinguished guests of the evening naturally had to play boston in the set with count ilya andreyitch the general and the colonel it happened that his place at the table brought him opposite natasha and he could not help being struck by the strange change that had come over her since the evening of the ball she spoke scarcely a word and was not so pretty as she had been at the ball indeed she would have looked plain if it had not been for her sweet expression of resignation what is the matter with her pierre wondered as he looked at her she was sitting next to her sister at the tea-table and with an air of utter indifference and without even looking at him answered some remark that boris had made to her having played out a whole suit and taken five tricks greatly to his partner's satisfaction pierre as he gathered up his cards was again led to look at her by hearing complimentary greetings and then the steps of someone entering into the room what has happened to her he asked himself with even more wonder than before prince andrei with an expression of protecting affection was now standing in front of her and saying something to her she had lifted her head and was gazing at him with flushed cheeks and apparently striving to restrain her rapid breathing and the brilliant light of a strange inner fire till then suppressed again flashed up in her she was wholly transfigured instead of being plain she was as radiantly beautiful as she had been at the ball prince andrei came towards pierre and pierre noticed new and youthful expression in his friend's face pierre changed his seat several times during the game sometimes being before natasha and sometimes behind but during all the time of the six rubbers he kept watching her and his friend there is something very serious going on between them said pierre to himself 
and a feeling of mingled joy and sadness stirred him and made him forget his own grief. After the sixth rubber, the general got up, declaring that it was an impossibility to play in such a way, and Pierre was released. Natasha, on one side, was talking with Sonya and Boris. Vera, with a slight smile on her face, was talking to Prince Andrei about something or other. Pierre joined his friend, and, asking what secret they were discussing together, took a seat near them. Vera, having noticed Prince Andrei's attention to Natasha, had decided that that evening, that very evening, it was an unavoidable necessity for her to drop some shrewd insinuations in regard to the feelings, and so she took advantage of a moment when Prince Andrei was alone to begin a talk about the sensibilities in general and about her sister in particular. With such a clever man as she knew Prince Andrei to be, she was obliged to practice her most refined diplomacy. When Pierre joined them, he noticed that Vera was talking with great eloquence and self-satisfaction, while Prince Andrei seemed rather confused, which was a rare thing with him. "'What is your opinion?' asked Vera, with her slight smile. "'You have such keen insight, Prince, and are so quick to read people's characters. What do you think of Nathalie? Would she be very likely to be constant in her attachments? Would she be like other women?' Vera had herself in mind. "'And love a man once?' and remain forever faithful to him. That is what I call genuine love. What do you think, Prince? I have too slight an acquaintance with your sister, replied Prince Andrei, with a satirical smile, under which he tried to hide his confusion, to decide upon such a delicate question. And then I have noticed that the less attractive a woman is, the more likely she is to be constant, he added, and looked at Pierre, who had just at that instant joined them. "'Yes, that is true, Prince, in our days,' pursued Vera, speaking of our days in the way affected by people of limited intelligence, who suppose that they are the only ones who discover and appreciate peculiarities of their times, and that the natures of people change with changing years. Young girls have so much freedom that the pleasure of being wooed, les plaisirs d'être cotrisé, often stifles their true feelings. Et Natalia, il faut la voir. Il est très sensible. Yes, she is very susceptible to it. This reference to Natasha again caused Prince Andrei to scowl disagreeably. He was about to rise, but Vera proceeded with a still more subtle smile. I think no one has ever been more courtesé than she has, said Vera. But no one has ever really seriously succeeded in pleasing her until very recently. You must know, Count, said she, addressing Pierre. Even our dear cousin Boris has been entre nous and has been very, very far gone. Don le paix du tendre. Prince André scowled still more ominously, but said nothing. You and Boris are friends, are you not? asked Vera. Yes, I know him. I suppose he has told you about his boyish love for Natasha? Ah, so it was boyish love, was it? suddenly asked Prince André, unexpectedly reddening. Yes, you know, sometimes this intimacy between cousins leads to love. Cousinhood is a risky neighborhood. That's true, isn't it? Oh, yes, without doubt, said Prince André, and suddenly becoming unnaturally excited, he began to rally Pierre on his duty to be on his guard against any intimacy with his fifty-year-old cousins in Moscow. And then, right in the midst of this jesting talk, he got up, and taking Pierre by the arm, drew him aside. Well, what is it? asked Pierre, amazed at his friend's strange excitement, and remarking the look which, as he got up, he threw in Natasha's direction. "'I must really have a talk with you,' said Prince André. "'You know our gloves,' he referred to the Masonic gloves, which a newly initiated brother was to present to the lady of his love. "'I—but no. I will talk with you about it by and by.' And with a strange light in his eyes and a restlessness in his motions, Prince André crossed over to Natasha and sat down. Pierre saw how he asked her some question and how she blushed as she answered him. But just at that moment, Berg came up to Pierre and urged him to take part in a discussion between the general and the colonel on Spanish affairs. Berg was satisfied and happy. That blissful smile of his did not once fade from his face. The evening had been a success, and exactly like other receptions which he had attended. The parallelism was complete. The nice little gossipy chats between the ladies, the cards, and the general raising his voice over the game, the samovar and the macaroons. One thing only was lacking, which he had always seen at receptions and which he wished to imitate. 
That was a loud conversation between the men, and a discussion over some grave and momentous question. The general had begun this conversation, and now Berg carried Pierre off to take part in it. End of chapter 21「Part three, Chapter twenty two of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter twenty two. The next day, Prince Andrei went to the Rostovs to dinner, in accordance with Count Ilya Andreyitch's invitation, and spent the whole evening there. All in the house had an inkling of the reason of Prince Andrei's visits, and he made no secret of it, but spent what time he could in Natasha's company. Not only was Natasha, in her heart of hearts, frightened and yet blissful, and full of enthusiasm, but all the household also felt a sort of awe, in the anticipation of a great and solemn event. The countess, with melancholy and gravely wistful eyes, gazed at Prince Andrei, as he talked with Natasha, and, with a sort of timidity, tried to introduce some indifferent topic, as soon as he turned to her. Sonya was afraid to leave Natasha, and equally afraid that she was in their way when she was with her. Natasha grew pale with fear and expectation, if by chance she were left alone with him for a moment. Prince Andrei's timidity amazed her. She felt certain that he had something to say to her, but had not the courage to speak his mind. In the evening, when Prince Andrei had taken his departure, the countess went to Natasha. "'Well,' said she in a whisper, Mamma, for pity's sake, don't ask me any questions now. It is impossible to tell. Nevertheless, that night, Natasha, at one moment full of excitement, at the next full of trepidation, lay for a long time in her mother's bed, with eyes fixed on space. Now she would tell her mother how he praised her, and how he said he was going abroad, and how he asked her where they were going to spend the summer, and how he had asked her about Boris. Well, it's so strange so strange. I never knew anything like it before, said she. But I have such a feeling of terror when he is here. I always feel afraid when I am with him. What does it mean? Does it mean that it is really and truly? Mamma, are you asleep? No, my dear, Dusha Moya, I confess to the same feeling of terror, replied the mother. Go now. I shan't go to sleep all the same. How silly it would be to go to sleep— Mamasha, Mamasha, nothing like it has ever happened to me before, said she, in amazement and awe at the feeling which she was now experiencing. How could we possibly have imagined such a thing? It seemed to Natasha that even as long ago as when Prince Andrei had come to Otranoya, she had fallen in love with him at first sight. She was terror-stricken, as it were, at that strange, unexpected happiness in meeting again with the very man whom she had, as she persuaded herself, chosen for her husband then, and feeling that he was not indifferent to her. And it had to be that he should come to Petersburg just at the time when we were here, and it had to be that we should meet at the ball. It is evident that all this brought us together. Even when I saw him first, I felt something peculiar. "'What is it?' he has said to you. "'What were those verses? Repeat them to me,' said the Countess." trying to recall some verses which Prince Andrei had written in Natasha's album. "'Mamma, it's nothing to be ashamed of because he is a widower, is it?' "'Don't talk nonsense, Natasha. Pray to God. Le mariage se fond, don les sur. "'Sweetheart, Mamasha, how I love you, how good you are!' cried Natasha, shedding tears of bliss and emotion, and hugging her mother. At that same time, Prince Andrei was at Pierre's, telling him about his love for Natasha, and his firm intention of marrying her. That same evening, the Countess Elena Vasilyevna had given a rout. The French ambassador had been there, the foreign prince, who for some time had been a frequent visitor at the Countess's, had been present, as well as a throng of brilliant ladies and gentlemen. Pierre had come down and wandered through the rooms, attracting general notice among the guests, by his concentrated, distracted, and gloomy looks. Pierre, ever since the time of the ball, had been conscious that attacks of his old enemy, hypochondria, were imminent, and, with the energy of despair, had struggled to get the better of them. Since this prince had become the countess's acknowledged admirer, Pierre had unexpectedly been appointed one of the emperor's chamberlains, 
and from that time forth he began to feel a great burden and loathing in grand society, and more often his former gloomy, pessimistic thoughts about the falsity of all things human began to come back to him. At this particular time, this tendency to gloominess was accented by the discovery of the sympathy existing between his little protégé, Natasha, and Prince André, and by the contrast between his own position and his friend's. He vainly struggled to banish the thought about his wife, and about Natasha and Prince André, but everything began once more to seem insignificant in comparison with eternity, and again the question arose, to what end? Night and day he compelled himself to toil over his monastic labors, hoping to exorcise the demon that hovered near him. At midnight Pierre came from the Countess's apartments to his own low-studded room, which smelled of stale tobacco, and had just sat down at the table in his soiled dressing-gown, and started to finish copying certain original documents from Scotland, when someone came into the room. It was Prince André. "'Oh, it's you, is it?' said Pierre." in an abstracted and not over-cordial manner. "'I was hard at work, you see,' said he, pointing to his copy-book, where he had been working for dear life, just as wretched people, in their efforts to save themselves from the wretchedness of their lives, take up any occupation that comes to hand. Prince André, his face radiant with joy and kindled with new life, came and stood in front of Pierre, and, not perceiving how wretched his friend was, smiled down on him with the egotism of happiness. "'Well, my dear,' said he, "'last evening I wanted to tell you something, and now I have come to unbosom myself. It is something wholly unprecedented in my experience. I am in love, my dear fellow.' Pierre suddenly drew a deep sigh, and stretched his clumsy form out on the sofa near Prince André. "'With Natasha Rostova? Yes,' said he. "'Yes, yes, who else could it be?' I should never have believed it, but this feeling is stronger than I. Last evening I was tortured, I was miserable, but this torture I would not exchange for anything in the world. I have never lived till now. Only now do I live, and I cannot live without her. But can she love me? I am too old for her. What should you say? I? I? What could I say? suddenly exclaimed Pierre, springing up and beginning to pace the room. I have always thought— this girl is such a treasure, such a... She is a rare maiden, my dear fellow. I beseech you, don't reason about it. Don't let doubts arise, but marry her. Marry her. Yes, marry her. And I am convinced that you will be the happiest man alive. But how about her? She loves you. Don't talk nonsense, said Prince André with a smile, and looking straight into Pierre's eyes. She loves you. I know she does, cried Pierre bluntly. Now listen, said Prince André, holding him by his arm. Do you know what position I am in? I must tell someone all about it. Well, well, go on. I am very glad, said Pierre, and in reality his face had changed. The frown had smoothed itself out, and he listened to Prince André with joyous sympathy. Prince André seemed, and really was, another and wholly new man. Where had vanished his melancholy, his contempt of life, all his disillusion? Pierre was the only man in whose presence he could speak with absolute frankness, and hence he poured out before him the fullness of his heart. Then he fluently and boldly made plans for the future, declaring that he could not think of sacrificing his happiness to his father's caprices, and expressing his hope that his father would consent to their marriage, and would come to love Natasha. Then he expressed his amazement at the strange and uncontrollable feeling which dominated him. "'If any one had predicted the possibility of my being so deeply in love, I should not have believed it, said Prince André. It is an entirely different sentiment from the one that I had formerly. The whole world is divided for me into two portions. The one is where she is, and there all happiness and hope and light are found. The other is where she is not, and there everything is gloom and darkness. Darkness and gloom, repeated Pierre. Yes, yes, and how I appreciate that. I cannot help loving light, and I am not to blame for it. And I am very happy. Do you understand me? I know that you sympathize with my joy. Yes, indeed, I do, said Pierre earnestly, gazing at his friend with tender, melancholy eyes. Prince André's fate seemed to him all the brighter from the vivid contrast with the darkness of his own. End of chapter 22
Part three, chapter twenty three of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter twenty three. Prince Andre required his father's sanction for his marriage, and the next day he set out for his home. The old prince received his son's communication with external unconcern, but with wrath in his heart. As his own life was nearing its close, he could not understand how any one could wish to make such a change in his life, to introduce into it such a new and unknown element. If only they would let me live out my life in my own way, then, when I am gone, they can do as they please, said the old man to himself. With his son, however, he made use of that diplomacy which he employed in matters of serious import. Assuming a tranquil tone, he summed the whole matter up. In the first place, the match was not brilliant, as to the birth, fortune, or distinction of the bride's family. In the second place, Prince Andre was not as young as he had once been, and his health was feeble. The old prince laid a special stress on this, and she was very young. In the third place, he had a son, whom it would be a shame to give over to the mercy of a young stepmother. In the fourth place, finally, said the father, giving his son an ironical look, I beg of you to postpone the affair for a year. Go abroad, go through a course of treatment, find a good German tutor for Prince Nikolai, and then, if your love, passion, stubbornness, whatever you call it, is as strong as ever, why, marry her. And this is my last word, remember, absolutely my last word, concluded the old prince, in a tone that signified that nothing could ever change his mind. Prince Andrei clearly saw that the old prince hoped that either his sentiments or his prospective brides might not withstand the test of a year, or else that he himself, since he was an old man, might die meantime. He, accordingly, determined to obey his father's wishes, to offer himself, and then postpone the wedding for a year. Three weeks after his last call at the Rostovs, Prince Andrei returned to Petersburg. The day following her confidential talk with her mother, Natasha waited anxiously for Bolkonsky, but he did not come. The second day, and the third day, it was precisely the same. Pierre also failed to come, and Natasha, not knowing that the prince had gone to see his father, could not explain his absence. Thus elapsed three weeks. Natasha had no desire to go anywhere, and she wandered like a languid and mournful shadow through the rooms, Evenings she hid herself away from the others and wept, and no longer came to her mother's bedchamber. She frequently flushed, and her temper grew peevish. She had an impression that everybody knew about her disappointment, and was laughing at her and pitying her. This grief, born of pride, added to her misery, all the more from the fact that it was hidden grief. One time she went to the countess and tried to say something, but suddenly burst into tears. Her tears were like those of a child, who had been unjustly punished, and who knows not why. The countess tried to calm her, but the young girl, though she at first began to listen, suddenly interrupted her. "'Do stop, Mamma. I do not even think of him. He came, and then he stopped coming. He stopped coming, that's all.' Her voice faltered. She almost wept, but she controlled herself and went on. "'I haven't any desire at all to be married, and I have been afraid of him all the time. I'm perfectly content now perfectly content. On the day following this conversation, Natasha put on an old dress for which she had an especially tender feeling, owing to the gay times which she had enjoyed when wearing it in days past, and from that morning she once more resumed the occupations that she had dropped since the time of the ball. After she had drunk her tea, she went into the ballroom, which she liked on account of its powerful resonance, and began to practice her solfeggi and other exercises. After she had finished her lesson, she stood in the middle of the room and repeated a single musical phrase which pleased her more than others. She joyfully listened to the charming and apparently unexpected way in which those notes reverberated through the empty spaces of the ballroom, and slowly died away, and suddenly her heart grew lighter. "'What is the use of thinking so much about it all? It is good as it is,' she said to herself, and she began to pace up and down the room." not content with simply walking along the echoing inlaid floor, but at every step, she wore her favorite new slippers, setting her little heels down first and then her toes, and finding no more enjoyment in the sounds of her voice than in the regular clapping of the heel and the creaking of the toe. 
As she passed the mirror, she glanced into it. What a girl I am! The expression of her face, as she caught sight of the reflection in the glass, seemed to say, It's all good. I need no one. A lackey was on the point of coming in to make some arrangements in the ballroom, but she sent him away, closing the door after him, and then continued her walk. Now again, this morning, she resumed her former favorite habit of loving and admiring her own sweet self. "'How charming this Natasha is,' she was saying, as though the words were spoken by some third person, the man of her imagination. "'Pretty, a good voice, young, and she does not interfere with any one. only leave her in peace.' But even if she had been left in peace, she could not have been calm, and of this she was immediately made aware. The front door into the vestibule was opened, and someone asked, "'Are they at home?' and then a man's steps were heard. Natasha was gazing into the mirror, but she did not see herself. She heard voices in the vestibule. When her face again cleared itself before her eyes, she was pale. It was he. She was sure of it, though she could barely distinguish the voices through the closed doors. Pale and frightened, Natasha ran into the drawing-room. "'Mama, Bolkonsky has come,' she cried. "'Mama, this is dreadful. This is unendurable. I will not be tortured so.' What shall I do? The countess had not time to answer a word when Prince André, with a grave and anxious face, was shown in. As soon as he caught sight of Natasha, a flash of joy lighted it. He kissed the countess's hand and Natasha's and took a seat near the sofa. It is a long time since we have had the pleasure, the countess began to say, but Prince André interrupted her. He answered her implied question and was evidently anxious to speak what was on his mind as soon as possible. I have not been to see you all this time, for the reason that I went to confer with my father. I only returned yesterday evening, he said, glancing at Natasha. I should like to have a little conversation with you, Countess, he added, after a moment's silence. The Countess, drawing a long sigh, dropped her eyes. I am at your service, she murmured. Natasha knew that it was her duty to leave the room, but she found it impossible to stir. Something choked her, and she stared at Prince André, almost rudely, with wide eyes. "'What? So soon? This very moment? No, it cannot be,' she said to herself. He again looked at her, and this glance told her that beyond a peradventure she was not deceived. Yes, her fate was to be decided instantly, that moment, then and there. "'Go, Natasha, I will send for you,' whispered the Countess." Natasha, with startled, pleading eyes, looked at her mother and at Prince André, and left the room. "'I have come, Countess, to ask your daughter's hand,' said Prince André. The Countess's face flushed, but she said nothing. "'Your proposal,' began the Countess gravely. Prince André waited and looked into her eyes. "'Your proposal,' she grew confused, "'is very pleasing to us, and—' and I accept, accept your proposal with pleasure, and my husband, I hope, but it will depend upon herself. I will ask her as soon as I receive your permission. Will you grant it? said Prince André. Yes, said the Countess, and she offered him her hand, and, with a mixed feeling of alienation and affection, touched his brow with her lips as he bent over her hand. She was ready to love him as a son, but she was conscious that he held her at a distance and filled her with a sort of terror. "'I am sure that my husband will give his consent,' said the Countess. "'But your Batyushka, "'My father, to whom I have confided my plans, has consented, on the express stipulation that the wedding should not take place within a year, and this was the very thing that I wished to tell you,' said Prince André. "'It is true that Natasha is still young, but a year is a long time.' "'There is no alternative,' said Prince André, with a sigh. "'I will send her to you,' said the Countess, and she left the room. "'Lord, have mercy upon us,' she repeated, over and over, as she went in search of her daughter. Sonya said that Natasha was in her chamber. She found her sitting on her bed, pale, with dry eyes, gazing at the holy pictures, and swiftly crossing herself and whispering unintelligible words. When she saw her mother, she jumped up and rushed to her, what? Mamma, what is it? Go, go to him. He has proposed for your hand, said the countess coldly. 
so it seemed to Natasha. Go, go, reiterated the mother, drawing a long sigh and looking with melancholy, reproachful eyes after her daughter as she flew out of the room. Natasha could not have told, for the life of her, how she found herself in the drawing-room, but as she went into the room and caught sight of him, she stopped short. "'Can it be that this stranger is now all in all to me?' she asked herself, and the reply came like a flash. "'Yes, he alone is dearer to me than all in the world.' Prince Andrei went to her with downcast eyes. "'I have loved you from the first moment that I saw you. May I dare to hope?' He looked at her, and the grave passion expressed in his face filled her with wonder. Her eyes replied, "'Why should you ask? Why should you doubt what you must truly know? Why should you speak, when it is impossible, with words, to express what you feel?' She drew near to him and paused. He took her hand and kissed it. "'Do you love me?' "'Yes,' yes,' exclaimed Natasha, with something that seemed almost like vexation, and catching her breath more and more frequently, she began to sob. "'What is it? What is the matter?' "'Ah, oh, I am so happy,' she replied, smiling through her tears and coming closer to him. She hesitated for a moment, as though asking if it were permissible, and then kissed him. Prince Andrei held her hand and gazed into her eyes, and failed to find in his heart his former love for her. A sudden transformation seemed to have taken place in his soul— there was none of that former poetical and mysterious charm of longing, but there was a feeling akin to pity for her weakness, as a woman, as a child. There was a shade of fear in presence of her utter self-renunciation and her fearless honesty, a solemn and, at the same time, blissful consciousness of the obligation which forever bound him to her. The present feeling, though it was not so bright and poetical as the former, was more deep and powerful. "'Has your maman told you that our marriage cannot be until a year has passed?' asked Prince Andrei, continuing to gaze into her eyes. "'Can it be that this is the little silly chit of a girl, as they all say of me?' mused Natasha. "'Can it be that from this time forth I am the wife, the equal, of this stranger, this gentle, learned man, whom even my father regards with admiration? Can it be true that now, henceforth, life has become serious, that now I am grown up, that now I shall be responsible for every word and deed. Yes, but what was that he asked me? No, she said aloud, but she did not know what he had asked her. Forgive me, said Prince Andrei, but you are so young, and I have already had such long experience of life. I tremble for you. You do not know yourself." Natasha, with concentrated attention, listened to what he said, and did her best to take in the full meaning of his words, but it was impossible. "'How hard this year will be for me, deferring my happiness,' pursued Prince Andrei. "'But during that time you will have to make sure of your own heart. At the end of the year I shall ask you to make me happy, but you are free. Our betrothal shall remain a secret, and if you should discover that you do not love me, if you should love—' said Prince Andrei, with a forced and unnatural smile. "'Why do you say that?' asked Natasha, interrupting him. "'You know that from the very first day that you came to Otranoya I loved you,' she said, firmly convinced that she was telling the truth. "'In a year you will have learned to know yourself.' "'A whole year!' suddenly exclaimed Natasha, it now suddenly for the first time dawning upon her that the wedding was to be postponed.' And why a year? Why a year? Prince Andrei began to explain the reasons for this postponement. Natasha refused to listen to him. And is there no other way of doing? she asked. Prince Andrei made no answer, but the expression of his face told her how unalterable his decision was. This is terrible. No, this is terrible. Terrible! suddenly exclaimed Natasha, and again she began to sob. I shall die if I have to wait a year. It cannot be. It is dreadful. She looked into her lover's face and saw that it was full of sympathy and perplexity. No, no, I, I will do everything you wish, she said, suddenly ceasing to sob. I am so happy. Her father and mother came into the room and congratulated the affianced pair. 
from that day forth prince andrei began to visit the rostovs as natasha's accepted husband end of chapter twenty three Part Three, Chapter Twenty Four of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Four. There was no former betrothal, and Bolkonsky's engagement to Natasha was not made public. Prince Andrei insisted on this point. He said that as he was the cause of the postponement, he ought to bear the whole burden of it. He declared that he considered himself forever bound by his word but he felt that he ought not to hold Natasha, and he granted her perfect freedom. If, within half a year, she should discover that she did not love him, she should have perfect right to break the engagement. Of course, neither the parents nor Natasha would hear to this, but Prince Andrei pressed the matter. Prince Andrei was at the Rostovs every day, but he did not treat Natasha with the familiarity of the zunek, or bridegroom. He always addressed her by the formal vu, you, and only kissed her hand. Between Prince Andrei and Natasha, after the day of their engagement, there seemed to be an entirely different relationship from before, one closer and more simple. It seemed as though they hitherto had never known each other. Both of them liked to recall how they had seemed at the time when they were nothing to each other. Now they felt that they were entirely different beings. Then everything was pretense. Now it was simple and true. At first the family felt a certain awkwardness in their relations toward Prince Andrei. He seemed like a man from another world, and it took Natasha a long time to train the others to feel used to him, and she felt a pride in assuring them all that it was only in appearance that Prince Andrei was so different, and that he was really like everyone else, and that she was not afraid of him, and that no one had any reason to fear him. After some days the family got wanted to him, and felt no awkwardness in going on with the ordinary routine of life in his presence, and he also had a share in it. He could talk with the Count about farming, about wearing apparel with the Countess and Natasha, and about albums and embroidery with Sonya. Sometimes the family, when by themselves, and even in Prince Andrei's presence, marveled that such an event had taken place, that the prognostics of it had been so apparent. Thus, Prince Andrei's visit to Otranoya, and their coming to Petersburg, and the resemblance between Natasha and Prince Andrei, which an old nurse had remarked when he first came to Otranoya, and many other portents of what had happened were recalled by the family. That poetical infestivity and silence, which always marked the presence of an engaged couple, reigned in the house. Oftentimes, when all were together, not a soul would say a word. Sometimes the rest would get up and leave the room, and even then the two young people, though by themselves, would sit in perfect silence as before. They rarely spoke about their future. Prince Andrei avoided it, from dread, as well as from conscientious motives. Natasha shared his feelings, as, indeed, she shared all his feelings, which she was always quick to read. Once, Natasha began to ask him about his little boy. Prince Andrei flushed, as he was apt to do at that time, and Natasha particularly liked it in him, and replied that his son would not live with them. "'Why not?' asked Natasha. "'I could not take him away from his grandfather, and, besides—' "'How I should love him!' exclaimed Natasha— instantly divining his thought. But I understand. You are anxious to avoid any excuse for misunderstandings between us. The old count sometimes came to Prince Andrei, kissed him, and asked him his advice in regard to Petya's education or Nikolai's advancement in the army. The old countess would sigh as she looked at them. Sonya was always afraid that she was in the way and tried to invent excuses for leaving them alone, even when they did not care to be. When Prince Andrei talked— and he was very admirable in conversation. Natasha would listen to him with pride. When she herself spoke, she noticed with fear and joy that he listened to her with attention and scrutinized her keenly. She would ask herself in perplexity, What is he searching for in me? What are his eyes trying to discover? Supposing he were not to find in me what he seeks to find? Occasionally she was attacked by one of those absurd fits of mirth, peculiar to her, and then it was a delight for her to see and hear him laugh. He rarely laughed aloud, but when he did indulge in merriment, he gave himself up entirely to it, and always, after such an experience, she felt that she had grown nearer to him. Natasha would have been perfectly happy if the thought of their parting, which was now near at hand, had not filled her with vague alarm, so much so that she grew pale and chill at the mere thought of it. 
On the evening before his departure from Petersburg, Prince Andrei brought Pierre, who had not once called at the Rostovs since the evening of the ball. Pierre seemed confused and out of spirits. He devoted all his attention to the countess. Natasha was sitting with Sonya, playing checkers, and this was in itself an invitation for Prince Andrei to join them. He did so. "'You have known Buzakai for a long time, have you not?' he asked. "'Do you like him?' "'Yes, he is a splendid man, but very absurd.' And, as was usually the case when speaking of Pierre, she began to relate anecdotes of his heedlessness, anecdotes, many of which were wholly imaginary as far as he was concerned. "'You know, I have told him our secret,' said Prince Andre. "'I have known him since we were boys. His heart is true gold. I beg of you, Nathalie,' said he, growing suddenly grave. "'I am going away. God knows what may happen. You may cease to—' "'Well, I know that I ought not to speak of this. One thing, though, in case anything should happen after I am gone—' "'What could happen?' "'If there should be any misfortune,' pursued Prince Andre, "'I beg you, Mademoiselle Sophie, if anything should happen, go to him for help and counsel. He may be a most heedless and absurd man, but his heart is the truest gold. Not Natasha's father, or mother, or Sonya, or Prince Andre himself, could have foreseen what an effect parting from her lover would have upon Natasha.' Flushed and excited, with burning eyes, she wandered all day long up and down the house, busying herself with the most insignificant things, as though she had no idea of what was going to happen. She did not shed a tear, even at the moment when he kissed her hand for the last time and bade her farewell. "'Don't leave me,' was all that she said, but these words were spoken in a voice that caused him to pause and consider whether it was really necessary for him to go away, and which he remembered long afterward." Even after he had gone, she did not weep, but she stayed in her room for many days, not shedding a tear, and she took no interest in anything, and only said from time to time, "'Ach, why did he go?' But a fortnight after his departure, most unexpectedly to the household, she woke up out of this moral illness, and began to seem the same as formerly, except that her whole moral nature was changed, just as the faces of children change during protracted illness." End of chapter 24
she had a presentiment that something unusual had happened to him but he said nothing to her about his love before he went away he was closeted for a long time with his father and the princess maria noticed that each was displeased with the other shortly after prince andrei's departure the princess maria wrote to her friend julie karagina who was at that time in petersburg and in mourning for her brother who had been killed in turkey like all young girls the princess maria had her dreams and one of hers was that julie would yet become her brother's wife affliction my dear and affectionate friend julie is evident in the common lot of all of us your loss is so awful that i can only explain it as being a special providence of god who in his love for you has seen fit to try you and your excellent mother ah my dear friend religion and religion alone can i will not say console us but save us from despair religion alone can make plain to us what without her aid it is impossible for a man to comprehend why for what purpose should beings who are good and noble and best made to find happiness in life who have not only never injured a living thing but rather have sought only the happiness of others why should they be recalled to god while the base and the vicious or those who are only a burden to themselves and others are left to live the first death which i ever witnessed and i shall never forget it was that of my dear sister-in-law and it produced upon me a wonderful impression just as you are now asking fate why your charming brother had to die so did i ask why this angelic lisa should be taken away when she had never done the slightest wrong to any one and never had anything but the purest thoughts in her soul and since then my dear friend five years have passed away and even with my humble intelligence i begin to see clearly why she had to die and how her death may be regarded as merely the expression of the creator's infinite goodness all of whose works though for the most part beyond our comprehension are but the manifestation of his boundless love to his creatures i often think that perhaps her purity was too angelic to be compatible with the force necessary to carry all the obligations of motherhood as a young wife she was beyond reproach possibly she might have failed as a mother now although she has left us and prince andrei in particular the purest regret the sweetest memories I am sure that she herself is in the enjoyment of that place which I dare not hope for myself to attain. But, not to speak of her exclusively, this premature and terrible death has had a most salutary effect, notwithstanding all the sorrowfulness of it, upon my brother and myself. These thoughts at that time would have been impossible. At that time I should have repelled them with horror. But now this is plain, and beyond a peradventure. I write this to you, my friend, simply hoping that it may persuade you of the gospel truth which i have taken as the rule of my whole life that not one hair from our head shall fall without his will and his will is conditioned only by infinite love toward us and therefore all that happens to us is for good you ask if we are going to spend next winter in moscow in spite of all my desire to see you i think it most improbable and indeed i cannot think that it is for the best and you will be amazed when i tell you that the reason of that is bonaparte and this is why my father's health has been failing of late he cannot endure any contradiction and has grown irritable this irritability as you may know is especially excited by political affairs he cannot endure the thought that bonaparte has so managed as to put himself on an equality with all the sovereigns of europe and especially with ours the grandson of the great catherine as you know i am perfectly indifferent to politics but from words spoken by my father and from his discussions with mikhail ivanovitch i know all that is going on in the world and particularly about all the honours attained by bonaparte who i should think is considered a great man and not the least of the french emperors over all the world except at louis yagure and this is what my father will not admit it seems to me that my father precisely on account of his views of political affairs and foreseeing the collisions which would infallibly take place in consequence of his character taking no account of any one when he expresses his opinions feels unwilling to go to moscow all the gain that he would get he would more than undo by the quarrels which would be sure to follow in regard to bonaparte at all events the question is soon to be decided our home life goes on in the old routine except that my brother andre is away as i have already written to you he has been very much changed of late 
this year for the first time since his affliction he has begun to lead a perfectly normal life he has become what he was when he was a child as i remember him kind affectionate and with a truly golden heart the like of which i never knew he has learned so it seems to me that his life after all is not yet ended but together with this moral change his physical health has deteriorated he is far worse than before more nervous i am troubled about him and i am glad that he has decided to take the trip abroad which the doctor long ago prescribed for him i hope that it will effect a complete cure you write me that he is spoken of in petersburg as one of the most industrious cultivated and intelligent young men of the day forgive a sister's pride but i have never doubted it it is impossible to estimate the good which he has accomplished here beginning with his own peasantry and including the nobility of the district in going to petersburg he has received only what was due him i am amazed that rumors should have come from petersburg to moscow and especially such false rumors as what you wrote me in regard to the supposed marriage of my brother to the little rostova i do not believe that my brother will ever marry again and certainly he will not marry her and this is my reason for thinking so in the first place i know that though he rarely mentions his late wife yet he was too deeply afflicted by her loss to ever think of letting another fill her place in his heart or giving a stepmother to our little angel in the second place to the best of my knowledge this young girl is not the sort of woman who would be likely to please prince andrei i feel certain that he would not choose her for his wife and i will frankly confess that i do not desire it but i have prattled too long already here i am finishing my second sheet good-bye my dear friend may god shield you under his holy and almighty wing my dear companion mademoiselle burine sends her love marie End of chapter twenty five part three chapter twenty six of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter twenty six in the middle of the summer the princess maria received a letter from her brother from switzerland in which he confided the strange and surprising news of his engagement to natasha his whole letter breathed enthusiastic devotion for his bride and affectionate and trusting love for his sister he wrote that he had never loved as he loved now and that now only did he realize and understand the meaning of life he besought his sister to pardon him for not having said anything to her about this at his visit at luisia guri although he had confided his intention to his father he had not told her because the princess maria would have endeavored to persuade their father to grant his request and if she had failed it would have irritated him and the whole weight of his displeasure would have come upon her moreover he wrote the matter is not so definitely settled as it is now then my father had set a term of probation a year and now already six months have slipped away half of the designated term and i remain firmer than ever fixed in my determination if the doctors had not detained me here at the springs i should have been back in russia ere this but now i must postpone my return for three months longer you know me and how i am situated in regard to my father i really need nothing from him i have been and shall be always independent of him but to act contrary to his wishes to incur his anger when perhaps he has so short a time to remain among us would destroy half of my happiness i have just been writing him a letter in regard to this and i beg of you if you can find a favorable moment give him this letter and inform me how he receives it and whether there is any hope that he will consent to shorten the term by three months after a long period of indecision doubting and prayer the princess handed the letter to her father the day following the old prince said to her without any show of excitement write to your brother to wait till i'm dead it won't be long he'll soon be free the princess tried to make some reply but her father would not hear it and his voice began to rise higher and higher mary mary my little dove fine family clever people ha rich ha yes a fine stepmother for the little nikolushka she'll make write him that he may marry her to-morrow if he wishes she'll make a fine stepmother for nikolushka and i'll marry burenka ha 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 so that he may have a stepmother as well there's one thing though there's no room for any more women here let him marry and go and live by himself perhaps you'd like to go and live with him said he 
turning to the Princess Maria. Go, then, in God's name, through ice and snow. Ice and snow! Ice and snow! After this explosion, the old prince said nothing more on that score, but his restrained vexation at his son's weakness was expressed in his treatment of his daughter. And now he had new themes for his sarcasm, in addition to his old ones, namely, stepmothers, and his admiration for Mademoiselle Burine. "'Why should I not marry her?' he asked his daughter. "'She would make a splendid princess.' And the Princess Maria began to notice, with perplexity and amazement, that her father more and more tried to have the Frenchwoman about him as much as possible. The Princess Maria wrote Prince André how their father had received his letter, but she tried to comfort her brother, giving him to hope that her father might be dissuaded from this notion. Nikolushka and his education— Andre and religion were the Princess Maria's consolation and delight, but, as every human being must cherish some individual aspiration, so also the Princess Maria had, in the deepest depths of her soul, secret dreams and hopes which constituted a higher consolation even than the others. This consoling dream and hope was represented to her mind by the men of God, the pilgrims and fanatics, who came to see her without the old prince's knowledge. The longer the Princess Maria lived— and the more experience she got out of life, by carefully observing it, the more she marveled at the short-sightedness of men who seek here on earth all their enjoyment and delight, who toil and moil, and battle and struggle, and do evil to one another, in order to follow these impossible, shameful phantoms of happiness. Prince André loved his wife. She died. He was all ready to find his happiness in another woman." His father objected to this, because he desired for his son a more distinguished and wealthy alliance, and thus all men struggled, and suffered, and tortured themselves, and risked the loss of their souls, their immortal souls, for the sake of attaining joys which were merely transitory. Not only do we know this ourselves, but Christ, the Son of God, came down to earth and taught us that this life is fleeting, a short probation, and yet we cling to it always, and expect to find happiness in it. How is it that no one comprehends this? asked the Princess Maria. None except those despised men of God who come to me with wallets on their shoulders, climbing the back stairs for fear lest they should meet the Prince, not to avoid suffering, but for the sake of preventing him from committing a sin, to forsake family and fatherland, and forswear all endeavor to get earthly good, to form no ties, and to wander under an assumed name, in hempen rags, from place to place, doing no harm to any one, and praying for people, praying for those who persecute you, as well as for those who give you protection. There is no truth, and no life, higher than that. There was one pilgrim woman, Fedosyushka, a little, gentle, pockmarked woman, fifty years old, who had been for thirty years wandering about the world, barefooted, and wearing penitential chains. The Princess Maria was especially fond of her. Once in the solitude of her chamber— feebly illumined only by the lampadka, or shrine-lamp. When Fedoyushka had been telling her about her experiences, the thought that the pilgrim woman had found the only true path of life suddenly came over her with such appealing force that she herself resolved to go on a pilgrimage. After Fedoyushka had retired to rest, the Princess Maria long pondered the matter in her own mind, and at last resolved, no matter how unusual it was, that it was her duty to make this pilgrimage. She confided her resolve only to the monk, who was her confessor, and the confessor gave the plan his approval. Under the pretext that she was going to help some pilgrim, the Princess Maria sent and purchased a pilgrim's complete outfit, shirt, lapti, or bast shoes, a kafkin, and a black kerchief. Frequently she would go to the curtained commode, where she kept them, and stand irresolute, wondering whether the time had not yet come for her to carry out her vow. Oftentimes, when she heard the stories told by the pilgrims, she would be stirred by their simple narratives, which to her were full of profound meaning, though so mechanically repeated by them, till, oftentimes, she was ready to renounce everything and flee from her home. In her imagination she already saw herself, and Fedoyushka, in filthy rags, tramping along with staff and birch-bark wallet, over the dusty highway, rambling about from one saint's shrine to another, without envy, without the love of her fellows, without desires, and, at the end of all, journeying thither, where there is no regret and no tears, but eternal joy and felicity. I shall go to a place where there is a saint. I shall pray there. 
but before i get attached to the place or love any one i shall pass on and i shall keep wandering on until my limbs fail under me and then i shall lie down and die anywhere and then at last i shall reach that eternal haven of peace where there is no regret and no sorrow said the princess maria to herself but later when she saw her father and especially the little coco her resolve lost its force she shed a few quiet tears and had the consciousness that she was a sinner she loved her father and her nephew more than god end of chapter 26 and this is the end of volume 2 part 3volume two part four chapter one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter one the biblical tradition tells us that absence of work idleness constituted the first man's happiness before the fall a love for idleness remains just the same even in fallen man but the curse still hangs over mankind, and it is impossible for us to be slothful and easy-going, not alone because we are required to earn our bread in the sweat of our brow, but by the very conditions of our moral nature. A secret voice warns us that to be idle is for us a sin. If it were possible for a man to find a situation where he could feel that he was of use in the world, and fulfilling his duty while still remaining idle, he would have found one of the conditions of primeval bliss." and such a condition of obligatory and irreproachable idleness is enjoyed by a whole class of society the military and this state of obligatory and irreproachable idleness has always been and will be the chief attraction of military service nikolai rostov had been enjoying this felicity to the full having continued since eighteen o seven to serve in the pavlograd regiment he was now commander of the squadron of which denisov had been deprived Rostov had grown into a rather rough but kindly young fellow, whom his Moscow acquaintances would have found sufficiently mauvais genre, but who was loved and respected by his comrades, his subordinates, as well as his superiors, and he was well satisfied with his existence. Latterly, in 1809, in letters from home, he had found more and more frequent complaints from his mother that their pecuniary affairs were going from bad to worse, and that it would be seasonable for him to come home and give his old parents some joy and consolation. In reading over these letters, Nikolai felt a sensation of alarm at the thought of being torn from the condition of life where he found himself so quiet and tranquil, far removed from the busy turmoil of society. He had a presentiment that, sooner or later, he should be dragged again into that whirlpool of life, with its wasteful expenditure and rearrangement of affairs, with its accounts to verify, with its quarrels, intrigues, obligations— with the demands of society, and with Sonia's love, and the necessity of an explanation. All this was terribly difficult and confused, and he answered his mother's letters with cold formality, beginning, Ma chère maman, and concluding with, Votre obé son fils, and studiously refrained from setting any time for his return home. In 1810 he received a letter from his parents who informed him of the engagement between Natasha and Balkonsky, and that the wedding was put off for a year, on account of the old prince refusing his sanction. This news grieved and disgusted Nikolai. In the first place, he was pained at the thought of losing Natasha from the household, for he was fonder of her than the other members of the family. In the second place, he was annoyed, from his point of view as a hussar, that he had not been on hand to make this Bolkonsky understand that this alliance was not a very great honor, and that if he loved Natasha he might have married her, even without his scatterbrained father's consent. For a moment he almost made up his mind to ask for a leave of absence, so as to see Natasha before she was married. But just then came the army maneuvers. He remembered Sonya and the various entanglements, and once more he postponed it. But in the spring of that same year he received a letter from his mother, who wrote without the Count's knowledge, and this letter prompted him to go. She wrote that if he did not come, and did not assume the management of their affairs, their whole property would have to be sold by auction, and they would all be thrown upon the world. The Count was so weak, he had so much confidence in Matenka, he was so good-natured and so easily cheated by everyone, that everything was going from bad to worse. For God's sake, I beg of you, come immediately, unless you wish to make me and all the family unhappy, wrote the Countess. This letter had its effect upon Nikolai. He was possessed of the sound common sense of mediocrity, and it told him that this was his duty. 
Now, it was requisite that he should go on leave of absence if not upon the retired list. He could not have explained why he had to go, but, after his siesta, he commanded his roan stallion Mars to be saddled. He had not been out for a long time, and was at any time a terribly fiery steed, and when he brought him home, all in a lather, he explained to Lavrushka, Denisov's man had stayed on with Rostov, and to his comrades who dropped in that afternoon, that he had obtained leave of absence and was going home. How hard it was for him to realize that he was going to absent himself from army life, the only thing that especially interested him, and fail to find whether he had been promoted or granted the Anna for the last maneuvers. How strange it was to think that he was going away before he had sold that Troyoka, or three-span, of Rhone's to the Polish Count Holuchowski, which they had been negotiating about, and which Rostov had wagered would bring two thousand rubles. How impossible to realize that he should miss the ball which the hussars were going to give to the Panik Pazdjeka, in order to pique the Ulans, who had given a ball to their Pane Borozhowska. He knew that he must leave, go away from all this bright, pleasant existence, and go where everything was trouble and turmoil. At the end of a week he was granted his leave of absence. His comrades of the hussars, not only those of his regiment, but the whole brigade, gave him a dinner which cost them fifteen rubles a head. They had two bands to play, and two choruses to sing for them. Rostov danced the trebaka with Major Basov. The tipsy officers tossed him, embraced him, and deposited him on the ground again. The soldiers of the third squadron once more tossed him, and cried hurrah. Then they carried him to his sledge, and escorted him as far as the first station. As is usually the case, Rostov's thoughts during the first half of his journey, from Kremengchung to Kiev, were retrospective of matters connected with his squadron. But after he had passed the halfway, he began to forget about the Trioka of Rhones, his quartermaster, Dojeviak, and anxious questions began to arise in his mind as to what he should find at Otranoya. The nearer he came to his home, the more powerfully he was affected by his forebodings, as though this mental state were based upon the same law as that of the swiftness of falling bodies being according to the square of the distance. At Odrenoya station he gave the driver three rubles for vodka, and, all out of breath, rushed up the steps of the old home like a schoolboy. After the first enthusiastic greetings, and after that strange sense of vague disappointment at the reality falling short of expectation, everything is just the same. Why, then, have I hastened so? Nikolai began to become wanted to the old home life again. His father and mother were the same, except that they had grown a trifle older. He detected a peculiar restlessness about them, and sometimes a slight coldness between them, which was a new thing, and which Nikolai, as soon as he discovered it, attributed to the unfortunate condition of their affairs. Sonya was now about twenty years old. She had reached the zenith of her beauty, and gave no promise that she would ever surpass what she already was. Even thus, she was pretty enough. She simply breathed happiness and love from the moment that Nikolai came home, and this maiden's faithful, unfaltering love for him had a delightful effect upon him. Nikolai was more than all surprised at Petya and Natasha. Petya had grown into a tall, handsome, frolicsome, but still intelligent lad of thirteen, whose voice was already beginning to break. It was long before Nikolai could get over his amazement at Natasha, and he said, laughing, as he gazed at her, "'You're not at all the same person.' "'What? Have I changed for the worse?' "'Quite the contrary. But what dignity, princess,' said he in a whisper. Footnote. The point of this lies in his calling her Kinyaginya, the title of a married princess, as Kinyeshkna is that of an unmarried one. End of footnote. Yes, 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 exclaimed Natasha gleefully. Natasha told him her romance with Prince Andrei, and about his visit to Otranoya, and showed him her last letter from him. Tell me, are you not glad for me? she asked. I am so calm, so happy now. Yes, very glad, replied Nikolai. He is a splendid man. And are you very much in love with him? How can I tell you, replied Natasha. I was in love with Boris, and with my teacher, and with Denisov, and... But this is not at all the same. My mind is serene and decided. 
I know that there is not a better man to be found, and so I feel perfectly calm and happy. It is entirely different from what it used to be. Before. Nikolai expressed to Natasha his dissatisfaction that the wedding was to be postponed a year, but Natasha, with some show of exasperation, contending that it could not have been otherwise, that it would have been disgraceful to force her way into a family against his father's will, and that she herself had insisted upon it. "'You don't in the least, in the least, understand the necessities of the case,' said she. Nikolai said no more, and acquiesced. He often marveled as he looked at her. She was absolutely unlike a girl deeply in love and separated from her betrothed. Her temper was calm and even, and she was as merry as in days gone by. This was a surprise to Nikolai, and even made him look with some incredulity at her engagement with Bolkonsky. He could not make up his mind that her fate was as yet fully decided, the more from the fact that he had not seen Prince Andrei with her. It seemed to him all the time that there was something that was not as it should be in this proposed marriage. Why this postponement? Why are they not formally betrothed? he asked himself. Once, when speaking with his mother about his sister, he found to his surprise, and to a certain degree his satisfaction, that his mother also did not in the depths of her heart feel any great confidence in the engagement. This is what he writes, said she, showing her son a letter which she had received from Prince André, with that secret feeling of discontent which a mother always has toward her daughter's future married happiness. He writes that he will not be back before December. What do you suppose can detain him so? It must be he is ill. His health is very delicate. Do not say anything to Natasha. Don't be surprised that she is happy. These are the last days of her girlhood, and I know how it affects her whenever we get a letter from him. However, it is all in God's hands, and all will be well, she concluded, adding as usual, he is a splendid man. End of chapter 1 Part 4, Chapter 2 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 2 the first days after Nikolai's return, he was grave and even depressed. He was tormented by the present necessity of making an investigation into the stupid details of the household economy for which his mother had begged him to come home. On the third day after his return, in order to get this burden from his shoulders as soon as possible, he went, with contracted brows, sternly, and not giving himself time to decide what he was going to do, to the wing where Matenka lived, and demanded of him the accounts of everything. What he meant by the accounts of everything, he had even less of an idea than Matenka, who, nevertheless, was thrown into alarm and perplexity. Matenka's explanations about his accounts were soon finished. The starosta of the estate and the starosta of the commune, who were waiting in the anteroom, listened with terror and satisfaction at first, as the young count's voice began to grow fiercer and louder, while they could distinguish terrible words of abuse following one upon the other. "'You brigand!' you ungrateful wretch! I'll whip you like a dog! You're not dealing with my papenka this time! And words of the like import. Then these men, with no less satisfaction and terror, saw the young count, all flushed and with bloodshot eyes, dragging Matenka by the collar and reinforcing his efforts with very dexterous applications of his knees and feet whenever the pauses between the words gave him a convenient chance, while he cried at the top of his voice, Get out of here, you villain! Don't you ever show your face here again. Matenka flew down the six steps head first and landed in a bed of shrubbery. The shrubbery was a famous place of refuge for delinquents at Otranoya. Matenka himself, when he returned tipsy from town, was wont to hide in it, and many of the inhabitants of Otranoya, trying to get out of Matenka's way, knew the advantages of this place as a refuge. Matenka's wife and her sister, with terror-stricken faces, peered out of the door of the room, where the polished samovar was bubbling, and where the high-post bedstead affected by overseers could be seen, covered with a patchwork quilt. The young count, all out of breath, and giving them no attention, strode by them with resolute steps, and went into the house. The countess, who had heard from the maids all that had taken place in the wing, was, in one sense, delighted at the direction which their affairs were now evidently going to take, and in another she was disquieted at the way in which her son had taken hold of the matter. 
She went several times on tiptoe to his door, and listened as he smoked one pipe after another. The next day the old count called Nikolai to one side, and with a timid smile said, "'But do you know, my dear, you wasted your fire. Matenka has told me all about it.' I knew, thought Nikolai, that I should never accomplish anything here, in this idiotic world. You were angry with him because he did not reckon in those seven hundred roubles, but, do you know, they were carried over and you did not look on the other page. Papenka, he is a scoundrel and a thief. I know he is. And what I have done, I have done. But if you don't wish it, I won't say anything more to him about it. No, my dear, the Count was also confused. He was conscious that he himself had been a bad administrator of his wife's estate, and that he was guilty toward their children, but he did not know how to set things right. No, I, I beg of you, take charge of our affairs. I am old, I... No, Papenka, forgive me if I have done anything disagreeable to you. I am less able to attend to it than you are. The devil take these musics and accounts and carryings over, he said to himself. I used to know well enough what quarter stakes on a six at faro meant, but this carrying over to the next page, I don't know anything about it at all, said he to himself, and from that time forth he gave no more attention to their pecuniary affairs. Once, however, the countess called her son to her and told him that she had a note of hand given her by Anna Mikhailovna for two thousand roubles, and she asked Nikolai's advice as to what ought to be done about it. This is what I think, replied Nikolai. You have told me that I was to decide the question. Well, I don't like Anna Mikhailovna, and I don't like Boris, but they have been friends of ours and are poor. This is what we will do, then. And he took the note and tore it in two, and this action made the old countess actually sob with delight. After this, the young Rostov entirely forswore interference with their business matters, and entered with passionate enthusiasm into the delights of hunting with the hounds, for which the old count set him an example on a large scale. End of chapter 2 Part 4, Chapter 3 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 3 Already the wintry frosts had begun, each morning, to chain up the soil, soaked by the autumnal rains. Already there was green only in patches, and these made a vivid contrast against the strips of brownish stubble fields trodden down by the cattle, and the patches of winter and spring wheat, or the russet lines of the buckwheat fields. The forest treetops, which even as early as the end of August had been green islands amid the black fields of winter wheat and the corn stubble, were now gold and crimson islands amid the fields of bright green wheat. The gray hair, had already more than half changed his coat. The foxes were beginning to quit their holes, and young wolves were larger than dogs. It was the very height of the hunting season. The hounds belonging to that eager young huntsman, Rostov, were now in excellent training for their work, but they had been taken out so assiduously that, by the general advice of the whippers in, it had been decided to give them three days' rest, and to set upon the 28th of September for the hunt, at which time they would begin with a certain dense forest where there was a litter of young wolves. Such was the state of affairs on the 26th of September. All that day the hunting train was at home. It had been bitter cold, but toward evening it grew warmer and began to thaw. On the morning of the 27th, when young Rostov went in his dressing gown to his window, he looked out upon a morning which could not have been better for hunting. The very sky seemed to be melting and flooding out over the earth. There was no sign of a breeze. The only motion in the air was that faint stir of microscopic drops of mist or fog falling from above. On the bare limbs of the park trees, transparent drops hung and fell on the leaves that carpeted the ground. The garden soil had a peculiar black and glistening appearance, like poppy, and within a short distance lost itself under the dim and moist curtain of fog. Nikolai stepped out upon the wet doorsteps, all covered with mud. There was an odor of dying forest vegetation and of dogs. Milka, the black-spotted bitch, with broad hindquarters and big black Google eyes, got up when she saw her master, stretched herself back, and lay down like a hare, then unexpectedly leaped up and licked his face and ears. Another dog, a greyhound, 
seeing his master, came bounding up the garden path, arching his back, and impetuously raising his helm, that is, his tail, began to rub around Nikolai's legs. Oh, hoy! rang out at this moment that inimitable huntsman's call, which comprises in itself the deepest bass and the clearest tenor, and around the corner appeared the whipper in and hunter, Danilo, a grizzled, wrinkled man, with his hair cropped, leaving a knob after the fashion of the Ukraina, and carrying a long whip with curling lash. He had that independent expression and scorn for all the world so characteristic of huntsmen. He took off his Circassian cap in his baron's presence and looked at him scornfully. This expression of scorn was not meant to be insulting to the baron. Nikolai knew that, scornful and superior as this Danello seemed to be, he was, nevertheless, his devoted servant and huntsman. Danella, said Nikolai, with a timid consciousness that in this perfect hunting weather, with these dogs and this huntsman, he was seized by that indefinable passion for hunting which makes a man forget all his former good resolutions like a fond lover in the presence of his mistress. "'What do you please to require, your illustriousness?' asked a deep, antiphonal bass, hoarse with shouting at the hounds, and two bright, black eyes gazed out from under the brows at the silent baron. "'Well, and can't you resist?' these two eyes seemed to be asking. "'A fine day, isn't it? A chase and a race, eh?' asked Nikolai, pulling Milka's ears. Danilo said nothing and winked his eyes. "'I sent Uvarka out at sunrise this morning to listen,' said his deep bass, after a minute's pause. "'He says she's drawn into the Otraneski Zakas, and they're howling there. He meant that a she-wolf, which they both knew about, had gone with her whelps into the Otraneski forest preserves, which was a small detached property about two versts from the house. "'Well, we must go after them, mustn't we?' said Nikolai. "'Come with Uvarka, will you?' just as you order. See, they are fed, then. All right. In five minutes, Danella and Uvarko were standing in Nikolai's great library. Though Danello was not very tall, the sight of him in the room irresistibly made one think of a horse, or a bear, surrounded by furniture, and the conditions of civilized life. Danilo was himself conscious of this, and, according to his habit, stood as near the door as possible, striving to talk in an unnaturally low tone, and to keep from moving, lest he should break something, and saying what he had to say as rapidly as possible, so as to get out into the open air, under the sky, instead of the ceiling. Having asked the requisite number of questions, and elicited from Danilo, who was fully as anxious himself to go, the information that it would not hurt the dogs any, Nikolai ordered the horses to be saddled. But just as Danilo was on the point of leaving the room, Natasha came hurrying in with swift steps, and not having stopped to do up her hair, or finished dressing, but wearing her nurse's shawl. Petya came running in with her. "'Are you going?' asked Natasha. "'I thought so. Sonya declared that you were not going. I knew that today was such a perfect day that you would have to go.' "'Yes, we're going,' curtly replied Nikolai, who, as he intended to make a serious business of hunting that day, had no wish to take Natasha and Petya. "'We are going, but after wolves only. It won't amuse you.' "'You know that is just what I like best of anything,' said Natasha. "'It's too bad to be going yourself, and have the horses saddled, and never say a word to us.' "'Vain are obstacles to Russians. Come on,' cried Petya. "'Yes, but you can't go. Mamenka told you that was out of the question,' said Nikolai, turning to Natasha. "'Yes, I am going. I certainly am going,' insisted Natasha firmly. "'Danila, have the saddles put on for us.' and have Michaela bring around my leash, said she, addressing the whipper in. It had been trying and uncomfortable for Danilo to be in the confinement of the room, but to receive an order from the young lady seemed incredible. He cast down his eyes and made haste to go, pretending that it did not concern him, and striving not to strike against her in any way. End of chapter 3《Part Four, Chapter Four of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Four. The old count, who had always kept up an immense hunting establishment, had turned it over to his son's management, 
but on this day the twenty seventh of september feeling particularly cheerful he determined to be of the party in two hours the whole hunt was gathered at the front doorsteps nikolai with a grave and solemn face which made it evident that he could not be distracted by trifles walked right by natasha and petya without heeding what they said to him he personally inspected everything sent forward the pack with the huntsmen mounted his sorrel donuts and whistling to the dogs of his own leash he started off through the threshing floor into the field that stretched out toward the otranetsky preserves the old count's steed a dun-coloured gelding named vifyanka was in charge of the count's groom he himself was to ride in his drosky straight to the muset which he had designated the whole number of hounds brought together was fifty-four together with six whippers in and feeders beside the gentlemen there were also eight greyhound grooms followed by more than two score greyhounds so that with the master's dogs in leash they were all told about one hundred and thirty dogs and twenty mounted huntsmen each dog knew who his master was and answered to his call each man knew his duty his place and his work as soon as they had ridden beyond the hedge all without unnecessary noise or talking galloped smoothly and evenly along the road and then struck into the fields that led to the otranetsky preserves as soon as the horses were out of the beaten track they made their way across the field as though it were a carpet of yielding grass occasionally splashing through pools of water the misty sky continued the same and the moisture fell monotonously to the ground the air was calm mild unresonant occasionally were heard a huntsman's whistle the snorting of a horse the crack of the long lash and the whine of a dog crouching down in his place after they had ridden about a verst suddenly out of the fog loomed five more riders with dogs coming to meet the rostovs in front of them rode a hale and hearty old man with the heavy grey mustachios good morning little uncle cried nikolai as the old man rode up to him here's a howdy do i was sure of it said the old man he was a neighbor and distant relative of the rostovs a landed proprietor of small means i knew it you could not resist it and it's good you've come here's a howdy do this was a favorite phrase of the old man's look out for the cover double quick for my girchik reports that the illigans and all their train are at korniki and they might here's a howdy do might snatch the litter away from under our very noses that's where i am going say shall we join packs asked nikolai they united all the hounds into one large pack and the old man whom nikolai called little uncle rode along by his side natasha muffled up in shawls out of which peered her eager face with bright glistening eyes galloped up to them followed by petya and mikhailo the huntsmen who were her inseparable companions and by a groom who was delighted to attend her petya was full of glee and kept whipping up and hauling in his horse natasha sat firmly and gracefully on her raven black arabchik and reined him in with a practised hand though without force the little uncle looked disapprovingly at petya and natasha he did not believe in combining frivolities with the serious business of hunting good morning little uncle we are going too shouted petya good morning to you good morning don't ride the dogs down cried the old man severely nikolenka what a splendid dog trunili is he knew me said natasha pointing to her favorite greyhound trunila in the first place is not a dog but a hound mused nikolai and gave his sister a stern glance trying to make her realize the immense distance that separated them at that moment natasha realized it don't you imagine little uncle that we shall be in any one's way said natasha we will stay in our own places and not stir an excellent idea little countess said the little uncle but mind you don't fall off your horse he added for you see here's a howdy do you've nothing to hold on by the island of the otradnetsky preserve was now in sight two or three hundred yards distance and the cavalcade rode up toward it rostof and the little uncle having definitely decided where they should set in the hounds and shown natasha her post a place where there was not the slightest chance of anything ever passing crossed through the ravine into the woods well little nephew stand on solid ground said the little uncle take care not to let her get by that depends replied rostof 
Poot! Karai! he cried, by this call answering the old man's words. Karai was an aged, deformed, ugly-faced hound, famous for having once tackled by himself a she-wolf. All got to their posts. The old count, knowing his son's passionate zeal for hunting, had made good time so as not to be behindhand, and the cavalcade had scarcely reached the preserve when Ilya Andreyevich, cheerful and ruddy, with shaking cheeks, came jolting across the fields behind his three black horses and was set down at the muset which he had selected. Smoothing out his fur shuba and getting his hunting equipment, he mounted his glossy vifyanka, fat, kind, and steady, and gray as himself. The horses and the drosky were sent home. Count Ilya Andreyitch, although not a keen huntsman at heart, nevertheless was well acquainted with the rules of venery, and he rode off to the edge of the forest, gathered up his reins, settled himself in the saddle, and, feeling conscious that he was all ready, glanced around with a smile. Near him stood his valet, an old-fashioned but heavy rider, Semyon Chekmar. Chekmar held in leash three fierce-looking wolfhounds, not less fat and sleek than master and horse. Two dogs, old and intelligent enough to be out of leash, stretched themselves out on the ground. A hundred paces farther along the edge of the forest was stationed the Count's second whipper in, Mitka, a splendid rider and passionate huntsman. The Count, in accordance with time-honored custom before the hunt began, drank a silver cup full of root brandy, took a snack of lunch, and then drank a half-bottle of his favorite Bordeaux. Ilya Andreyitch was a trifle flushed from the wine and the ride. His eyes grew moist, and had a peculiar gleam, and as he sat in his saddle, muffled in his shuba, he had the aspect of a child who has been got ready for a ride. The lean Chekmar, with sunken cheeks, having got things settled to his satisfaction, looked up at his baron, whose inseparable companion he had been for upwards of thirty years, and perceiving that he was in good humor, waited for some pleasant talk. Just then a third person rode up cautiously, evidently the result of careful training, and, coming out from behind the woods, paused not far from the Count. This individual was an old man, with a grey beard, in a woman's capote and high collar. This was the buffoon who wore the woman's name, Natasha Ivanovna. "'Well, Natasha Ivanovna,' said the old Count to him in a whisper, and giving him a wink, "'if you should dare to scare away the brute Danila will give it to you. I can defend myself, said Natasha Ivanovna. Shh, 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 hissed the Count, and, turning to Semyon, he asked, Have you seen Natalia Ilyanichna? Where is she? She and Peter Ilyich were stationed in the high grass, near Zorovo, replied Semyon, with a smile. She's a lady, but she's going to have a great hunt all the same. And aren't you surprised, Semyon, to see how she rides, eh? asked the Count. She rides as well as a man. Of course, I'm surprised. Such daring, such skill. And where is Nikolashka? On Lyadovo Hill, I suppose, asked the Count, in a whisper. That's where he is. He knows well enough where the best places are. And he rides so cleverly, too. Danila and I were thunderstruck at him the other day, replied Semyon, knowing what would please the Count. He rides well, does he, eh? "'Fine fellow on a horse, is he? Eh? "'Like a picture. "'How he run that fox t'other day out of the steppe at Zavazino. "'How he did gallop out of the woods. "'Twas a caution. "'Horse worth a thousand, but the rider beyond price. "'Twould be a hard job to find such another young fellow.' "'It would indeed,' interposed the Count, "'regretting that Semyon did not spin his story out longer. "'Twould be a hard job, would it?' turning back the flap of his shubka and searching for his snuff-box. Then the other day, coming out of mass in all his regalia, when Mikhail to Sudoruich, but Semyon did not conclude his sentence, having distinctly heard, owing to the stillness of the atmosphere, the howling of a hound or two, signifying that the hunt was on. He bent down his head and listened and gave a warning gesture to his baron. They are after the whelps, he whispered. They are making straight for Ledovskaya. The Count, with a smile still lingering on his lips, gazed into the distance, along the dike, and held the snuff-box in his hand, forgetting to take a pinch. Instantly, following the baying of the hounds, came the signal that the wolf was found, sounded on Danello's heavy horn. 
Then the pack united their voices with those of the first three hounds, and then they could hear the hounds breaking in across the ravine, with that peculiar howl which is the sign to the huntsman that they have discovered the wolf. The riders had not yet begun to egg on the dogs, but were uttering the ululu, and louder than all rang out Danilo's voice, now in bass, now in piercing shrill notes. It seemed as though his voice filled the whole forest, and burst out beyond the forest bounds, and rang far over the fields. After listening for a number of seconds in silence, the Count and his groom were convinced that the hunt had divided into two packs. The larger half, vehemently giving tongue, were driving farther afield. The other pack were rushing along the forest, past the Count, while behind them was heard Danello's Yuliuyu. The sounds mingled and melted together, but seemed to be growing fainter in the distance. Semyon sighed, and stooped down to disentangle his leash, a young puppy having got the cords mixed up. The Count also sighed, and noticing that he had his snuff-box still in his hand, opened it and took out a pinch of snuff. "'Back!' cried Semyon to the young hound, who was trying to make for the woods. The Count was startled, and dropped his snuff-box. Natasha Ivanovna dismounted, and was just on the point of picking it up. The Count and Semyon were looking at him. Suddenly, as often happens, the sounds of the hunt came nearer, and it seemed as though the baying mouths of the dogs and Danello's Yuluyu were directly upon them. The Count looked round, and at his right saw Mitka, who with starting eyes was staring at him, and, lifting his cap, directed his attention in front of him to the other side. "'Look out!' he shouted, in such a voice that it was evident that this word had been for some time painfully struggling to escape. And, letting loose his leash, he dashed in the Count's direction. The Count and Semyon sprang out from the cover, and saw at their left a wolf swinging easily along, with a noiseless lope, making for the very cover where they had been in hiding. The ferocious dogs yelped, and tearing themselves free from the leash, flung themselves after the wolf, almost under the legs of the horses. The wolf paused in his course, awkwardly, like one suffering with the quinsy, turned his head, with its wide forehead, in the direction of the dogs, and then again, with the same easy, waddling gait, gave one spring, and then another, and shaking his stump, tail, disappeared in the cover. At the same instant, with a roar that rather resembled a whine, from the opposite edge of the forest, appeared first one, then a second, then a third hound, and then the whole pack came pouring out into the field in the very track by which the wolf had sneaked away and escaped. On the heels of the hounds appeared Danello's horse, all black with sweat, breaking through the hazel bushes. Over his long back, bending forward and doubled up like a ball, sat Danilo, hatless, with his grey hair dishevelled and falling around his sweaty face. Uliuliuliu, Uliuliu, he was shouting. When he saw the Count, his eyes flashed fire. Yush, he began, menacing the Count with his upraised whip handle. You've lost that wolf. What hunters! And, as though scorning to have further conversation with the confused and startled Count, he gave the wet flank of his chestnut stallion the wrathful blow which had been directed against the Count, and dashed after the hounds. The Count, like one who had been chastened, remained motionless, and looking around with a scared smile, was going to try to gather sympathy for his situation from Semyon. But Semyon had disappeared. He was riding in and out of the bushes, trying to start up the wolf from the thicket. The masters of the greyhounds were also beating up the brute from all sides. But the wolf had made his way into the bushes, and not a single hunter got sight of him. End of chapter 4Part 4, Chapter 5 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 5. Nikolai Rostov, meantime, had not left his post, and was anxiously expecting the brute. By the near and more distant sounds of the hunt, by the baying of the hounds, whose voices he could distinguish, by the shouts of the whippers in, advancing and retreating, he had an idea of what was going on in the island. He knew that the island sheltered growing and full-grown wolves, that is, old wolves and their whelps. He knew that the hounds had divided into two packs, that in one place they were on the right scent, 
and that elsewhere they had met with bad luck. He expected each second to see the beast making in his direction. He made a thousand different conjectures as to which side the brute would come out, and how he should attack him. His heart was filled with mingled hope and despair. Several times he offered up a prayer to God that the wolf might come in his way. He prayed with that sense of passionate anxiety with which men are wont to pray under the influence of some powerful excitement, even though it may be due to the most trivial cause. Now what would it be to thee, he said in his prayer, to do this for me? I know that thou art mighty, and that it is a sin to ask thee for such a thing, but for God's sake, let an old full-grown wolf come my way, and let Karai get a death-clutch on her throat in sight of the little uncle who keeps glancing over in this direction. A thousand times during that half-hour Rostov swept his eyes eagerly, restlessly, and with stubborn purpose around that thicket of forest where two mighty oaks looked down upon the aspen underbrush, and at the ravine with its gullied banks, and at the little uncle's cap just visible underneath the bushes on the right. No, I shan't have this luck, thought Rostov. But how jolly it would be! No hope. Always the same bad luck with me at cards, and in war, and everywhere. Austerlitz and Dolokhov, in vivid but swift alternation, flashed through his mind. If I could only just once in my life run down a full-grown wolf, that is all that I would ask for, he said to himself, straining his ears and his eyes as his gaze swept the thicket from right to left, and as he tried to distinguish the slightest variation in the noise of the hunt. Then again he glanced to the right and beheld something swiftly moving across the open field in his direction. No, it is impossible, thought Rostov with a heavy sigh, as a man sighs when what he has been long looking forward to is practically accomplished. And here the greatest piece of good fortune was accomplishing so simple, so noiselessly, so undemonstratively, without a sign. Rostov could not believe his eyes, and this incredulity lasted more than a second. The wolf came running forward and leaped clumsily over the ravine that lay across his path. It was an aged brute, with a grey back and a clearly marked russet belly. He ran along at no great speed, evidently convinced that no one could see him. Rostov, not daring to breathe, glanced at his dogs. They were lying down or standing up all around, but had not yet discovered the wolf or realized what was going on. Old Karai, bending his head back and showing his yellow teeth, occasionally snapping them together, was making a spiteful search for a flea on his haunch. Uliu, liu, liu, whispered Rostov, thrusting out his lips. The dogs, shaking their chains and pricking up their ears, sprang to their feet. Karai ceased his flea hunting and got up, cocking his ears and slightly wagging his tail, on which still hung a few shreds of hair. Shall I let him loose yet, or not? queried Rostov, while the wolf was making in his direction, and steadily increasing his distance from the woods. Suddenly the wolf's whole appearance underwent a change. A thrill ran over him at the sight of what he had never probably experienced before, a pair of human eyes fixed upon him, and, slightly raising his head toward the huntsman, he paused. Back or forward? Eh? It's all the same. Forward. We'll see, he seemed to say to himself, and without looking around he dashed ahead, with occasional leaps, easy and long, but decided. Uliuliu, cried Nikolai, in a voice that sounded not his own. His good steed, of her own accord, bore him forward down the slope, leaping the ravine, to cut off the wolf, and still swifter, entirely outstripping her, rushed the hounds. Nikolai did not hear his own shout, was not conscious of the pace at which he was riding, saw neither the dogs nor the ground over which he was carried, saw only the wolf, which, quickening his speed, bounded on without swerving in the direction of the ravine. The black-spotted, wide-haunched Milka was the first to get close to the wild beast. Nearer, nearer, she seemed to press. There, she leaps upon him. But the wolf swerved a trifle toward her, and instead of attacking, as was usually the case with her, Milka suddenly, raising her tail, came to a point. Uliuliuliuliu, cried Nikolai. The red Luibem leaped beyond Milka, impetuously flung himself on the wolf, and gripped him by the haunch, but, at the same instant, overcome by panic, he sprang to one side. The wolf crouched down, 
clapping his teeth together, then sprang up again and bounded forward, followed at an ashen's distance by all the hounds, though they avoided getting closer. "'He'll escape! No, that's impossible!' mused Nikolai, continuing to shout in a hoarse voice. "'Karai! Uliuliu!' he screamed, trying to make out where the old wolfhound was. He now was his only reliance. Karai, with all the strength left him by his advanced age, bounding forward, looking at the wolf from the corner of his eyes, was running heavily side by side with the brute, trying to get in front of him. But, owing to the swiftness of the wolf and the comparative slowness of the hound, it was evident that Karai's calculation was to be mistaken. Nikolai now began to see the forest in front of him, which, if the wolf succeeded in reaching it, would probably prove his safety. Just then, in front of them, a pack of dogs and a huntsman came in sight, dashing almost directly toward him. Here again was a hope. A dark brown young dog, with a long body, belonging to a kennel unknown to Rostov, was flying eagerly forward, directly toward the wolf, and quite upset him. The wolf swiftly and most unexpectedly sprang up and threw himself upon the dark brown hound, chattered his teeth, and the hound, covered with blood, from a great gash in his side, with a pitiful howl, beat his head on the ground. Karyushka, oh heavens, mourned Nikolai. The old hound, with the tufts of hair flying out from his haunches, had taken advantage of the pause that had been made to block the wolf's path, and was now within five paces of him. The wolf, apparently conscious of the peril, looked out of the corner of his eye at Karai, put his stump of a tail as far as possible under his legs, and went off at a mighty bound. But at this instant, Nikolai simply saw that something extraordinary happened to the dog. Karai, quick as a flash, was on the wolf's back, and the two were rolling heels over head down into the ravine in front of them. The moment that Nikolai caught sight of the dog and the wolf rolling at the bottom of the ravine, in one indiscriminate mass, out of which could be resolved the wolf's gray hide, his hind legs stretched out, and his face scarred and panting, with laid-back ears, Karai still held him by the gorge. The minute that Nikolai saw this was the happiest moment of his whole life. He was just grasping the saddle-bow to dismount and give the wolf his finishing stroke, when suddenly, from out of that mass of dogs, the brute's head was extended, then his forepaws were laid on the edge of the ravine. The wolf chattered his teeth. Karai had now let go of his gullet, gave a mighty leap with his hind legs, and, flirting his tail, again got his distance from the dogs, and was off at full speed. Karai, with bristling hair, apparently either bruised or wounded, crawled painfully out of the ravine. "'My God, what does it mean?' cried Nikolai, in despair. The little uncle's whipper in started from the other side to cut off the wolf's course, and his dogs again brought the wolf to bay. Again they gathered round him. Nikolai, his whipper in, the little uncle, and his huntsman circled around the wolf, crying their uliuliu and screaming to the dogs, at each minute, whenever the wolf sat up on his haunches, expecting to dismount, and each time dashing forward, whenever the wolf shook himself free and tried to dash toward the thicket, which was his only salvation. At the very beginning of this wolf-baiting scene, Danilo, hearing the hunter's uliuliu, came galloping along the edge of the forest. He got there in time to see Karai grapple with the wolf, and he pulled in his horse, expecting to see that the game was finished. But when the huntsman did not dismount, and the wolf shook himself and made off, Danilo spurred on his chestnut, not indeed at the wolf, but in a straight line toward the thicket, in the same way as Karai had done, so as to intercept the beast. Danilo galloped forward silently, holding an unsheathed dagger in his left hand, and like a flail, fell the strokes of his whip on his chestnut's laboring sides. Nikolai had not seen or heard Danilo until his heavy panting steed dashed by, and then he heard the sound of a falling body, and saw that Danilo had flung himself into the midst of the dogs, back of the wolf, and was trying to clutch him by the ears. It was manifest now for the dogs, and for the huntsmen, and for the wolf, even, that all was over. The wild beast, timidly laying back his ears, was struggling to gather himself up once more, but the dogs formed a ring round him. Danilo, reaching forward, made a staggering step, and with all his weight threw himself upon the wolf, as though he were lying down to rest, and seized him by the ears. Nikolai was going to stab him, but Danilo muttered, "'Don't do it. We'll gag him.' 
and changing his position, he placed his foot on the wolf's neck. Then they put a stake into the wolf's jaws, fastened him as though they were getting him into a leash, tied his legs, and Danilo twice rolled the brute over and over. With weary but happy faces, they lifted the live, full-grown wolf on the shying and whinnying horse, and accompanied by the dogs, all yelping at him, they took him to the place of general rendezvous. All came together and began to examine the wolf, which, with his great broad-browed head hanging down with a stake in his chops, glared from his great glassy eyes at all the throng of dogs and men surrounding him. When he was touched, he would draw together his helpless paws and glare fiercely and at the same time steadily at them all. Count Ilya Andreyitch also came riding up and had a look at the wolf. "'Oh, rather an old one,' said he. "'Full-grown, eh?' he asked Danilo, who stood near him. "'Indeed he is, your illustriousness,' replied Danilo, respectfully taking off his cap. The Count remembered the wolf which had got past him and his encounter with Danilo. "'Still, my boy, you were in a bad temper,' said the Count. Danilo made no reply and merely smiled with embarrassment, a childishly sweet and pleasant smile. End of chapter 5「Part Four, Chapter Six of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Six. The old count rode off. Natasha and Petya promised to follow immediately. The hunt went farther, as it was still early in the day. Toward noon, they sent the hounds into a dell, grown up with a dense young forest. Nikolai, taking his position on the hillside, could overlook all his huntsmen. On the other side from Nikolai were fields, and there his whipper inn had taken his post alone, in a pit behind a hazel copse. As soon as the dogs were slipped, Nikolai heard the sharp yelp of one of his favorite dogs, Volthorn. The other hounds also gave tongue, now ceasing and then again taking up the cry. In a minute, from the forest, the cry to Fox was heard, and the whole pack rushed off pell-mell towards the open, in the direction of the field, and away from Nikolai. He saw the dog-feeders, in their red caps, dashing off along the edge of the overgrown dell. He saw also the dogs, and every instant he expected the fox to show himself in that direction on the field. The huntsman stationed in the pit gave a start, and let loose the dogs, and then Nikolai saw a strange-looking red fox crouching down, and hurriedly making across the field with rumpled brush. The dogs began to close in on her. Then, as soon as they came close to her, lo, the fox began to dodge about among them, in circular wise, making the circles ever shorter and shorter, and sweeping her furry brush, which the hunters called turba, a trumpet, around her. And then, lo, one, a white dog, flies at her, and this one is followed by a black dog, and then all is mingled in confusion, and the dogs, as they stand, scarcely swerving, make a sort of star, all their tails pointed outwards. A couple of huntsmen gallop up toward the dogs, one in a red cap, the other a stranger in a green caftan. "'What can that mean?' queried Nikolai. "'Where did the huntsmen come from? It's not one of little uncles.' The men dispatched the fox, and stood for a long time, without mounting or tying her to the straps. Nearby, with projecting saddles, stood their horses, which they held by the bridle, and the dogs threw themselves down. The huntsmen were gesticulating and disputing over the fox. Then there rang out the sound of a bugle, the conventional signal of a dispute. "'That's one of Alagin's hunters, and he's quarreling with our Ivan about something,' said Nikolai's whipper in. Nikolai sent the man to fetch his sister and Petya, and they rode slowly at a foot-pace to the place where the dog-feeders had collected the hounds. Several huntsmen were galloping up to the scene of the dispute. Nikolai dismounted and stood near the hounds with Natasha and Petya, who had now come up, and waited till word should be brought as to the issue of the dispute. From out behind the skirt of the forest came the quarrelsome huntsman, with the fox at his saddle-straps, and galloped up to his young baron. While still at a distance, he took off his cap and tried to speak respectfully, but he was pale and out of breath, and his face was distorted with rage. One of his eyes was blacked, but he was apparently unconscious of the fact. "'What was the matter with you there?' asked Nikolai. 
What do you suppose? He would be after snatching it away from among our hounds. And it was my mouse-colored bitch, too, that had grabbed her. Come now, decide. He tried to get away our fox. Now I'll have a whack at his foxes. Here she is, on the saddle-straps. Or would you like a taste of this? Pointing to his dagger, and evidently imagining that he was still talking with his enemy. Nikolai, not stopping to discuss the matter with the huntsman, told his sister and Petya to wait for him, and rode off to the place where the rival hunt of the Elegans was collected. The victorious huntsman joined the throng of whippers in, and there, surrounded by his sympathetic admirers, he related his exploit. The truth of the matter was that Elegan, with whom the Rostovs had, in days gone by, had some disputes, as well as lawsuits, was hunting in places usually preempted by the Rostovs, and, on this occasion, he had apparently given special orders to go to the island where the Rostovs were hunting, and allowed his whippers in to snatch the game from his rival's dog. Nikolai had never seen Elegan, but, as was always the case, knowing no halfway in his judgments and feelings, and believing certain reports of the violence and arbitrary conduct of this proprietor, he hated him with all his heart, and considered him his worst enemy. He now rode up to him, full of angry emotions, and firmly grasping his long whip, ready for the most decisive and risky proceedings against his enemy. He had just ridden up, to a jut of the forest, when he saw riding in his direction a portly gentleman, in a beaver cap, on a handsome raven-black steed, and accompanied by two huntsmen. Instead of an enemy, Nikolai found Elegan a well-bred representative baron, who manifested a special desire to make the young count's acquaintance. Riding up to Rostov, Elegan raised his beaver cap, and declared that he was very sorry for what had taken place, that he had commanded the huntsman who had permitted himself to trespass on another's preserve to be punished. He craved the count's acquiescence, and invited him to hunt on his grounds. Natasha, apprehensive lest her brother might do something terrible, came up with great anxiety, and drew up at a little distance behind him. When she saw that the rivals were greeting each other with friendly courtesy, she joined them. Alagan lifted his beaver cap still higher as he saw Natasha, and with a pleasant smile said that the countess resembled Diana, both by her passion for hunting and by her beauty, of which he had heard many reports. Alagan, in order to smooth over his huntsman's indiscretion, pressingly urged Rostov to go to a steep hillside of his about a verst away, which he kept for his own private use, and which, on his word, was swarming with hares. Nikolai consented, and the hunting party, doubled in numbers, swept on their way. In order to reach Elegan's preserve, they had to strike across country. The huntsmen made common cause. The gentlemen rode together. The little uncle, Rostov, Elegan, each stealthily examined the dogs of the other, striving not to let the others remark it, and anxiously search for possible rivals among the dogs of the others. Rostov was especially struck by the beauty of a small, thoroughbred young slut, spotted with red and rather slender, with muscles like steel, with a delicate little muzzle and with prominent black eyes. She belonged to Lagan's pack. He had heard of the rarity of Lagan's dogs, and in this pretty little dog he recognized a rival to his Milka, in the midst of a sedate conversation about the crops of the current year, which Lagan had started, Nikolai called his attention to this little spotted slut. "'That's a lovely little slut you have,' he said in a careless tone. "'Full of metal?' "'That one? Yes, that's one good dog. She's a hunter,' replied Lagan, speaking with affected indifference of his red-spotted Yorza, for which he had paid a neighbor, the year before, three families of household serfs. "'You didn't have much of a yield of grain either, did you?' he asked, resuming the conversation that he had begun, and then, considering it no more than fair to mollify the young count, in the same way Elegan looked at his dogs, and picking out Milka, whose breath of beam first attracted his attention, he asked, "'That black-spotted slut of yours is a handsome one, too. Well worth having,' said he. "'Yes, pretty good, full of go,' replied Nikolai. If only an old gray hare would start across that field, I would show you what kind of a dog she is, he thought, and, turning to one of his huntsmen, he said he would give a rouble if he would find a hare, on his form, that is, hiding in his nest. I cannot understand, pursued Elegan, how it is that other sportsmen can be jealous of other men's game and dogs. I will tell you how it is with me, Count. I enjoy going out to hunt, 
you see you are apt to fall in with pleasant company like this for what could be better he took off his beaver cap again to natasha but as for merely counting the pelts that's a matter of indifference to me that's a fact or why should it trouble me that some other dog and not mine got on the scent first i get just as much sport from looking on at the course don't you count so i judge just at this time was heard the long halloo a tu yavoua from one of the greyhound keepers who had been set on the watch he was standing halfway down the slope on a hillock with his whip upraised and again he uttered the long drawn a tu you voi this halloo and the upraised whipstock signaled that he had caught sight of a crouching hare on the scent i imagine said elegan carelessly what say you count shall we give him a run yes we must be after him certainly all together shall we not replied nikolai glancing at yorza and the little uncle's red rugai the two rivals against which he had never as yet had a chance to pit his own dogs now what if they get my milka by the ears he thought to himself as side by side with the little uncle and elegan he galloped off toward the hare a full-grown fellow isn't he asked elegan as they came up to the hunter who had discovered him and not without anxiety whistling to his yorza and you mikhail nikonovitch he asked turning to the little uncle the little uncle came up with a frown why should i meddle it's your game here's a howdy do why your dogs cost a whole village thousand rouble dogs you two match yours and i will look on rugai na na he cried rugaiushka he added involuntarily expressing by this endearing diminutive the hope that he placed upon his red hound natasha could see and feel the excitement which these two old men and her brother tried vainly to conceal and she herself was even more excited the hunter on the hillock still stood with upraised whipstock the gentleman approached him at a footpace the harriers coming up to the same horizon dashed off in the direction of the hare the hunters but not the gentleman also hastened after them the whole movement was made slowly and in due form which way is he heading asked nikolai coming within a hundred paces of the hunter who had discovered him but the beater had no time to reply ere the grey hare scenting the frost of the morning to come was up and out the harriers still in leash dashed with a howl down the slope after the hare from all sides the greyhounds unleashed dashed after the harriers and the hare all these slowly stirring hunting attendants shouted stoy stay to keep the dogs on the right scent and the greyhound keepers crying a tu to urge them on swept across the field elegan with perfect coolness nikolai natasha and the little uncle flew along not heeding how or whither they were going with only the dogs and the hare in their eyes and fearing only lest they should for a single instant lose the course of the hunt from sight the hare proved to be full grown and full of game after springing out he did not on the instant dash away but cocked up his ears listening to the shouts of the men and the trampling of the horses suddenly closing in upon him from all sides he made a dozen springs in no great haste letting the hounds come quite close to him and then finally having chosen his course and realized his danger he laid back his ears and was off like the wind his form had been in the stubble but the course he took was toward the meadowlands where it was marshy two dogs answering to the hunter who had discovered him were the first to see the hare and lay for him but they were still a considerable distance behind when elegan's red-spotted yorza outstripped them came within a dog's length of him sprang upon him with frightful violence snapped at the hare's tail and supposing that she had him rolled over and over the hare arching his back darted off at a sharper pace than ever then the black-spotted milka broad of beam dashed in front of yorza and began swiftly to gain on the hare Malushka, matushka little mother rang out nikolai's encouraging shout it seemed as though milka were just going to overtake and nip the hare but she went too far and went beyond the hare had stopped short again the pretty yorza came to the fore and seemed to hang over the hare's very tail as though she were measuring the distance so as not to be deceived again before she should seize him by the hind leg yorzenka sweet little sister rang out elegan's voice unnaturally as though choked with tears 
Yorza heeded not his prayer. At the very instant that she might have expected to seize her game, he swerved off, and bowled away along the ridge between the meadow and the stubble. Again Yorza and Milka, like two little pole horses, dashed off neck and neck after the game, but this middle ground was better running for the hare, and the dogs did not gain on him so rapidly. Rugai, Rugaishka, here's a howdy do, cried still a third voice at this instant, and Rugai, the little uncle's red, crook backed hound, stretching out and doubling up his back, was seen catching up with the two other hounds, dashing beyond them, and falling with terrible effort of self denial on the hare itself. He flung him from the middle ground into the meadow leaped upon him even more fiercely a second time in the muddy marsh into which he sank up to his knees and then all that could be seen was that he rolled over and over with the hair the mud staining his back the star of dogs clustered round them in a minute the party gathered in a circle around the clustering dogs the little uncle radiantly happy alone dismounted and cut off the hare's hind foot shaking the hair so that the blood would drip off he looked around excitedly with wandering eyes, unable to keep his feet and hands quiet, and spoke not knowing what he said or whom he addressed. "'That's the kind of a howdy-do. That's a dog for you. Worth all your thousand-ruble hounds. Here's a howdy-do,' he said, all out of breath, and fiercely glancing around, as though he were berating someone, as though all of them were his foes, and all had insulted him, and now, at last, he had come to his chance for getting even with them." "'Look at your thousand-ruble dogs. "'Here, Rugai, here's the foot,' he cried, "'flinging him the hare's paw, "'with the mud still clinging to it. "'You've earned it. "'Here's a howdy-do.' "'She'd run herself all out. "'She'd cornered him thrice all by herself,' said Nikolai, "'likewise not heeding anyone "'and not minding whether anyone listened to him or not. "'That was a great way. "'He seized him by the back,' exclaimed Elegan's groom. "'Yes,' "'When she's run him out, of course any house-dog could grip him,' said Elegan at the same instant. He was flushed, and what with the mad gallop and the excitement could scarcely draw his breath. Natasha, so great was her excitement and enthusiasm, also was screaming at the top of her lungs, and so shrilly that it made one's ears tingle. With these shrieks of delight she expressed what all the other sportsmen were expressing by their simultaneous exclamations— and these shrieks were so odd that she would have been constrained to feel ashamed of herself, and all the others would have been amazed at it, if it had been at another time. The little uncle himself doubled up the hare cleverly, and boldly laid him over the cropper of his horse, as though by this action he were defying them all, and mounted his fallow bay, and rode away, acting as though he had no wish to speak to any one. All the rest, melancholy and disconsolate, separated, and it was only after some time had elapsed that they had recovered their former state of affected indifference. For some time still they gazed after the red, humped-backed Rugai, who, all splattered with mud, rattling his chain, trotted after the little uncle's horse, with the supercilious aspect of a victor. "'You see, I am like all the rest of you, as long as there is no game to be after. Yes, and you had better keep aloof.' was what the aspect of this dog seemed to Nikolai to say. When, after some time, the little uncle rode back to Nikolai and began to talk with him, Nikolai felt flattered that, after what had taken place, the little uncle was condescending enough to talk with him. End of chapter 6part four, chapter seven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 7 When, late in the afternoon, Elegan courteously took his departure, Nikolai found that they were so far from home that he was glad to accept the little uncle's proposition that their hunting party should spend the night at his little estate of Mikhailovko. Now if you should come to my place, here's a howdy-do, said the little uncle. It would be the best thing you could desire. You see the weather is wet, added the little uncle. You could get rested, and the little countess could be driven home in a drotsky. The proposition was accepted. A huntsman was sent to Otranoya after the drotsky, while Nikolai, Natasha, and Petya went to the little uncle's. Five men, big and little, the little uncle's house serfs, rushed out upon the front doorstep to welcome their baron home. 
a dozen women of every age and size thrust their heads out of the back porch to stare at the approaching cavalcade the appearance of natasha a woman a barunya on the horseback aroused their curiosity to such a pitch that several of them undeterred by her presence approached her made a close examination of everything about her and made their observations freely in her presence as though she were some curiosity on exhibition and not a human being who could hear and understand what they said arinka just ye look she sits sidewise yes sidewise and her skirt dangles and see her horn holy saints preserve us and a knife too she's a real tartar how is it you don't get thrown off asked the most audacious of them turning directly to natasha the little uncle dismounted from his horse at the doorsteps of his small country residence which was built in the midst of an overgrown garden and glancing round on his domestics he gave an imperative order for the supernumeraries to clear out and for everything to be done necessary for the reception of his guests and the hunting train there was a general scattering the little uncle helped natasha to dismount and giving her his hand led her up the precarious deal steps the house which was not plastered and showed the rough timbers of the walls was not remarkable for its cleanliness it was plain to see that the inmates did not consider it the first duty of life to remove every trace of a spot but there was no noticeable neglect the entry was filled with the odor of fresh apples and hung with the skins of wolves and foxes the little uncle conducted his guests through the antechamber into a small music room with a folding table and red painted chairs thence into the drawing-room where there was a round pine table and a sofa and finally into the library where there were a ragged divan a well-worn carpet and portraits of suvorov of the proprietor's father and mother and of himself in military uniform the library smelt strong of tobacco and dogs here the little uncle begged his guests to be seated and make themselves quite at home and he left them rugai his back still covered with mud came into the room lay down on the divan and began to clean himself with tongue and teeth from the library led a corridor in which could be seen a screen with its hangings full of rents beyond the screen were heard the laughing and chatter of women natasha nikolai and petya threw off their wraps and sat down on the divan petya rested his head on his arm and was instantly asleep natasha and nikolai sat in silence their faces were flushed they were very hungry and in very good spirits they exchanged glances after the hunting was over and they were in the house nikolai no longer considered it necessary to display his masculine superiority over his sister natasha winked at her brother and both after trying to restrain themselves for a moment burst forth in a short and hearty peal of laughter without even taking time to think what they were laughing at after a short absence the little uncle came in dressed in a cossack coat blue trousers and short boots and natasha felt that this costume which to her amusement and amazement she had seen the little uncle wear at otranoya was a perfectly proper costume in no respect worse than frock coat or swallowtail the little uncle was also in the best of spirits he was not only not offended by the brother and sister's merriment it never entered into his head that they were laughing at his mode of life but even he joined in with their apparent causeless laughter well the little countess is so young here's a howdy-do never saw another like her he exclaimed giving rostov a long-stemmed pipe and waving another which he had chosen for himself with a carved short stem between his three fingers all day riding just like a man and as though it were quite the ordinary thing shortly after the little uncle rejoined them the door was opened by a young girl apparently barefooted to judge by the noiselessness of her tread and in came a portly ruddy-faced handsome woman of forty with double chin and full red lips bearing in her hands a huge tray set out with dishes with overpowering hospitality dignity and politeness beaming from her eyes and expressed in her every motion she contemplated the guests and with a flattering smile made them a most respectful curtsy in spite of a rather unusual portliness which made bosom and abdomen unduly prominent and caused her to hold her head very high this woman who was the little uncle's ekonomka or housekeeper moved about with amazing agility she walked up to the table set down the tray and skilfully with her white plump hands removed and arranged on the table the bottles and various dishes 
comprising the zukaska or lunch having done this she started away and stood by the door with a smile on her face that is the kind of woman i am now do you understand the little uncle her attitude seemed to rostof to imply how could he fail to understand not only rostof but even natasha understood the little uncle and the meaning of his furrowed brows and the happy self-satisfied smile which slightly curved his lips as anisya fedorovna entered the room on the tray were travnik or herb brandy liqueurs mushrooms wheat flour cakes with buttermilk fresh honeycomb mulled wine and sparkling mead apples raw nuts roasted nuts and nuts cooked in honey then anisya fedorovna brought fruits preserved in honey and sugar and a ham and a roast fowl just from the fire all this was of anisya fedorovna's own preparation and selecting and setting forth all this was redolent of anisya fedorovna and had the mark of her genius and taste all was in character with her scrupulous neatness and cleanness and whiteness and her pleasant smile have a bite of something to eat little countess she insisted handing natasha first one thing and then another natasha partook of everything and it seemed to her that she had never seen and never tasted such buttermilk cakes or mulled wine with such a flavor or nuts cooked so deliciously in honey or such a fowl anisya fedorovna went out rostof and the little uncle while sipping their glasses of cherry liqueur talked about hunting past and to come about rugai and Alagin's dogs natasha with shining eyes sat up erect on the divan and listened to them several times she tried to rouse petya to have something to eat but he muttered incoherent words and was evidently too sound to sleep natasha felt so happy she so keenly enjoyed the novel surroundings that her only fear was that the drotsky would come for her too soon after one of those fortuitous silences that are almost inevitable with people who for the first time entertain their friends at home the little uncle responding to a thought that must have occurred to his guests remarked and this is the way i shall live out my days you die here's a howdy do and nothing's left so what's the sin the little uncle's face had grown very grave and even handsome as he made this remark rostof could not help thinking of the pleasant things his father and the neighbors had said of the old man the little uncle throughout the whole government had the reputation of being as noble-hearted and disinterested as he was eccentric he was often called upon to act as arbiter in family disputes he was chosen executor of wills he was made the repository of secrets he was elected judge and called upon to fill other offices but he stubbornly refused to enter active service autumn and spring he rode about the country on his fallow bay salion in the winter he stayed at home in the summer he lounged in his overgrown garden why don't you enter the service little uncle i have served and i've given it up it's no use here's a howdy do i can't make anything out of it it's well enough for you youngsters but my wits could never grasp it but hunting that's quite another thing that's the howdy do open that door there he cried what did you shut it for the door at the end of the corridor which the little uncle called collidor led into a single room occupied by the hunting train the bare feet swiftly slithered along and an invisible hand pushed the door open into the hunter's room as this was called the sounds of the balalika or ukrainian guitar were clearly heard through the corridor some one who was a master hand at playing it evidently had a hold of the instrument it had been a long time since natasha had listened to these sounds and now she ran out into the corridor to hear more distinctly that is my mitka the coachman i bought a beautiful balalika for him i am fond of it said the little uncle after coming back from his courses the little uncle was in the habit of summoning mitka into the hunter's room to play for him the little uncle liked that kind of music how good it is it's excellent said nikolai with a slight trace of involuntary scorn as though he were ashamed of himself for confessing that he extremely enjoyed such sounds excellent repeated natasha reproachfully she was conscious of the tone in which her brother spoke excellent does not express it it's charming that's what it is just as the little uncles picked mushrooms the hydromel and the liqueur seemed to her the best in the world so also did that tune on the balaleka seem to her at that moment the very acme of all musical charm 
again please again cried natasha at the door as soon as the sounds of the balalaika had ceased mitka tuned the instrument and once more began bravely to thrum out the barinya or the high-born maid with a clanging of strings and grappling of chords the little uncle sat and listened inclining his head to one side with an almost imperceptible smile the theme of the barinya was repeated a hundred times several times the balalaika had to be tuned and then once more the same sounds trembled forth and yet the listeners were not wearied and wanted to hear this tune over and over again anisya fedorovna came in and leaned her portly frame against the door lintel be kind enough to listen to him said she to natasha with a smile strikingly like the little uncle's he plays for us gloriously she said that part is not done right suddenly exclaimed the little uncle with an energetic gesture it needs to be faster there here's a howdy-do let it out and do you know how to play asked natasha the little uncle smiled but made no reply just you look anishusha if the strings are all on my guitar i have not had it in my hands for some time here's a howdy-do anisya fedorovna gladly went to fulfil her lord and master's command and soon brought the guitar the little uncle not looking at any one blew off the dust rapped with his bony fingers on the sounding-board of the guitar tuned the strings and straightened himself on his chair he grasped the guitar above the finger-board with a somewhat theatrical air pushing back his left elbow and with a wink toward anisya fedorovna he struck up not the barunya but a prelude of one clear ringing chord after which he began in a steady and precise but still regularly accented tempo to improvise variations on the well-known song on the pavement of the street at once the theme of the song began to sing itself rhythmically in the hearts of both nikolai and natasha with that peculiar sedate cheerfulness which anisya fedorovna's whole being exhaled anisya fedorovna blushed and hiding her face in her handkerchief she left the room with a laugh the little uncle went on improvising on the song clearly carefully and with energetic steadiness his glance full of varying inspiration fixed on the spot where anisya fedorovna had been standing there was a barely perceptible something betokening amusement at one corner of his mouth under his gray moustache and this look intensified as the song went on or as the accent grew more pronounced and in such places as the strings almost snapped under his twanging fingers charming charming little uncle some more some more cried natasha as soon as he came to a pause then springing up from her seat she threw her arms around the little uncle and kissed him nikolenka nikolenka he cried glancing at her brother and as it were asking him if he appreciated it all nikolai was also greatly delighted with the performance the little uncle once more struck a tune anisya fedorovna's smiling face again appeared in the doorway and behind her were grouped still other faces at the crystal flowing fountain cries a voice o oh maiden wait was the tune which the little uncle played then he made one more skilful change of key broke off and shrugged his shoulders there there little uncle you old darling murmured natasha in such a tone of entreaty that one might have thought her life were dependent on its gratification the little uncle stood up and as though there were two men the one smiling a grave smile at the merry one while the merry one performed a naive and dignified antic in anticipation of the pliska or native dance now then my dear niece cried the little uncle waving his hand toward natasha after striking a chord natasha threw off the shawl which she had wrapped around her glided out in front of the little uncle and putting her arms akimbo made a motion with her shoulders and waited where how when had this little countess educated as she had been by a french emigre imbibed the russian spirit from the very atmosphere which she had breathed where had she learned all those characteristic motions which the pas de chale might long ago have supposed entirely to efface but the spirit and the motions were the very ones inimitable untaught intuitive thoroughly russian which the little uncle expected of her the moment she got to her feet with an enthusiastic proud and shrewdly gay smile the first tremor of fear which seized nikolai and all the other spectators the fear that she might not be able to perform it correctly passed away and gave place to sheer admiration 
Her performance was so absolutely perfect, and so entirely what was expected of her, that Anisya Fedorovna, who had immediately handed to her the handkerchief that played such an indispensable part in the dance, wept and laughed at once, as she gazed at that slender, graceful countess, from another world, as it were, educated in silks and velvets, who could understand all that was in herself, Anisya, in Anisya's father, Fyodor, and in her aunt, and in her mother, and in the whole Russian people. "'Well, little countess, here's a howdy-do,' exclaimed the little uncle, with a radiant smile, when the plaska was finished. "'Well done, niece. Now all we have to do is pick you out a fine young husband. Here's a howdy-do.' "'Already picked out,' said Nikolai, smiling. "'Oh, ho!' exclaimed the little uncle, in surprise, with a questioning look at Natasha. Natasha, with a smile of pleasure, nodded her head in assent. "'And he's such a fine one,' said she. But the moment these words had escaped her lips, a new train of thoughts and feelings arose in her mind. What signified Nikolai's smile when he said, "'Already picked out? Is he glad or sorry? Possibly he thinks that my Bolkonsky would not approve, would not understand, this gaiety of ours. No, he certainly would not understand it all.' "'Where is he now, I wonder?' said Natasha to herself, and her face grew suddenly grave, but it lasted only a single second. "'You must not think about it. You must not dare to think about it,' she said to herself, and with her face wreathed in smiles, she again sat down beside the little uncle and urged him to play something more. The little uncle played still another song and valse. Then, after a short silence, he cleared his throat and struck up his favorite hunting song. As the evening sun sank low, fell the white and beauteous snow. The little uncle sang as the peasant, as the people, sings, with that full and naive conviction that the whole meaning is to be found exclusively in the words, that the tune will go of itself, and that there is no special air, or that the air is merely for harmony's sake. The result was that this singing of the little uncles, so completely free from self-consciousness, like the songs of the birds, was particularly charming. Natasha was in raptures over his singing. She determined that she would not take any more lessons on the harp, but would henceforth play only on the guitar. She asked the little uncle to let her take the instrument, and immediately began to pick out chords for singing. About ten o'clock, a lanyanka, or long, low carriage, and a drotsky came for Natasha and Petya, and three mounted men who had been sent to find them. The Count and Countess did not know what had become of them, and, as the messenger reported, were in a great state of agitation. Petya was picked up and deposited in the Lanyanka, like a dead body. Natasha and Nikolai took their places in the Drotsky. The little uncle muffled Natasha all up, and bade her farewell with a new and peculiar touch of affection. He accompanied them on foot as far as the bridge, which they had to abandon for the ford, and he commanded his hunters to precede them with lanterns. Goodbye, Pushkai, my dear niece, rang his voice from out of the darkness. Not the one which Natasha had known hitherto, but the one that had sung as the evening sun sank low. The windows in the village through which they passed gleamed with ruddy lights, and there was a cheerful odor of smoke. How charming the little uncle is, exclaimed Natasha, as they bowled along the highway. Yes, said Nikolai. You are not cold, are you? No, I'm comfortable, perfectly comfortable. Oh, I'm so happy, replied Natasha, with a sense of perplexity. They rode for a long time in silence. The night was dark and damp. They could not even see the horses. They could only hear them splashing through the unseen mud puddles. What was going on in that child's impressionable mind, which was so quick to catch and retain the most varied experiences of life? How was it possible to stow them all away in it? But she was very happy. As they drew near the house, she suddenly struck up the song. As the evening sun sank low, the tune of which she had been trying all the way to catch, and at last succeeded in remembering. "'You've caught it, have you?' said Nikolai. "'What were you thinking about just now, Nikolenka?' asked Natasha. They were fond of asking each other this question. "'I?' exclaimed Nikolai, trying to recollect. "'Let me see. At first I was thinking that Rugai, the red hound, was like the little uncle, and that, if he had been a man, he would have kept the little uncle about him all the time, if not for hunting, at least for his music. At all events, I would have kept him. 
What a musician the little uncle is, isn't he? Well, and what were your thoughts? Mine? Wait. Wait. At first I was thinking how we were riding here, and that we supposed we were on our way home, whereas in reality it is so dark that God only knows where we are going, and we might suddenly discover that we were not at Otronaya at all, but in some fairy realm. And then I was thinking... No, there was nothing else. I know. You certainly were thinking about him, said Nikolai, smiling, as Natasha knew by the tone of his voice. No, replied Natasha, though in reality she had been thinking about Prince Andrei and wondering how he would have liked the little uncle. And there's one thing I have been repeating and repeating all the way, said Natasha, and that is, how superbly Anishushka marched about. And Nikolai heard her clear, merry laugh, so easily excited by trifles. But do you know, she suddenly added, I am certain that I shall never, never again be so happy, so free from care as I am now. What rubbish, nonsense, trumpery talk, exclaimed Nikolai, and he thought in his own mind, how charming this Natasha of mine is. I shall never find another friend like her. Why should she think of getting married? We might travel all over the world together. How charming this dear Nikolai is, thought Natasha. Ah, there's a light in the drawing-room still, said she, pointing to the windows of the mansion, cheerfully shining out into the moist, velvety darkness of the night. End of chapter 7Part Four, Chapter Eight of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Eight. Count Ilya Andreevich had resigned his position as predvoditel or marshal of the district nobility, because this office entailed too great expenses. But still, his finances showed no improvement. Often, Natasha and Nikolai found their parents engaged in secret, anxious consultation and they heard rumors about the sale of the magnificent ancestral home of the Rostovs and their Pod Moskovnaya estate. Now that he was relieved from this office, it was not necessary for them to entertain so extensively, and life at Otradnoya went on more quietly than in former years, but the huge mansion and the wings were just as full of servants as ever, and more than twenty persons habitually sat down at table. And all these were the regular household, who lived there, practically members of the family, or those who were obliged, for some reason or other, to live at the Count's expense. Such, for instance, were Dimmler, the music-master, and his wife, Fogel, the dancing-master, and his whole family, and then an elderly lady of quality, named Bilova, who had her home there, and many others of the same sort, Petya's tutors and governors, the young lady's former Guvernatka, and men and women who simply found it better or more to their advantage to live at the Count's than at home. They had not quite so much company as formerly, but the scale of living was practically the same, for the Count and the Countess found it impossible to accommodate themselves to any other. The hunting establishment was the same. Nay, it had even been increased by Nikolai. There were still fifty horses and fifteen coachmen in the stables, Rich gifts on name days were still given, and formal dinners, at which all the neighborhood were invited. The Count still had his whist and Boston parties, at which, as he held his cards spread out so that everyone could see them, his neighbors were enabled to go away enriched to the extent of several hundred rubles every day. Having come to regard it as an especial prerogative of theirs, to make up a table at which Count Ilya Andreyevich should serve as their chief source of income." The Count marched along through the monstrous tangle of his affairs, striving not to believe that he was so involved, and at every step involving himself more and more, and feeling conscious that he had not the strength to rend the bonds that beset his feet, or the zeal and patience required to unravel them. The Countess, with her loving heart, was conscious that their fortunes were going to rack and ruin, but she felt that the Count was blameless, that he could not help being what he was that he himself was suffering, though he tried to conceal it, from the consciousness of the ruin that faced himself and his family, and was striving to devise means of rescue. From her woman's point of view, the only means that presented itself was to get Nikolai married to a wealthy heiress. She felt that this was their last hope, and that if Nikolai refused a certain match which she proposed to arrange for him, it would be necessary to bid a final farewell to every hope of restoring their fortunes. This match was with Julie Karagina, 
the daughter of a most worthy and virtuous father and mother, a girl whom the Rostovs had known since she was a child, and who had lately come into a large fortune, by the fortuitous death of the last of her brothers. The Countess had written directly to Madame Karagina, in Moscow, proposing a marriage between daughter and son, and she had received a most favorable response. Karagina replied that she, for her part, was agreed, but that everything depended on her daughter's inclinations. Karagina invited Nikolai to come to Moscow. Several times the Countess, with tears in her eyes, told her son that now, since both of her daughters were provided for, her sole desire was to see him married. She declared that she would go to her grave contented, if this might be. Then she said that she happened to know of a very lovely girl, and she wanted to know his ideas upon the subject. On other occasions she openly praised Julie, and advised Nikolai to go to Moscow and have a good time during the Christmas holidays. Nikolai was sharp enough to understand his mother's covert hints, and during one of their talks he managed to draw her out completely. She told him that their whole hope of bringing their affairs into order was in seeing him married to the Karagina. But what if I loved a girl who was poor, Maman? Would you insist upon my sacrificing my feelings and honor for money? He asked, not realizing the harshness of his question, and simply desiring to show his noble feelings. No, you don't understand me, said his mother, not knowing how to set herself straight. You misunderstand me entirely, Nikolinka. All I desire is your happiness, she added, and she had the consciousness that she had not spoken the truth, that she was getting beyond her depth. She burst into tears. Mamenka, don't cry. Simply tell me that this is your real wish, and you know that I would give my whole life, everything that I have, to make you happy, said Nikolai. I would sacrifice everything for you, even my dearest wishes. But the Countess had no desire to offer the dilemma. She had no wish to demand a sacrifice from her son. She would have preferred herself to be the one who should make the sacrifice. No, no, you have not understood me. We won't say anything more about it, said she, wiping away her tears. Yes, perhaps it is true that I am in love with a penniless girl, said Nikolai to himself. Why should I sacrifice my sentiments and my honor for the sake of wealth? I am amazed that Mamenka should say such a thing to me. Is there any reason, because Sonya is poor, that I should not love her, he asked himself. Can I return her true, generous love? And, most certainly, I should be much happier with her than with such a doll as Julie. I can always sacrifice my feelings for my parents' good, he said to himself, but to command my feeling is beyond my power. If I love Sonya, then my feeling is more powerful and rules everything for me. Nikolai did not go to Moscow. The countess did not again revert to her conversation with him about his marriage, but it was with pain, and even with indignation, that she saw the signs of a constantly growing intimacy between her son and the dowerless Sonya. She reproached herself, but she found it impossible to resist heaping worriments upon Sonya and finding fault with her, oftentimes stopping her short and addressing her with the formal vu, you, and moya mailia, instead of both the usual tender epithets. What annoyed the worthy countess most of all was that this poor, dark-eyed niece of hers was so sweet, so gentle, so humbly grateful for all her kindnesses, and so genuinely, unchangeably, and self-sacrificingly in love with Nikolai, that it was impossible to find anything really to blame her for. Nikolai stayed at home, waiting till his leave of absence should expire. A letter was received about that time from Natasha's lover, Prince Andrei, dating at Rome. It was his fourth. In it, he wrote that he should long ere that have been on his way home to Russia, had it not been that the warmth of the climate had unexpectedly caused his wound to reopen, which obliged him to postpone his journey till the beginning of the next year. Natasha was deeply in love with her bridegroom. Her character had been greatly modified by this love. At the same time, her nature was thoroughly open to all the joys of life, but toward the end of the fourth month of their separation, she began to suffer from attacks of melancholy, which she found it impossible to resist. She was sick to death of herself. She grieved because all this time was slipping away so uselessly, while she felt that she was only too ready to love and to be loved. It was far from cheerful at the Rostovs. End of chapter 8
Part Four, Chapter Nine of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Nine. The Christmas holidays had come, and except for the high mass, except for the formal and perfunctory congratulations of the neighbors and the household servants, except for the new dresses that everybody had on, there was nothing that especially signalized the season though the perfectly still atmosphere, with the thermometer at twenty degrees below zero, the sun shining dazzlingly all day long, and, at night, the wintry sky glittering with myriads of stars, seemed to imply that nature, at least, gave special distinction to the Christmas tide. After dinner, on the third day of the Christmas holidays, all the household had scattered to their respective rooms. It was the most tedious time of day. Nikolai, who had been out in the morning, making calls on the neighbors, was asleep in the divan room. The old count was resting in his library. Sonya was sitting at the center table in the drawing room copying some designs. The countess was laying out her game of patience. Nastasya Ivanovna, the buffoon with the woebegone countenance, was sitting at the window with two old ladies. Natasha came into the room and went directly up to Sonya, looked at what she was doing, then stepped across to her mother and stood by her without saying a word. "'Why are you wandering about like a homeless spirit?' asked her mother. "'What do you want?' "'I want him, instantly, this very minute. I want him,' said Natasha, with gleaming eyes, but without a trace of a smile. The countess raised her head and gave her daughter a steady look. "'Don't look at me so. Don't look at me, Mamma. I shall cry if you do.' "'Sit down. Sit down here with me,' said the countess." Mamma, I must have him. Why am I perishing so, Mamma? Her voice broke. The tears started to her eyes, and in order to hide them she quickly turned away and left the room. She went into the divan room, stood there a moment lost in thought, and went to the maid's sitting room. There, an elderly chambermaid was scolding a young girl who had just come in from out of doors all out of breath. You might play some other time, the old servant was saying. There is a time for all things. Let her be, Kondratyevna, said Natasha. Run, Mavrushka, run. And having rescued Mavrusha, Natasha went through the ballroom into the anteroom. An old man and two young lackeys were playing cards. They stopped their game and respectfully stood up as their young mistress came in. What shall I have them do? wondered Natasha. Yes, Nikita, please go. Where shall I send him? Oh, yes, go into the barnyard and fetch me a cock. "'Yes, and you, Misha, bring me some oats.' "'Do you wish a few oats?' asked Misha, with joyous readiness. "'Go, go, make haste,' said the old man imperiously. "'And you, Fyodor, get me a piece of chalk.' As she went past the butler's pantry, she ordered the samovar to be got ready, although it was not anywhere near the time for it. Foka, the bufetchik, or butler, was the most morose man of all the household, Natasha took it into her head to try her power over him. He suspected that she was not in earnest, and began to ask her if she meant it. "'Oh, what a barushnya she is,' said Foka, pretending to be very cross at Natasha. No one in the house set so many feet flying, and no one could give the servants so much to do as Natasha. She could not have any peace of mind if she saw servants, unless she sent them on some errand. It seemed as if she were making experiments whether she would not meet with angry answers or with grumbling, in the part of some of them, but the servants obeyed, no one else so willingly as Natasha. "'Now, what shall I do? Where shall I go?' pondered the young countess, as she slowly passed along the corridor. "'Natasya Ivanovna, what sort of children shall I have?' she demanded of the buffoon, who, dressed in his woman's short jacket, was coming towards her. "'Oh, you will have fleas, dragonflies, and grasshoppers.' replied the buffoon. "'My God, my God, it's this everlasting sameness. What shall I do with myself? Where can I find something to do?' And, swiftly kicking her heels together, she ran upstairs to the quarters occupied by Fogel and his wife. Two governesses were sitting in the Fogel's room. On the table stood plates with raisins, walnuts, and almonds. The governesses were discussing the question whether it were cheaper to live in Moscow or Odessa. Natasha sat down, listened to their conversation with a grave, thoughtful face, and then stood up. "'The island of Madagascar!' she exclaimed. 
Madagascar, she repeated, laying a special emphasis on each syllable. And then, without replying to Madame Chausse's question what she said, she hastened from the room. Petya, her brother, was also upstairs. He and his tutor were arranging for some fireworks which they were going to set off that night. Petya, Petya, she cried to him, carry me downstairs. Petya ran to her and bent his back. She jumped upon it and threw her arms around his neck, and he, with a hop, skip, and jump, started to run down with her. "'No, thank you. That will do. The island of Madagascar,' she repeated, and jumping off, she flew downstairs. Having made the tour of her dominions, as it were, having made trial of her power of command, and discovered that all were sufficiently obedient, but that everything was nevertheless utterly stupid, Natasha went into the ballroom sat down in a dark corner behind a chiffonier, and began to thrum the bass strings of her guitar, practicing a theme which she remembered from an opera she had heard at Petersburg in company with Prince Andrei. If any one from the outside had been listening to her, it would have struck him that there was something lacking in the harmonies that she managed to produce on her guitar. But in her imagination these sounds aroused from the dead past a whole series of recollections. As she sat in the shadow of the chiffonier, with her eyes fixed on the pencil light that streamed from the door of the butler's pantry, she listened to herself and indulged in daydreams. She was in the mood for daydreaming. Sonya, with a wine glass in her hand, passed through the ballroom on her way to the butler's pantry. Natasha looked at her, at the bright chink in the door, and it seemed to her that on some occasion, long before, she had seen the light streaming through the chink in the pantry door and Sonya crossing the room with a glass. Yes, and it was exactly the same, said Natasha to herself. What is this tune, Sonya? cried Natasha, moving her fingers over the bass strings. Ah, are you here? cried Sonya, startled at first, and then stopping to listen. I don't know. Isn't it the storm? she suggested timidly, for fear that she was mistaken. Now there, she gave a start in exactly the same way. She came up to me in exactly the same way, and her face wore the same timid smile when that took place, thought Natasha. And in just the same way I felt that there was something lacking in her. No, that is the chorus from Water Carrier, don't you remember? And Natasha hummed the air over to recall it to Sonya's memory. Where were you going? asked Natasha. To change the water in this glass. I am just copying a sketch. You are always busy, and here am I, not good for anything, said Natasha. Where's Nikolai? Asleep, I think. Sonya, do go and wake him up, urged Natasha. Tell him that I want him to sing. She remained sitting there and wondering why it was that this had happened so, but as it did not disturb her very much that she was not able to solve this question, she once more relapsed into her recollections of the time when she was with him and he looked at her with loving eyes. Ugh, I wish he would come. I am so afraid that he won't come. But worst of all, I am growing old. That's a fact. Soon I shall not be what I am even now. But, maybe, he will come today. Maybe he is here now. Maybe he has come, and even now is sitting in the drawing-room. Maybe he came yesterday, and I have forgotten all about it. She got up, laid down the guitar, and went into the drawing-room. All the household— Tutors, governesses, and guests were already gathered near the tea-table. The men were standing around the table, but Prince Andrei was not among them, and everything was as usual. "'Ah, there she is,' said Count Ilya Andreyitch, as he saw Natasha. "'Come here and sit by me.' But Natasha remained standing near her mother, looking around as though she were in search of someone. Mamma, she murmured. "'Give him back to me, Mamma. Quick! Quick!' and again she found it hard to keep from sobbing. She sat down by the table and listened to the conversation of her elders and of Nikolai, who had also come in late to the tea-table. My God! My God! The same faces, the same small talk. Even Papa holds his cup and cools it with his breath, just as he always does, said Natasha, to her horror feeling a dislike rising in her against all the household because they were always the same. After tea, Nikolai, Sonya, and Natasha went into the divan room, to their favorite corner, where they always held their most confidential conversations. 
End of chapter 9《Part 4 Chapter 10 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Marianne Chapter 10 Has it ever happened to you asked Natasha of her brother when they were comfortably settled in the divan room has it ever happened to you that it seemed as though there were nothing just nothing at all left in the future for you that all that was best was past and that you were not so much bored as disgusted haven't i indeed many a time when everything was going well and all were gay it would come into my head that it was all vanity and vexation of spirit and that all of us would have to die once at the regiment i did not go out to promenade though the band was playing for everything had suddenly become so gloomy Ugh, i know what you mean i know i know interposed natasha when i was a tiny bit of a girl it used to be that way with me do you remember I was punished once, on account of those plums, and you were all dancing, while I had to sit alone in the classroom and sobbed? I shall never forget how melancholy I felt, and how vexed with you all, and with myself. Oh, yes, vexed with you all, all of you. And the worst of it was, I was not to blame, said Natasha. Do you remember? I remember, replied Nikolai, and I remember that I went to you, and wanted to comfort you, and— do you know, I was ashamed to do it. We were terribly absurd. I had at that time a kind of a toy, like a mannequin, and I wanted to give it to you. Do you remember? And do you remember, asked Natasha, with a thoughtful smile, how, once, long, long time ago, when we were little tots, Uncle took us into the library. That was in the old house, and it was dark. And when we went in, suddenly there stood before us, a negro said nikolai taking the word from her mouth and laughing merrily of course i remember it and now i can't tell for the life of me that it was a negro or whether we saw it in a dream or whether it was something that we were told he was gray you remember and had white teeth and he stood and stared at us do you remember it sonya asked nikolai yes i have a dim recollection of something about it timidly replied the young girl I have asked both Papa and Mamma about that negro, said Natasha. They declare that no negro was ever here. But you see, you remember about it. Certainly I do, and now I recall his teeth very distinctly. How strange, just as though it were in a dream. I like it. And do you remember how we were rolling eggs in the music room, and suddenly two little old women appeared and began to whirl round on the carpet? That was so, wasn't it? Do you remember how fine it was? Yes, and do you remember how Papenka, in a blue shuba, used to fire off his musket from the doorsteps? Thus smiling with delight, they took turns in calling up, not the reminiscences of a gloomy old age, but the recollections of the poetic days of youth, impressions from the most distant past, dreams fused and confused with reality, and these happy recollections sometimes made them quietly laugh. Sonya, as usual, sat at a little distance from the other two, though their recollections were not confined to themselves alone. Sonya did not remember much of what the others did, and what came back to her failed to arouse in her that poetic feeling which they experienced. She simply rejoiced in their enjoyment, and tried to take part in it. She began to feel a special interest in these reminiscences, only when they came to speak of her first coming to their house— Sonya was telling how afraid she was of Nikolai, because he wore braid on his jacket, and her nurse told her that they were going to sew her up in braid. "'And I remember they told me that you were born under a cabbage,' said Natasha, "'and I remember also that I did not dare to disbelieve it, though I knew that it was a fib, and I felt so uncomfortable.' At this stage of the conversation a chambermaid thrust her head into the divan room, at the rear door, and said in a whisper, "'Baronishna, they have brought the cock.' I don't want it, Polya, now. Tell them to carry it away again. While they were still engaged in talking, Dimmler came into the divan room and went to the harp that stood in one corner. As he took off the covering, the harp gave forth a discordant sound. Edward Karluitch, please play my favorite nocturne, that one by Monsieur Field, cried the old countess from the drawing room. Dimmler struck a chord and, turning to Natasha, Nikolai, and Sonya, said, Young people, how quiet you are sitting. 
yes we are talking philosophy said natasha looking up for an instant and then pursuing the conversation it now turned upon dreams dimmler began to play natasha noiselessly went on her tiptoes to the table took the candle and carried it out then she came back and sat down quietly in her place in the room especially that part where the divan was on which they were sitting it was dark but through the lofty windows the silver light of the full moon fell across the floor do you know i think said natasha drawing close to nikolai and sonya when dimmler had now finished his nocturne and sat lightly thrumming the strings apparently uncertain whether to cease or to play something else i think that when you go back remembering and remembering and remembering everything you remember so far back that at last you remember what happened even before you were born at least i do that is metempsychosis exclaimed sonya who always had been distinguished for her scholarship and her good memory the egyptians used to believe that our souls once inhabited the bodies of animals and will go into animals again ah but do you know i don't believe that we were ever in animals remarked natasha in the same low voice though the music had ceased but i know for certain that we used to be angels in that other world and when we come here we remember about it may i join you asked dimmler coming up noiselessly and taking a seat near them if we were angels then why have we fallen lower suggested nikolai no that can't be who told you that you are lower than the angels because i know what i used to be objected natasha with conviction you see the soul is immortal it must be if i am going to live always that i lived before lived a whole eternity yes but it is hard for us to realize what eternity is remarked dimmler who when he had joined the group of young people had worn a slightly scornful smile but now spoke in as low and serious a tone as the rest why is it hard to realize eternity demanded natasha after today comes tomorrow and then the next day and so on for ever and in the same way yesterday was and the day before and so on natasha now it's your turn sing me something said the countess's voice why are you all sitting there like conspirators mamma i don't feel like it said natasha but nevertheless she got up not one of them not even dimmler who was no longer young wanted to break off the conversation and leave the corner but natasha had arisen and nikolai took his place at the harpsichord natasha as usual going to the centre of the music-room and choosing the place where her voice sounded best began to sing her mother's favourite piece she had said that she did not feel like singing but it was long since she had sung as she sang that evening and long before she sang so well again count ilya andreyitch listened to it from his library where he was closeted with mitenka and like a schoolboy in haste to go out to play as soon as his lessons are done he stumbled over his words as he gave his instructions to his overseer and finally stopped speaking while mitenka also with ears attent stood silently in front of the count nikolai did not take his eyes from his sister and even breathed when she did sonya as she listened thought what a wide gulf there was between her and her friend and how impossible it would be to find any one in the world so bewitchingly charming as her cousin the old countess with a smile of melancholy pleasure and with tears in her eyes sat occasionally shaking her head she was thinking of natasha and of her own youthful days and of that unnatural and terrible element that seemed to enter into this engagement of her daughter with prince andrei dimmler taking his seat next to the countess and covering his eyes listened no countess said he finally this talent of hers is european she has nothing to learn such smoothness sympathetic quality power ugh how i tremble for her how worried i am said the countess not realizing to whom she was speaking her maternal instinct told her that natasha had more in her than ordinary girls and that this would result in unhappiness for her natasha had not quite finished her singing when fourteen-year-old petya all excitement came running into the room with the news that some maskers had come natasha abruptly stopped durak idiot she cried to her brother and running to a chair flung herself into it and sobbed so that it was long before she could recover herself it's nothing mamenka truly it's nothing it was only petya startled me said she striving to smile but her tears still flowed and her throat was choked by her repressed sobs 
the house servants who had dressed themselves up as bears turks tavern keepers fine ladies monsters and ogres bringing in with them the outside cold and hilarity at first shyly clustered together in the anteroom but gradually hiding one behind the other they ventured into the ballroom and at first timidly but afterwards with ever-increasing fervour and zeal began to perform songs dances and corvades and other christmas games the countess after she had recognised them and indulged in a hearty laugh at their antics retired to the drawing-room count ilya andreitch with a radiant smile took his seat in the ballroom with approving glances at the masqueraders meantime all the young folks had mysteriously disappeared within half an hour the other masqueraders in the ballroom were joined by an elderly baronia in farthingale and this was nikolai by a turkish woman and this was petya by a clown this was dimmler by hussar natasha and by a circassian youth sonya both the girls had dark eyebrows and moustaches contrived with the help of burnt cork after well-feigned surprise and pretended lack of recognition as well as praise from those who were not murmuring the young people decided that their costumes were too grand to be wasted and that it was incumbent upon them to go and exhibit them elsewhere nikolai who had a strong desire for a trioka ride the roads being in splendid condition proposed that they should take with them the ten house serfs who were disguised and that all should go and visit the little uncle no he is an old man you will merely disturb him expostulated the countess why you couldn't all get into his house if you must go somewhere then go to melyukov's melyukova was a widow who with a host of children of various ages and with tutors and governesses lived about four versts from the rostovs there ma chere a good idea cried the old count becoming greatly excited wait till i can get into a costume and i will go with you i tell you we will wake pesheta up but the countess was not at all inclined to let the old count go since for several days his leg had been troubling him it was therefore decided that it was not best for ilya andreitch to go but that if luisa ivanovna that is to say madame Schoss, would act as chaperone then the young ladies might also go to melyukova's sonya though generally very timid and shy now was more urgent than all the others in her entreaties to luisa ivanovna not to leave them in the lurch sonya's costume was the best of all her moustache and dark brows were extremely becoming to her all assured her that she was very handsome and she was keyed up to a state of energy and excitement quite out of her usual manner some inner voice told her now or never her fate was to be decided and now in her masculine garb she seemed like another person Luisa Ivanovna consented, and in less than half an hour four triokas, with jingling bells, on shaft arch and harness swept, creaking and crunching over the frosty snow, up to the front steps. Natasha was the first to catch the tone of Christmas festivity, and this jollity was perfectly infectious, growing more and more noisy, and reaching the highest pitch as they all came out into the frosty air, and was shouting and calling, and laughing and screaming took their places in the sledges two or three spans were unmatched the third trioka belonged to the old count with a racer of the orlov breed between the thills the fourth was nikolai's own private troika with a low shaggy black shaft horse nikolai in his old maid's costume over which he threw his hussar's riding cloak fastened with a belt took his place in the middle of his sledge and gathered up the reins it was so light that he could see the metal of the harness plates shining in the moonbeams and the horses eyes as they turned them anxiously toward the merry group gathered under the dark roof of the porte chaucheres in nikolai's sledge were packed natasha sonya madame chasse and two of the maid-servants in the old counts went dimmler with his wife and petya in the others the rest of the household serfs were disposed you lead the way zakhar cried nikolai to his father's coachman he wished to have the chance to beat him on the road. The old Count's Trioka, with Dimmler and the other masqueraders, creaked as though its runners were frozen to the snow, and, with the jingling of its deep-toned bell, started forward. The side horses twitched at their shafts, and kicked up the sugar-like, gleaming crystals of the snow. Nikolai followed Zakhar. Behind them, with a creaking and crunching, came the others. At first they went rather gingerly along the narrow driveway, as they passed the park the shadows cast by the bare trees lay across the road and checkered the moonlight, 
but as soon as they got beyond the park enclosure the snowy expanse gleaming like diamonds with a deep blue phosphorescence all drenched in moonlight and motionless opened out before them in every direction all at once the foremost sledge dipped into a cradle hole in exactly the same way the one behind it went down and came up again and then the next behind and then boldly breaking the iron-bound silence the sledges began to speed along the road one after the other there is a hair track ever so many of them rang natasha's voice through the frost-bound air how light it is nicholas said sonya's voice nikolai glanced round and bent over so as to get a closer look into her face the pretty face with an odd and entirely new expression caused by the black brows and the moustache glanced up at him from under the sables that used to be sonya said nikolai to himself he gave her a closer look and smiled what is the matter nicholas nothing said he and he again gave his attention to his horses having now reached the hard-trodden high road stretching away in the moonlight and polished smooth by numberless runners and all hacked up by the tracks of the horseshoe nails the horses of their own accord began to pull on the reins and increase their speed the off horse tossing his head galloped along twitching on his traces the shaft horse shook out into a trot laying back his ears as though asking shall we begin or is it too early as yet zakhar's troika already a considerable distance ahead the jingle of its deep toned bell growing more and more distant could be seen like a black patch against the whiteness of the snow shouts and laughter and the voices of the party in the distance could be plainly heard now then my darlings cried nikolai giving a firm rein with one hand and raising his hand with the knout and only by the increase of the wind that blew in their faces and by the straining of the side horses which kept springing and galloping faster and more furiously could it be told at what a pace the troika was flying nikolai glanced back with shouts and whistling with creaking of whips and encouraging words to the horses followed the other troika at a flying pace the back of the shaft horse rose and fell steadily under the curved duga but with no thought of breaking and ready to give more and ever more speed if it were required of him Nikolai now overtook the first troika. They glided down a little slope and came out upon a road wide enough for several teams to drive abreast, stretching along the interval by the riverside. "'Where will this take us, I wonder?' queried Nikolai. "'This must be the sloping intervale. But, no, it is a place I don't recognize at all. I never saw it before. It is neither the sloping intervale, nor the Dyonkin Hill. God only knows where we are.' It is certainly some new and enchanted place. Well, what difference does it make to us? And, shouting at his horses, he began to gain on the first trioka. Zakhar held his team to their work and turned round his face, white with frost, even to the eyebrows. Nikolai gave his horses rein. Zakhar reached out his arms, clicked his tongue, and also gave his free rein. Now, steady there, baron, cried he. Still swifter flew the two triokas, side by side and swiftly the legs of the horses interwove as onward they sped. Nikolai began gradually to forge ahead. Zakhar, not changing the position of his outstretched arms, kept the hand that held the reins a little higher. "'You can't come it, Baron,' he cried to Nikolai. Nikolai urged all three of his horses to gallop, and sped past Zakhar. The horses kicked the fine dry snow into the faces of the party. The bells jingled together as they flew on side by side, and the swiftly moving legs of the horses mingled together while the shadows crossed and interlaced upon the snow the runners whizzed along the road and the shouts and cries of the women were heard in each of the sledges once more reining in his horses nikolai glanced around him everywhere was the same magical expanse flooded deep with the moonbeams and with millions of stars scattered over it zakhar is shouting turn to the left but why to the left queried nikolai aren't we going to the Melyukovs? is this the way to melyukovna god knows where we are going and god knows what is going to become of us and it is very strange and very pleasant whatever becomes of us he looked down into the sledge oh see there his moustache and eyelashes are all white said one of the handsome young strangers with delicate moustaches and eyebrows who sat in the sledge that i think must have been natasha said nikolai to himself and the other is madame Schoss. and perhaps i am wrong 
but that Circassian with the moustache I never saw before, but I love her all the same. You aren't cold, are you? he asked. They gave no other answer than a merry laugh. Dimmler was shouting something from the hindmost sledge. It was probably funny, but he could not make out what it was. Yes, yes, replied other voices, with a burst of laughter. And now here is a sort of enchanted forest, with black shadows interlacing, and the gleams of diamonds, and something like an enfilade of marble steps, and there are the silver roofs of an enchanted castle, and the piercing yells of wild beasts. But supposing after all it were Milyukovka, then it would be still more wonderful that we should have gone, God knows how, and still have come out at Milyukovka, said Nikolai to himself. In point of fact it was Milyukovka, and maids and lackeys began to appear on the doorsteps of the entrance with torches and happy faces. "'Who is it?' asked someone from the front door. "'Masqueraders from the Counts. I can tell by the horses,' replied various voices. End of chapter 10「Part four, chapter eleven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, recording by Marianne. Chapter eleven Pelagaya Danilovna Milyukova, a very stout and energetic woman in spectacles, and wearing a loose fitting capote, was sitting in the drawing room, surrounded by her daughters, whom she was doing her best to entertain. They were quietly moulding wax, and looking at the shadows cast by retreating figures, when the steps and voices of the visitors began to echo through the anteroom. Hussars, high-born ladies, witches, clowns, bears, coughing and wiping their frost-bound faces, came into the ballroom, where the candelabras were hastily lighted. The clown, that is, Dimmler, with the barinha, that is, Nikolai, opened the dance. Surrounded by gleefully shouting children, the masqueraders, hiding their faces and disguising their voices, made low bows before the mistress of the mansion, and then scattered through the room. "'Ach, it is impossible to tell. Ah, that's Natasha. Just see whom she looks like. Truly she reminds me of someone. And there's Edward Karluitch. How elegant! I shouldn't have known you. Ah, how elegantly he dances. Ah, oh, saints preserve us! And who is that Circassian? Indeed, it reminds me of Sonyushka. And who is that? Well, well, this is a kindness. Move out the tables, Nikita, Vanya, and we have been sitting here so solemnly. Ha, ha, ha! What a hussar! What a hussar! Just like a boy, and what legs! I can't look at you. Such were the remarks on every side. Natasha, who was a great favorite with the young Melyukovs, disappeared with them into some distant room, where a burnt cork and dressing gowns and various articles of masculine attire were immediately in requisition, and these were snatched from the lackey who brought them, through the half-open door, by girlish arms all bare. Within ten minutes all the young people of the Melyukov family came down and rejoined the masqueraders. Pelagea Danilovna, who had seen that a sufficient place was cleared for her guests, and regalement prepared for the gentlefolk as well as the serfs, went round among the maskers with her spectacles on her nose, and a set smile, looking close into the faces of all, and not recognizing a single one. She neither recognized the Rostovs nor Dimmler, nor could she even distinguish her own daughters, or the masculine dressing gowns and uniforms which they had put on. "'And who is that one?' she asked of the Gouvernatka, and looking straight into the face of her daughter, who represented a Kassan Tatar." I think it must be one of the Rostovs. Well, and you, Mr. Hussar, what regiment do you serve in? she asked of Natasha. Give that Turk, yes, that Turk, some fruit cake, said she to the butler, who was serving the refreshments. It is not forbidden by their laws. Sometimes, looking at the strange but absurd pass performed by the dancers, who gave themselves up completely to the ideas that they were mumming, that no one would recognize them, and therefore felt no mock of modesty. Pelagea Danilovna would hide her face in her handkerchief, and her whole fat body would shake with the good-natured and uncontrollable laughter of old age. After they had performed the Plyaska, various korvads, and other Russian national dances, Pelagea Danilovna had all the serfs and the others together form into a great circle. A ring, a rope, and a ruble were brought, and they began to play various games. By the end of an hour the costumes began to show signs of wear and tear. The charcoal moustaches and eyebrows began to disappear from the sweaty, heated, jolly faces. 
Pelagaya Danilovna began to recognize the masqueraders and congratulate them on the skill with which they had made up their costumes and tell them how very becoming they were to the young ladies, and she thanked them all for having entertained her so well. The guests were invited into the drawing-room, and refreshments were provided in the ballroom for the serfs. "'No, but what a terrible thing to read your fortune in a bath!' exclaimed an old maid, who lived with the Malyukovs. "'Why so?' asked the oldest daughter of the family. They were now sitting down at supper. "'No, don't think of doing such a thing. It requires so much courage.' "'I would as just leaf, said Sonya. "'Tell us what happened to that young lady,' asked the second Malikova girl. "'Well, this was the way of it. "'A certain Varishna, said the old maid, "'took a cock, two plates, knives and forks, as the way is, "'and went and sat down. "'She sat there, and sat there, "'and suddenly she hears someone coming. "'A sledge drives up, with harness bells jingling. "'She listens. "'Someone is coming. "'Someone comes in.' absolutely in human form, just like an officer, and sits down with her where the second plate is set. "'Oh! oh!' screamed Natasha, rolling her eyes in horror. "'And how was it? How did he speak to her?' "'Yes, just like a man. Everything was just as it should have been, and he began to talk with her, and all she needed to do was to keep him talking till the cock crowed. But she got frightened. As soon as she got frightened and hid her face in her hands, then he clasped her in his arms. Luckily, just then, some maids came running in. "'Now, what is the good of frightening them so?' protested Pelagaya Danilovna. "'Mamasha, you yourself have had your fortune told,' exclaimed one of the daughters. "'How is it fortunes are told in a granary?' asked Sonya. "'Well, this is the way of it. You go into the granary and listen. It depends on what you hear. If there is any knocking or tapping, it is a bad sign.' But if the wheat drops, then it's for good, and it will come out all right. Mama, tell us what happened to you when you went to the granary. Pelagia Danilovna smiled. Oh, what's the use? And I have forgotten, said she. Besides, you wouldn't go, would you? Yes, I would go, too. Pelagia Danilovna, do let me. I certainly will go, said Sonya. Very well, then, if you are not afraid. Louisa Ivanovna, can I? asked Sonya of Madame Chasse. While they were playing the games with the ring, the rouble, and the rope, and now, while they were talking, Nikolai had not left Sonya's side, and looked at her from wholly new eyes. It seemed to him that this evening, thanks to that charcoal moustache, he, for the first time, knew her as she really was. In reality, Sonya, that evening, was merrier, livelier, and prettier than Nikolai had ever seen her before. Why, what a girl she is! "'And what an idiot I have been,' he said to himself, as he gazed into her gleaming eyes, and saw her radiantly happy and enthusiastic smile dimpling her cheeks under her moustache, and that look which he had never seen before. "'I'm not afraid of anything,' said Sonya. "'Can I start now?' She got up. She was told where the granary was, and how she must stand and listen, and make no noise. The servant brought her shuba. She flung it over her head, and gave a glance at Nikolai. "'How charming that girl is,' he said to himself. "'And what have I been thinking about all this time?' Sonya stepped out into the corridor on her way to the granary. Nikolai, making the excuse that he was too warm, hurried to the front steps. It was a fact. The crowd made the air in the rooms close. Out of doors it was as cold and still as ever. The moon was shining, except that it was brighter than before.' The brightness was so intense, and there were so many gleaming stars in the snow, that those on high were quite effaced, and one had no desire to look for them there. The sky was almost black and spoke of gloom. The terrestrial sky was white and gay. "'What an idiot I have been! What an idiot! Why have I waited so long?' mused Nikolai, and he sprang down the steps and turned to the corner of the house by the footpath that led back to the rear entrance. He knew that Sonya would come that way. Halfway along the path stood a great woodpile covered with snow and casting deep shadows. Across it and beyond it fell the shadows of the lindens, bare and old, weaving patterns on the snow and the path. The footpath led to the granary. The timber walls of the granary and its roofs, covered with snow, shone in the moonlight, like a palace made of precious stone. One of the park trees crackled in the frost, and then everything became absolutely still again. 
it seemed to nikolai as if his lungs breathed in not common air but the elixir of eternal youth and joy feet were heard stamping on the steps of the servant's entrance Someone was scraping the snow away from the lower step on which it had drifted, and then the voice of an old maid said, "'Straight ahead, straight ahead, right along this path, Baronishna. Only you must not look round.' "'I am not afraid,' replied Sonya's voice, and then toward Nikolai came Sonya's dainty feet, sliding and squeaking in her thin slippers. Sonya came along, all muffled up in her shuba, and it was not till she was within two paces of him that she saw him. It seemed to her also that he was different from what she had ever known him before, and that he had nothing of what always made her a bit afraid of him. He was in his feminine costume, with clustering locks, and wearing a blissful smile such as Sonya had never seen before. Sonya swiftly hurried to him. "'She's entirely different. Not at all the same,' thought Nikolai, as he looked into her face, all kindled by the moonlight. He put his arms under her shuba, which encircled her head, strained her to his heart, and kissed her lips, which still showed traces of the moustache, and had a faint odour of burnt cork. Sonya returned his kiss full on the lips, and putting up her slender hands laid them on both sides of his face. Sonya! Nicholas! That was all they said. They ran to the granary, and then they went back into the house by the doors through which they had come. End of chapter 11《Part Four, Chapter Twelve of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twelve. When they drove home from Pelagea Danilovna's, Natasha, who had seen and observed everything, made a redistribution of forces, so that Luisa Ivanovna and Dimmler went in the sledge with her, while Sonya and Nikolai and some of the maids drove together. Nikolai, feeling now no anxiety to take the lead, drove deliberately along the homeward road, and as he kept turning to look at Sonya, with the weird moonlight falling on her, he tried to discover in that all-transforming light the Sonya of the past from the Sonya of the moment, with her charcoal-penciled brows and moustache, the Sonya from whom he was determined never to be parted. As he looked at her, and remembered what she was, and what she had been, as he recalled that odour of the burnt cork, mingling so strangely in his consciousness of her kiss and as he gazed at the ground swiftly gliding by and at the glittering sky he felt that he was once more in the realm of enchantment sonya art thou comfortable he would occasionally ask yes would be sonya's answer and art thou when they were halfway home nikolai told the coachman to hold the horses and he ran back for a moment to natasha's sledge and leaned over the side natasha he whispered, in French, "'Do you know, I have made up my mind in regard to Sonya?' "'Have you told her yet?' asked Natasha, becoming all radiant with delight. "'Oh, how strange that moustache and those eyebrows make you look, Natasha! Are you glad?' "'Oh, I am so glad, so glad. I was beginning to grow angry with you. I have not told you so, but you haven't been treating her fairly. She is such a true-hearted girl, Nicholas. How glad I am!' I am often naughty, but I have reproached myself for being selfish in my happiness and not sharing it with Sonya, pursued Natasha. But now I am so glad, but you must go back to her. No, wait a moment. Fee, how absurd you do look, exclaimed Nikolai, still gazing at her, and in his sister also discovering something new and unusual and bewitchingly lovely, which he had never before noticed in her. Natasha, it's like enchantment, isn't it? Yes, replied she, you have done nobly. If ever I had seen her like this before, thought Nikolai, I should long ago have asked her advice, and what is more, should have followed it, and all would have been well. So you are glad, and I have done right, have I? Oh, yes, perfectly right. It was only a little while ago that I got vexed with Mamasha about this. Mamma said that she was trying to catch you. How could she say such a thing? I almost quarreled with Mamma and I will never allow anyone to say anything mean about her, because she is goodness itself. All right, then, is it? exclaimed Nikolai, giving another searching look at the expression of his sister's face, so as to be sure that she was in earnest. And then, with creaking boots, he jumped down from the runner, and ran to overtake his own sledge. And there still sat the same radiantly happy little Circassian, 
with moustache and gleaming eyes under her sable hood, and this Circassian was Sonya, and this Sonya was assuredly to be his happy and loving wife in the days to come. After they had reached home, and had told the countess how they had spent the time with the Melyukovs, the young girls went to their room. Without wiping off their burnt cork moustaches, they undressed, and sat together for a long time, talking about their happiness. They had much to say about their future married lives, and what friends their husbands would be, and how happy they should be. On Natasha's table stood dressing glasses, placed there early that evening by her maid, Nunyasha. But when will all this be? Never, I fear me. It would be too great happiness to come true, said Natasha, as she got up and went over to the mirrors. Sit down, Natasha. Maybe you will see him, said Sonya. Natasha lighted the candles and sat down. I see someone with a moustache, exclaimed Natasha, catching sight of her own face. You must not turn it into ridicule, Baryshnya, said Dunyasha. Natasha, with the help of Sonya and her maid, got into the proper position before the glass. Her face assumed a serious expression, and she remained silent. Long she sat there, looking at the row of waning candles in the mirror, wondering, as she remembered the heroines of stories she had heard, whether this mysterious twelfth night she should see her coffin, or whether she should see him, Prince Andrei, in the background of the dark and confused square of glass. But, as she was not ready to mistake the smallest spot or stain on the glass for the form of a coffin, or of a man, she saw nothing. Her eyes began to grow heavy, and she got up and left the mirror. "'How is it other people see things, and I never see anything?' she asked. "'Now you sit down, Sonya. Today, of course, you must look for yourself. But look for me, too,' said she. "'I have such terrible presentiments tonight.' Sonya sat down in front of the mirrors, arranged herself in the right position, and began to look. "'Now, Sofya Alexandrovna will surely see something,' whispered Dunyasha, but you are always making fun. Sonya overheard this, and heard Natasha reply, Yes, I know she will see something. She did last year, you remember. For three minutes all sat in silence. Of course she will, whispered Natasha, but she did not finish her sentence. Suddenly Sonya pushed the mirror back and covered her eyes with her hand. Ach, Natasha, she cried. Did you see something? Did you? What did you see? demanded Natasha, taking the mirror from her. Sonya had seen nothing. Her eyes were simply beginning to grow heavy, and she was just on the point of getting up when she heard Natasha beginning to say, Of course she will. She had no intention of deceiving either Dunyasha or Natasha, but it was stupid sitting there. She herself did not know how or why it was that the cry had escaped from her when she covered her eyes with her hand. Did you see him? demanded Natasha, seizing her by the arm. Yes. Wait, I— "'Saw him,' said Sonya, led by some unaccountable impulse, but not knowing which Natasha meant by him, Nikolai or Andre. "'But why should I not tell what I saw? Others have seen such things, and who can prove that I did or didn't see something?' was the thought that flashed through Sonya's mind. "'Yes, I saw him,' said she. "'How was it? Was he sitting or standing? How was it? Now, I saw. At first I could not see anything.' Then suddenly I got a glimpse of him, and he was lying down. "'Andre, lying down? Is he ill?' demanded Natasha, gazing at her friend with horror-stricken eyes. "'No. On the contrary, his face was cheerful, and he turned toward me.' At that instant it began to seem to her that she had seen what she was telling. "'Well, and then what, Sonya?' "'Then I did not see anything more, something blue and red.' "'Sonya, when will he come back?' When shall I see him? My God, how I tremble for him and for myself, and everything fills me with alarm, cried Natasha, and, paying no heed to the words of comfort spoken by Sonya, she got into bed, and long after the candles were put out, she lay there motionless, with wide open eyes, gazing at the frosty moonbeams flooding the icy window panes. End of chapter 12《Part Four, Chapter Thirteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Thirteen. 
Shortly after Twelfth Night, Nikolai confessed to his mother his love for Sonya, and announced his firm determination to make her his wife. The Countess, who had long before that remarked what was going on between the two young people, and who had been expecting this announcement, listened in silence to his words, and then coldly informed him that he might marry any one he pleased, but that neither she nor his father would countenance such a marriage. For the first time, Nikolai felt conscious that his mother was offended with him, that, notwithstanding all her love for him, she would not yield to him in this matter. With icy coldness, and without looking at her son, she sent for her husband, and when he came, she tried, in Nikolai's presence, to tell him, in a few chilling words, of what her son proposed to do. But she had not the necessary self-control. Tears of vexation sprang to her eyes, and she was compelled to leave the room. The old count tried feebly to reason with Nikolai, and begged him to give up his intention. Nikolai replied that he could not go back on his word, and the father, sighing, and evidently all upset in his mind, hastily put an end to the conference and went to the countess. In all his encounters with his son, the count always had the consciousness of his own blameworthiness towards him in regard to the squandering of his fortune, and, accordingly, he could not show his anger against his son for refusing to wed a rich wife and for choosing penniless Sonya. In all this affair, he remembered with the keener sorrow that, if only his estates had not been so ruined, it would be impossible for Nikolai to find a better wife, and that the only persons responsible for the wasting of this estate were himself and his Matenka and their incorrigible habits. The father and mother had nothing more to say to Nikolai in regard to this, but a few days later the countess summoned Sonya, and with a bitterness which no one in the world would have expected of her, she reproached her niece with having decoyed her son, and accused her of the blackest ingratitude. Sonya, in silence, and with downcast eyes, listened to the countess's bitter words, and was at a loss to know what was required of her. She was ready for any sacrifice for all of them, in return for their benefits. The thought of self-sacrifice was ever a delight to her, but, in this affair, she could not comprehend what she was required to sacrifice, or for what purpose. She could not help loving the countess, and all the Rostov family, nor could she help loving Nikolai, or knowing that his happiness depended on her love for him. She therefore stood silent and sad, and had nothing to reply. It seemed to Nikolai that he could not longer endure this state of things, and he went to his mother to have a final explanation. Nikolai first besought his mother to be reconciled to him and Sonya, and consent to their marriage. Then he threatened her that if they persecuted Sonya, he would instantly marry her clandestinely. The countess, with a coldness her son had never experienced before, replied that he was of age, that Prince Andrei was going to marry without his father's sanction, and that he might do the same, but that she would never receive this intrigantka as her daughter. Angry at her use of the term intrigantka, Nikolai raised his voice, and told his mother that he had never thought that she would oblige him to sacrifice his noblest feelings, and that if this were so, then he would never— but he did not finish uttering this rash vow, which, judging by the expression of his face, his mother awaited with horror, and which might have forever raised a cruel barrier between them. He did not utter it because Natasha, with a pale and solemn face, came into the room. She had been listening at the door. Nikolinka, you do not know what you are saying. Hush! Hush! I tell you, hush! She almost screamed, so as to drown his words. Mama, darling, there's no reason in this at all. Dushenka, Moya, dear heart, said she, turning still paler, and going to her mother, who felt that she was on the very edge of an abyss, and looked with horror at her son. And yet, by reason of her stubbornness, and the impulse of the quarrel, she would not, and could not give in. Nikolinka, I beg of you, go away. Go! And you, sweetheart mamma, listen, she entreated, turning again to her mother. Her words were incoherent, but they brought about the wished-for result. The countess, deeply flushed, buried her face in her daughter's bosom, and Nikolai got up, and, clasping his head between his hands, rushed out of the room. Natasha acted the part of peacemaker so well that Nikolai received a promise from his mother that Sonya should not be annoyed, and he himself swore that he would never do anything without the knowledge of his parents. With the firm intention of retiring from the service as soon as he could wind up his connection with his regiment and return and marry Sonya, Nikolai, melancholy and grave, 
still under strained relations with his parents but as it seemed to him passionately in love rejoined his regiment early in january after nikolai's departure it became sadder than ever in the house of the rostovs the countess owing to her mental tribulations was taken seriously ill sonya was depressed both on account of her separation from nikolai and still more on account of the unfriendly manner in which the countess in spite of herself treated her the count was more than ever occupied by the wretched state of his pecuniary affairs which demanded of him the most heroic measures it was absolutely necessary to dispose of their mansion in moscow and their podmoskovniana estate and in order to effectuate this sale it was essential to go to moscow but the state of the countess's health caused him to postpone his departure from day to day natasha who had easily and even cheerfully borne the first weeks of separation from her lover now every day grew more nervous and impatient the thought that she was wasting the best time of her life when she might so much better have been employing it in loving sacrifice for him constantly tormented her his letters generally merely served to annoy her it revolted her to think that when her life was nothing but a constant thought about him he was living in the great world of action seeing new places and new people who were full of interest to him the more fascinating his letters were the more they annoyed her her letters to him gave her no consolation they were nothing but tedious and hypocritical exercises she was not able to write freely because she could not realize the possibility of correctly expressing in a letter even the thousandth part of what she was accustomed to express with her voice her smile and her glance she wrote him perfunctory and monotonous letters the stupidity of which she herself acknowledged while her mother corrected in the rough draft the mistakes in spelling which she made the countess's health was still feeble but it was now no longer possible to put off the return to moscow it was necessary to arrange for the marriage settlement it was necessary to sell the mansion and moreover prince andrei was now expected in moscow where his father prince nikolai andreitch was spending the winter indeed natasha was certain that he had arrived already the countess remained in the country but the count taking sonya and natasha with him went to moscow toward the end of january end of chapter thirteen and this is the end of part four of volume two volume two part five chapter one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne part five chapter one pierre after the engagement of prince andrei and natasha suddenly without any apparent reason began to find it impossible to pursue his former mode of life firmly as he was convinced of the truths revealed by the benefactor delightful as had been the first period of enthusiasm for the inward labor of self-improvement to which he had given himself up with such zeal all the charm of this former existence suddenly vanished after the betrothal of his friends and after the death of iosif alexievitch intelligence of which he received about the same time nothing but the empty skeleton of life remained to him his mansion with that brilliant wife of his who was still enjoying the favors of an influential personage his acquaintance with all petersburg and his duties at court with all their tedious formalities all this life of his suddenly began to fill pierre with unexpected loathing he ceased to write in his diary he shunned the society of the brethren he began once more to frequent the club and to drink heavily he became intimate with the gay young bachelor set and his behaviour became such that the countess elena vasilievna found it necessary to give him a stern admonition pierre felt that she was right and in order not to compromise her he decided to go to moscow in moscow as soon as he set foot in his enormous house with the dried-up and withered princesses and the swarm of menials as soon as he went out into town and saw the iverskaya chapel with its innumerable tapers burning before the golden shrines and the square of the kremlin with its sheet of untrodden snow the izvoschek's and the hovels of the svitsev vrazek saw old muscovites who with never a desire or a quickening of the blood lived out their days the moscovite dances the moscovite ballrooms the moscovite english club he felt himself at home in a refuge of quiet life in moscow gave him the sensation of comfort and warmth and coziness 
that one has in an old and dirty dressing-gown. Pierre was welcomed by all Moscow society, young and old, as a long-expected guest, whose place was always ready for him and never given to another. In the eyes of Moscow society, Pierre was most kindly, good-natured, intelligent, and benevolent, though eccentric, absent-minded, but cordial, a thoroughgoing Russian baron, of the old stamp. His purse was always empty, because it was opened to all. Benefits, wretched pictures, statuary, benevolent societies, gypsies, schools, subscription dinners, drinking bouts, the masons, churches, books. No one and nothing ever met with a refusal from him. And if it had not been for two friends of his, who had borrowed large sums of him and now took him under their guardianship, he would have had absolutely nothing left. At the club, no dinner or reception was complete without him. As soon as he took his place on the ottoman, after a couple bottles of Margu, the members would gather round him and vie with each other in all sorts of gossip, discussions, and clever stories. If discussions degenerated into quarrels, he would restore peace by his kindly smile alone, or by a clever jest. The Masonic meetings were tedious and dull if he were absent. Often, after dining with his bachelor friends, he would yield with a genial and weakly smile to their entreaties and go with them where they went, and help the hilarious young fellows wake the echoes with their wild, enthusiastic shouts. At the balls he would never refuse to dance, if partners were scarce. Young matrons and young girls liked him because he was attentive, especially after dinner, to all alike, without making invidious distinctions. It was a common saying of him, Il est charmant. Il n'est pas de sex. Pierre had become simply a retired court chamberlain, good-naturedly vegetating in Moscow, like so many hundreds of others. How horror-struck he would have been if, seven years before, when he was just back from abroad, someone had told him that it was idle for him to seek out or invent a career. That the ruts in which he would move were long ago made for him, determined before the foundation of the world, and that, in spite of all his struggles, he should be what every one in his position was doomed to be. He would not have been able to believe this. Had he not, with all his heart, wished at one time that a republic should be established in Russia, then that he might be a Napoleon, then a philosopher, then a general, the conqueror of Napoleon, had he not seen the possibility, and wished to take part in the mighty task of regenerating depraved humanity and of bringing himself to the highest degree of improvement, had he not established schools and infirmaries, and emancipated his peasantry. But instead of what he had dreamed, lo, here he was the rich husband of an unfaithful wife, a court chamberlain retired, a gourmand and wine-bibber, and easily inclined to criticize the government, a member of the English club, and a flattered habitué of Moscow society. It was long before he could reconcile himself to the thought that he himself was a court chamberlain living in Moscow, the very type of which he should have so deeply despised seven years before. Sometimes he comforted himself with the thought that this mode of life was only temporary, but then he would be terrified by another thought of how many people, just like himself, with all their hair and their teeth still good, had entered temporarily into this mode of life, and into this club, and were now passing from it, bald and toothless. In moments of pride, when he thought over his position, it seemed to him that he was of an entirely different nature, distinct from these retired chamberlains, whom he used to despise, that they were insipid and stupid, contented and satisfied with their position. While I, on the contrary, am utterly dissatisfied, my sole desire is to do something for humanity, he would say to himself, in such moments of pride. But perhaps all these colleagues of mine are just like myself, and have been struggling and seeking to find some new and original path through life, and, like myself, have, by sheer force of circumstances, by the conditions of society and birth, that elemental force against which man is powerless, been brought into the same condition as myself. This he would say to himself in moments of humility, and, after he had lived in Moscow for some time, he ceased to despise his colleagues, the retired courtiers, and began to like them, and to esteem them, and to pity them, as he did himself. Pierre no longer suffered, as formerly, from moments of despair, hypochondria, and disgust of life. 
But the same disease, which formerly had been made manifest by occasional attacks, had struck inward, and not for a moment ceased its insidious working. For what end? Why? For what purpose were we created in the world? He would ask himself, in perplexity many times every day, in spite of himself, beginning to reason out some explanation of life but as he knew by experience that such questions as these must remain unanswered, he would strive in all haste to put them out of his mind, taking up a book, or going over to the club, or calling on Apollon Nikolaevich to talk over the gossip of the town. Elena Vysilyevna, whom no one ever cared for except for her body's sake, and who was one of the stupidest women in the world, said Pierre to himself, makes people believe that she is a woman of superior wit and refinement, and they bow down before her. Napoleon Bonaparte was despised by everyone until he became great, but since he has become a miserable comedian. The Emperor Franz is trying to make him take his daughter illegally for his wife. The Spaniards, through the Roman Catholic clergy, offered up prayers of thanksgiving to God for granting them a victory over the French on the 26th of June, while the French, through the medium of the same Catholic priesthood, offer up thanksgivings to the same God for having beaten the Spaniards on the 26th of June. My brethren, the Masons, solemnly swear that they will be ready to sacrifice all they possess for their neighbor, but when the box is passed around, they do not contribute a single ruble for the poor. And the Astria Lodge intrigues against the manna-seekers, and they toil and moil for the sake of getting a genuine Scotch carpet and charter, though the meaning of it is not known even by the one who copies it off and it is necessary to no one. All of us profess the Christian law of forgiveness of injuries and of love for our neighbor, a law in obedience to which we have erected here in Moscow eighty-score churches, while yesterday a deserter was flogged with a knout, and the priest, the servant of this same law of love and forgiveness, presented the crucifix for the soldier to kiss before he received his punishment. Thus mused Pierre, and this whole universal falsehood, which everybody acknowledges, amazed him every time he thought of it, just as though he were not used to it, just as though it were some new thing. I understand this falsehood and confusion, he thought, but how can I convince them of what I understand? I have made the experiment, and have always found that they, in the depths of their hearts, understand it just as I do, but they strive not to see it. Of course it must be so, but for me... What ought I to do? Pierre asked himself. He was undergoing the unhappy experience of many people, especially Russians, who have not only the faculty of seeing and realizing the possibility of goodness and right, but of seeing too clearly the falsity and deception of life to feel able to take any serious part in it. Every department of activity was, in his eyes, complicated with falsehood and deception. Whatever he had tried to be, Whatever he had tried to accomplish, he always found himself jostled by this knavery and falsehood, with his path of activity completely blocked. But, meantime, it was necessary for him to live, necessary for him to find occupation. It was too terrible for him to be under the weight of these unsolvable problems of life, and so he gave himself up to the first temptation in order to forget them. He frequented the society of all sorts and conditions of men. He drank deeply. He purchased paintings, he built houses, and chief of all, he read. He read, and read everything that came into his hands, and he was such an omnivorous reader that even when, on his return home, his valet came in to undress him, he continued his reading, and after reading till he was tired, he would fall asleep, and the next morning he would go to the club or call on acquaintances and talk gossip, and from there go to some wanton rout where wine and women served to occupy his mind, and thus around the circle again, from spree to reading, and then his idle gossip and wine. Strong drink was becoming for him constantly a greater and greater physical and even moral necessity. Although the doctors warned him that wine was dangerous to him, on account of his corpulency, he still continued to drink heavily. He felt perfectly happy only when, without knowing or caring how, he had poured down his capacious throat several glasses of wine, and begun to experience the pleasant warmth spreading through his frame, and good will toward all the human race, and a mental readiness superficially to touch upon any question without pretending to penetrate deeply into its inner nature. 
Only after he had drunk a bottle or two of wine would he vaguely feel that this complicated, terrible coil of life, which had formerly appalled him, was now not so appalling as it had seemed. With a roaring in his ears, as he idly chatted or listened to stories, or read his books after dinner or supper, he saw this tangle of doubts constantly facing him on every side. But it was only under the influence of wine that he could say to himself, This is nothing, I will put it away for the present, for I have an explanation already, but now is no time, I will think it all out by and by. This by and by never came. When his stomach was empty, the next morning all the former questions arose, just as unsolvable and terrible, and Pierre hastened to seize his book, and was delighted when any one came to call upon him. Sometimes Pierre remembered what he had heard of soldiers at war, that when they are lying idle under fire, they eagerly strive to invent some diversion, so as the more easily to forget the threatening danger. And it seemed to Pierre that all men were similar soldiers, distracting themselves from life some by ambition, others by cards, others by codifying laws, others by women, play, horses, some by politics, others by sport, by wine, by statecraft. There is nothing insignificant, there is nothing of great importance. All is the same in the end. Only how can I save myself from it, thought Pierre. Only by not seeing it, this terrible it. End of chapter 1 Part 5, Chapter 2 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 2 Early in the winter, Prince Nikolai Andreyevich Bolkonsky and his daughter took up their residence in Moscow. The fame of his past life, the keenness of his intellect, and his bold originality immediately caused him to be regarded by the Muscovites with special admiration and respect, and... As the popular enthusiasm for the Emperor Alexander's management of affairs had notoriously cooled off, and given place to an anti-French and nationalistic tendency, now all the vogue in Moscow, he had become the center of the opposition to the government. The prince had aged very considerably during the year past. He now began to manifest some of the acute symptoms of old age, unexpected naps, forgetfulness of recent events and vivid remembrance of those long past, and the childish vanity with which he accepted the role of chief of the Muscovite opposition. Nevertheless, when the old prince came down to evening tea, in his fur shubka and powdered wig, and at anyone's instigation began to tell his pithy anecdotes about the days gone by, or deliver his still pithier and harsher judgments upon the present, he inspired in all his guests a single feeling of sincere respect. In the eyes of visitors, the old-fashioned house, with its huge pier-glasses, its anti-revolutionary furniture, its powdered lackeys, presided over by this severe and intelligent old man of a past generation, with his gentle daughter and the pretty Frenchwoman, who treated him with such deference, presented an impressive but agreeable spectacle. But these visitors did not realize that, over and above the two or three hours when they saw the household, there were twenty-two more each day, during which the inner life of the house went on unseen. This inner life had recently, especially during their stay in Moscow, become exceedingly trying for the Princess Maria. In Moscow she was deprived of her dearest pleasures, the visits from her pilgrims, and the solitude which gave her such consolation at Louisa Gurie. She could find no comfort or joy in the crowded city, she did not go into society. Everybody knew that her father would not allow her to go without him, and his health was too precarious to permit him to go out, and consequently she received no invitations to dinner parties or balls. She had renounced all hope of ever getting married. She had too often witnessed the coldness and irritability with which he received and dismissed such young men as occasionally came to their house, and who might have been her suitors. The Princess Maria had no friends, since her arrival in Moscow, her eyes had been opened in regard to the two who had been more intimate with her than all the rest. Mademoiselle Burine, in whom, even in times past, she could not feel perfect confidence, had now become positively disagreeable to her, and for several reasons she felt obliged to hold her at a distance. Julie, with whom she had kept up an uninterrupted correspondence for five years, was in Moscow, but she seemed like an utter stranger to her when they met again face to face. 
Julie, by the death of her brothers, had become one of the wealthiest girls in Moscow, and was completely absorbed in the pleasures of fashionable society. She was surrounded by young men, who, she said to herself, had suddenly awakened to the appreciation of her merits. She found herself now rapidly growing old, and felt that her last chance of finding a husband was passing, and that now or never her fate must be decided. The Princess Maria, with a melancholy smile, remembered, as each Thursday came round, that now she had no one to write to, since Julie, whose presence gave her no delight, was in town, and she could see her every week. She, like the old French émigré, who refused to marry the lady at whose house he had spent all his evenings for a number of years, was sorry that Julie was so near, because now she should have no one to write to. She had no one in Moscow to whom she could confide her sorrows, and since coming there these sorrows had increased and multiplied. The time for Prince Andrei's return and for his marriage was drawing nigh, but his father seemed no more inclined than before to listen to his entreaties and sanction it. On the contrary, he would hear nothing to it, and the mere mention of the Countess Rostova drove the old prince beside himself. As it was, he was in a bad temper the greater part of the time. The Princess Maria had a new and additional trial, at this time, in the lessons which she gave her six-year-old nephew. In her treatment of Nikolushka, she recognized with dismay that she was liable to fits of irritability similar to her father's. No matter how many times she reproached herself for losing her temper during his lesson hours, it happened almost every time when she sat down with the pointer to teach him his French alphabet, that from her very desire to help him along as rapidly as possible, to make his tasks easy and give the little fellow all the superfluity of her own knowledge, the slightest inattention on the part of the little boy, who was afraid, to begin with, of an outbreak of his aunt's irascibility, would make her tremble with indignation, lose her patience, grow angry and raise her voice, and sometimes even seize him by the arm and stand him in the corner. After doing this, she would begin to shed tears over her hasty temper, her ugly nature, and Nikolushka, sobbing out of sympathy, would leave his corner without permission, run up to her, and pull her tear-wet hands from her face and try to comfort her. But by far the greatest trial of all was caused the princess by her father's irritability, which was always vented upon his daughter, and which of late became even cruelty. If he had compelled her to do penance all night long with prayers and genuflections, if he had struck her, if he had compelled her to draw wood and water, it would have never occurred to her that her position was hard. But this loving tyrant, all the more terrible from the very fact that he loved her, and therefore tormented both himself and her, took especial pains not only to insult and humiliate her, but to make her feel that she was always and forever in the wrong and latterly he discovered a new whim, which tormented the Princess Maria more than all else put together. This was his constantly increasing friendship for Mademoiselle Burine. First suggested to his maid by the news of Prince Andrei's engagement, the farcical notion that, if his son were going to marry, then he would marry Burine, evidently flattered his fancy, and of late he had stubbornly lavished especial attentions on the Frenchwoman, for the special purpose, as it seemed to the Princess Maria, of affronting herself, and of expressing his disapprobation of his daughter by making love to Burine. In Moscow, on one occasion, when the Princess Maria was present, it seemed to her that her father chose that time on purpose. The old prince kissed Mademoiselle Burine's hand, and, drawing her to him, embraced and fondled her. The Princess Maria flushed with anger and left the room. After a few moments Mademoiselle Burine rejoined her, smiling, and began to tell some entertaining story in her agreeable voice. The Princess Maria hastily wiped away her tears, went with decided steps straight to Burine, and, evidently not knowing what she was doing, began to shout at the Frenchman in furious haste and with explosive accents. It is shameful, contemptible, beastly, to take advantage of a man's weakness. She did not conclude her sentence. Leave my room, she fairly screamed, and then burst into tears again. The following day, the prince said not a word to his daughter, but she observed that at dinner he ordered Mademoiselle Burine to be served in precedence of all others. At the end of the dinner, when the butler, according to his usual custom, handed the coffee round, serving the princess first, the old prince suddenly flew into a passion, flung his cane at Philip, and instantly gave orders that he should be sent to serve as a soldier. "'You didn't obey me! Twice I told you! You didn't obey me!' 
she's the first person in this house she is my best friend screamed the prince and if you he added in a perfect fury for the first time addressing his daughter if you permit yourself if you dare another time as you did this evening to forget your duty before her then i will show you who is master of this house away with you out of my sight here beg her pardon the princess maria begged emily Birine's pardon and then interceded with her father for the butler philip at such moments there rose in the princess maria's soul a feeling like the pride of an immolated victim and then again at such moments this father whom she blamed would either search for his spectacles not seeing them when they were close at hand or would forget what had only just happened or would stagger along on weakening limbs glancing lest any one should have seen his feebleness or what was worse than all after dinner when there were no guests to keep him awake would suddenly fall into a doze dropping his napkin and nodding his head over his plate he is old and feeble and do i dare to judge him she would think at such moments with revulsion of feeling and disgust at herself end of chapter two Part Five, Chapter Three of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Three. In eighteen eleven, there was living in Moscow a French doctor, Metivier, a handsome man of gigantic frame, amiable after the manner of his nation, and, as was said by every one, a physician of extraordinary skill. He had rapidly become fashionable and was received in the houses of the highest aristocracy not merely as a doctor but as an equal prince nikolai andreitch who had always scoffed at medical science had lately by mademoiselle burine's advice consulted this doctor and soon became accustomed to him metivier used to visit him twice a week on the sixth of december o s saint nicholas's day all moscow called at the prince's door but he gave orders to admit no one he commanded however that a select few whose names he handed to the princess maria should be bidden to dinner metivier came that morning with his congratulations and in his capacity of physician took it upon him to violate the orders de force la consigne as he expressed it to the princess maria and he went in to see the prince it chanced that this morning the old prince was in one of his most detestable moods the whole morning he wandered up and down the house finding fault with every one and pretending not to understand anything that was said to him and that they would not understand him the princess maria knew only too well that this mood betokened a latent and persistent querulousness that was certain to flash out in a tempest of fury and all that morning the prince's name-day she expected the outbreak which was sure to go off as a loaded musket at full cock until the doctor's arrival the morning passed in comparative serenity having admitted the doctor the princess maria took her book and sat down in the drawing-room near a door where she could hear all that was going on in the prince's cabinet at first she only heard metivier's voice then her father's then both voices speaking at once then the door opened and the dark-haired metivier appeared on the threshold his handsome face expressing alarm followed by the prince in his nightcap and dressing-gown his face distorted with passion, and the pupils of his eyes dilated. "'Haven't you any wits?' screamed the prince. "'Well, I have. You slave of Bonaparte! You spy! Out of my house! Get out, I tell you!' And he slammed the door. Metivier, shrugging his shoulders, went to Mademoiselle Birine, who, on hearing the loud voices, had rushed in from the adjoining room. "'The prince is not very well.' bilious and cerebral congestion i will come in again to-morrow don't be worried said metivier and laying his fingers on his lips he hastened out the prince was heard walking up and down in his room in his slippers and shouting spies traitors traitors everywhere not a moment's peace even in my own house after metivier's departure the old prince summoned his daughter to him and the whole brunt of his fury fell upon her she was to blame for admitting spies into his presence why he had told her said he that she was to write down a list and not to admit any one who was not on that list why then had she admitted this scoundrel it was all her fault he could not have a moment's rest with her not even die in peace said he no matushka 
You might as well make up your mind to it. We must part. We must part. I can't stand this sort of thing any more, he exclaimed, and left the room. And then, as though fearing that she might not understand how thoroughly his mind was made up, he came back to her, and, endeavoring to assume an expression of calmness, he added, And don't you for a moment imagine that I say this to you in passion. No, I am perfectly calm, and I have made up my mind after full deliberation, and it shall be. We must part. Find a home somewhere else but he could not restrain himself, and, with a flash of indignation possible only to one who loves, he, though evidently suffering himself, shook his fist in her face and screamed, "'And why on earth hasn't some idiot taken her for his wife?' He slammed the door after him, and Mademoiselle Burine called to him, and quiet reigned in his cabinet. At two o'clock the six persons invited to dinner arrived. These guests, the distinguished Count Rostovchin, Prince Lupukhin and his nephew, General Chatrov, an old companion in arms of the princes, and for young men, Pierre, and Boris Dubretskoy, were waiting for him in the drawing-room. Having recently come to Moscow on leave of absence, Boris had been anxious to make the acquaintance of Prince Nikolai Andreitch, and he had so far succeeded in winning his good graces that the prince made an exception in his case and received him in spite of his being an eligible young bachelor. The prince's house was not what one calls fashionable, but it was the centre of a small circle which, though it made little noise in the city, gave a more flattering distinction than any other to those who were admitted to it. This was made evident to Boris a week before, when he overheard Rostopchin tell the governor-general of the city, who invited him to dinner on St. Nicholas's Day, that it was impossible. On that day I always go and worship the relics of Prince Nikolai Andreitch. Oh, yes, yes, replied the governor-general. How is he? The little company gathered before dinner in the old-fashioned, high-studded drawing-room, with its ancient furniture, was like the gathering of a solemn court of justice. No one had much to say, and if they spoke it was in low tones. Prince Nikolai Andreitch came in, silent and preoccupied. The Princess Maria seemed even more quiet and timid than usual. The guests took no pains to talk with her, for they saw that she was not attending to what they said. Count Rostopchin was the only one who kept up the thread of conversation, speaking now of the latest news in the city, and now of politics in general. Lupopkin and the old general rarely took any share in it. Prince Nikolai Andreitch listened, as a superior judge listens to a report presented to him, only by his significant silence, or by some curt monosyllable now and then, showing that he followed the drift of what was said. The tone of the conversation made it evident that no one took any satisfaction in what was going on in the political world. They spoke of recent events as though they were convinced that everything was going from bad to worse. But in all their anecdotes and criticisms it was noticeable how each speaker came to a stop, or was brought to a stop, every time at that borderland where there was any possibility of personal reflections on His Majesty, the Emperor. The conversation at dinner turned on the most recent political news, the seizure by Napoleon of the possessions of the Duke of Oldenburg and the Russian note, hostile to Napoleon, which had been dispatched to all the courts throughout Europe. Bonaparte treats Europe as a pirate treats the ships he has captured, said Count Rostopchin, repeating an epigram that he had already got off a number of times before. You can only marvel at the forbearance or blindness of the sovereigns. Now it is the Pope's turn, and Bonaparte is calmly proceeding to humiliate the head of the Catholic religion, and not a voice is raised in protest. Our sovereign is the only one who protests against the occupation of the Duchy of Oldenburg, but then Count Rostopchin came to a pause, conscious of having reached that point where criticism was impossible. He was offered other positions instead of Oldenburg, said Prince Nikolai Andreitch. Just as I transfer peasants from Luisia Guriai to Bogucharovo, or to my Raisin estates, he does with dukes. The Duke of Oldenburg shows great force of character and bears his misfortune with admirable resignation, said Boris, modestly joining the conversation. He made this remark because on his way from Petersburg he had been honored with an introduction to the Duke. Prince Nikolai Andreitch gave the young man a look, as though he had it in his mind to make some reply to this, but checked himself, feeling that Boris was too young for him to waste his sarcasm upon. I have read our protest in regard to the Oldenburg affair, and was amazed at the bad style in which it was written, said Count Rostopchin, in the easy-going tone of a man who knows perfectly well what he is talking about. 
Pierre looked at Rostopchin in naive amazement, unable to comprehend why he should be disturbed at the wretched style of the note. "'What difference does it make how the note was written, Count, provided the subject matter is vigorous?' said he. "'My dear fellow, I think, with our army of five hundred thousand men, it might just as well have been couched in a good style,' said Count Rostopchin. Pierre understood now why Count Rostopchin was disturbed by the wretched writing of the note. "'It seems to me there's a plentiful crop of penny-aligners nowadays,' said the old prince. "'Yonder in Petersburg everybody is writing not only notes, but new laws, all the time. "'My Andrusia has been scribbling a whole volume of laws for Russia there. "'Today everybody is scribbling,' and he laughed unnaturally. "'The conversation languished for a moment. "'Then the old general called attention to himself by a preliminary cough. "'Have you heard of what took place recently at a review at Petersburg, "'how the new French ambassador acted?' "'What was that?' "'Yes, I heard something about it. "'He made a very awkward remark in His Majesty's presence, I believe. "'His Majesty called attention to the division of grenadiers "'and their splendid marching,' pursued General Chartoff. "'But it seems the ambassador showed absolute indifference "'and permitted himself to say that at home in France "'they did not waste their time on such trivialities. "'The sovereign did not deign to give him any answer, "'but they say that at the subsequent review "'he did not say a word to him. "'All were silent,' It was out of the question to make any comment on this occurrence, since it concerned the monarch personally. "'Insolent wretches!' exclaimed the prince. "'Do you know Metivier? I showed him out of the house today. He came and was admitted, although I had given special orders to admit no one,' said the prince, with an angry look at his daughter. And then he repeated his whole conversation with the French doctor, and gave the reasons that made him think Metivier a spy." Though these reasons were inconclusive and obscure, no one made any criticism. After the roast, the champagne was handed around. The guests rose to their feet, offering the old prince their congratulations. The princess Maria also went round to him. He gave her a cold, angry look, and put up his wrinkled, clean-shaven cheek for her to kiss. The whole expression of his face told her that their conversation of the morning had not been forgotten, that his mind was just as fully made up and that only the presence of his guests prevented him from saying the same thing over again. When they went into the drawing-room for coffee, the older members of the company sat down together. Prince Nikolai Andreyevich grew more animated and expressed his mind freely in regard to the war than just beginning. He declared that our wars with Bonaparte had hitherto been unsuccessful and would be so long as we tried to make common cause with the Germans and meddle with European affairs as we were compelled to do by the presence of Tilsit. There was no sense in our battling either for or against Austria. Our policy lay in the east, and, as far as Bonaparte was concerned, we required only one thing, to protect our frontier, to have some firmness in our policy, and never let him dare to cross our Russian frontier, as he did in 1807. "'And how is it possible for us to fight against the French, Prince?' asked Count Rostopchin. "'Can we take up arms against our teachers, our gods? Look at our young men, look at our young ladies!' Our gods are the French. Our kingdom of heaven is Paris. He had raised his voice, evidently so that all might hear him. Our costumes are French. Our ideas are French. Our sentiments are French. You put out Metivier because he is a Frenchman, a good-for-nothing fellow. But our ladies grovel before him on their very knees. And last evening, at a party, out of the five ladies, three were Roman Catholics, and these were working on canvas embroidery on Sunday, by virtue of a dispensation from the Pope. And there they sat, almost naked for all the world like signboards for a public bathhouse, if I may be allowed the expression. Ugh! When I look at our young dandies, Prince, I feel inclined to take the cudgel of Peter the Great from the museum, and break the ribs for them in good old Russian style. That would put an end to all their whimsies. All were silent, the old prince, with a smile on his face, looked at Rostopchin, and nodded his head in assent. "'Well, Prince Chetty, good-bye. Your illustriousness, take care of your health,' said Rostopchin, rising with the abrupt motions characteristic of him and offering his hand. "'Good-bye, my dear. You're like a lute. I always like to hear you,' said the old prince, lying his hand on his arm and offering his cheek for a kiss. The others also got up with Rostopchin. End of chapter 3 
Part Five, Chapter Four of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Four. Princess Maria, as she sat in the drawing room and listened to the conversation and criticisms of the old men, understood nothing of what she heard. Her sole preoccupation was whether these guests had remarked the ill will that her father showed toward her. She had not even noticed the peculiar attentions and civilities showed her all throughout the dinner hour by Drubetskoy, who was now making his third visit to the house. The princess, with a strangely abstracted and questioning glance, turned to Pierre, who, hat in hand and with a smiling face, was the last of the guests to come and pay her his parting respects after the old prince had retired. Thus it happened that the two were left together in the drawing-room. "'May I stay a little longer?' he asked, suiting his action to the word, by depositing his corpulent frame on an easy chair near the Princess Maria. "'Oh, yes, certainly,' replied she. Her glance seemed to ask, "'Have you remarked anything unusual?' Pierre was now in a happy after-dinner frame of mind. He gazed musingly straight forward and smiled gently. "'Have you known that young man long, Princess?' he asked. "'What young man?' Drubetskoy. "'No, not very long. "'Well, do you like him?' "'Yes, he is a pleasant young fellow. "'Why do you ask?' said the princess, "'her mind still on her morning's conversation with her father. "'Because I have made a discovery. "'The young man has come on leave of absence from Petersburg "'with the sole and special purpose of marrying a rich wife.' "'You have made that discovery?' exclaimed the princess Maria. "'Yes,' pursued Pierre, with a smile. "'And this young man so manages it "'that where the rich girls are gathered together, "'there he also is to be found.' He is now undecided which to attack, you, or Mademoiselle Julie Karagina. Il est très assidu, au près d'elle. Yes, he's very attentive to her. He goes there, then? Yes, very often. And do you know the new way of making love? inquired Pierre, with a cheery smile, evidently lapsing into that jolly spirit of good-humoured ridicule for which he so often had reproached himself in his diary. No, replied the princess. In these days, in order to please the young ladies of Moscow, il fait être melancolique, et il est très melancolique auprès de Mademoiselle Caragarine, said Pierre. Really, exclaimed the princess, gazing into Pierre's good face, and persistently thinking about her trials. It would be so much easier, she thought, if I could only make up my mind to confide in some one all my thoughts and feelings, and I should like especially to tell Pierre everything. He is so good and noble. It would certainly be easier for me. He would give me his advice. "'Would you marry him?' asked Pierre. "'Oh, good gracious, Count! There are times when I would marry anyone,' suddenly exclaimed the Princess Maria, unexpectedly to herself, and with tears in her voice. "'Ugh! How hard it is to love a near kinsman, and feel that—' "'No matter, though,' she went on to say, with trembling voice— you cannot do anything for him but only annoy him, and when you know that you cannot help things otherwise, then there is only one thing, only one thing to do, to go away. But where could I go? What is it? What is the matter with you, princess? But the princess, without being able longer to control herself, burst into tears. I don't know what is the matter with me today. Do not criticize me. Forget what I have said to you. All Pierre's gaiety was gone. He anxiously questioned the princess, begging her to tell him everything, to confide her trials to him, but her only reply was to beseech him to forget what she had said, that she herself did not remember what she had said, and that she had no trials except the one which he knew about already, that Prince Andrei's marriage threatened to bring about a quarrel between her father and brother. "'Have you heard anything about the Rostovs?' she asked, for the purpose of diverting the conversation. "'I am told that they will be here soon.' Andre, also, I am expecting any day. I should have liked for them to meet here. And how does he look upon the matter now? asked Pierre, meaning by the pronoun the old prince, her father. The princess Maria shook her head. But what is to be done? The year will be up now in a few months, and this can never be. I only wish I could spare my brother the first minutes. I wish the Rostovs would come very soon. I hope to make their acquaintance. "'You have known them for a long time, have you not?' asked the Princess Maria. "'Tell me, with your hand on your heart, 
exactly the honest truth. What kind of a girl is she, and how do you like her? I want the whole truth, because Andre, you know, takes such a tremendous risk in doing this against his father's will, that I should like to know just how it is. A dull instinct told Pierre that in this repeated demand to hear the whole truth was betrayed the Princess Maria's ill will toward her prospective sister-in-law, and that she had an idea that Pierre would not approve of Prince Andre's choice, but Pierre told her not so much what he thought as felt. "'I don't know how to answer your question,' he said, reddening without any reason. "'I really don't know what kind of a girl she is. I can never analyze her. She is fascinating. But what makes her so, I can't tell you. That is all I can say in regard to her.' The Princess Maria sighed, and the expression of her face said, "'Yes, that is what I expected and feared.' "'Is she intellectual?' asked the princess. Pierre deliberated. "'I think not,' said he. "'But perhaps she is. "'She does not think it necessary to be intellectual. "'But, on the other hand, she is fascinating, no one more so.' The princess Maria again shook her head disapprovingly. "'Ugh! How I hope that I shall love her! "'You tell her so if you see her before I do.' "'I hear that they will be here in a few days,' said Pierre." The Princess Maria confided to Pierre her plan for making the acquaintance of her prospective sister-in-law as soon as she came to Moscow, and then trying to reconcile the old prince to her. End of chapter 4 Part 5, Chapter 5 of War and Peace by Lil Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Chapter 5 Boris had not succeeded in making a match with any of the rich Petersburg heiresses, and he had gone to Moscow with the same object in view. There he found himself undecided between two of the wealthiest girls in town, Julie and the Princess Maria. Although the Princess Maria, in spite of her plain features, seemed to him more attractive than Julie Karagina, there were difficulties in the way of paying his addresses to Bolkonsky's daughter. At his last meeting with her, on the old prince's name day, she had replied to all his tentative remarks on the subject of the feelings so at haphazard that it was evident that she had not heard what he said. Julie, on the other hand, received his attentions only too gladly, though in a way peculiar to herself alone. Julie was twenty-seven. After the death of her brother, she had become very rich. She was now very far from being a beauty, but she had conceived the idea that not only was she as pretty but far more captivating than she had ever been before. In this illusion she was sustained by the facts that, in the first place, she had become a very rich maiden, and, in the second place, as she grew older and older, men found her less dangerous, and were able to gather round her with more freedom, since they felt that they were not incurring any obligations in taking advantages of the suppers, receptions, and jolly society in general that frequented her house. Men who ten years before would have thought a second time about going every day to a house where there was a young girl of seventeen, lest they should compromise her and get entangled themselves, now unhesitatingly appeared there daily, and treated her not as a marriageable damsel, but as an acquaintance, irrespective of sex. The Karagans, that winter, entertained more pleasantly and hospitably than anyone else in Moscow. Besides the formal receptions and state dinners, they every day entertained a numerous society, especially of men, who ate supper at midnight and broke up at three o'clock in the morning. Nor was Julie willing to miss a ball, an entertainment, or a new play at the theatre. Her toilettes were always in the height of the fashion. But, nevertheless, Julie pretended to be disenchanted with all life. She told everybody that she had no belief in friendship or in love, or in any of the pleasures of this world, and hoped for peace only yonder. She affected the tone of a maiden who has endured great disappointment, of one, for instance, who had been disappointed in the man she loved, or cruelly deceived in him. Although nothing of the sort had ever happened to her, it began to be thought that such was the case, and she herself came to believe that her sufferings in life had been grievous. This melancholia did not stand in the way of her enjoying herself, or prevent the young men who came to her house from having a delightful time there. Every guest who went there paid his tribute to his hostess's melancholic mood, and then fell to talking about the things of this world, and dancing, and intellectual games, and the capping of verses, or borim, which were greatly in vogue at the Kerrigans. 
Some few of the young men, Boris among them, took a deeper interest in Julie's melancholy moods, and with these young men she had longer and more confidential conversations about the vanity of all things terrestrial, and she showed them her albums, filled with gloomy drawings, apothems, and couplets. Julie treated Boris with a special favor. She mourned with him over his lost illusions. She offered him those consolations of friendship which she was so well able to offer, having herself suffered so much in life. She also showed him her album. Boris made a sketch of two trees with the legend, O solitary trees, your dark boughs scatter down upon me gloom and melancholy. On another page he drew a picture of a tomb and wrote, Tis death that gives us succor, death that gives us peace. Alas, tis then alone that earthly sorrows cease. Julie declared that couplet to be charming. There's something so ravishing in the smile of melancholy, said she to Boris, quoting, word for word, a passage from a book she was reading. Tis a ray of light falling in darkness, a shadow's difference between sorrow and despair, affording the hope of coming consolation. Whereupon Boris wrote for her these lines. Oh, poisoned ailment of souls too sensitive, thou that alone doth make it sweet for me to live, mild melancholy, come, thy consolation bring, the torments of my gloomy solitude, O oh, calm, mingle thy secret soothing balm with tears that never cease to spring. Julie played on her harp, for Boris, her most melancholy nocturnes. Boris read aloud to her, poor Liza, and more than once had to pause in his reading because of the emotion which overmastered him. When they met in society, Julie and Boris exchanged glances to signify that they were the only people in the world capable of understanding and appreciating each other. Anna Mikhailovna, who was a frequent visitor at the Karagins, and always managed to be a partner with Julie's mother, took a special pains to procure all possible information in regard to Julie's fortune, which consisted of two estates in the vicinity of Penza and forest lands near Nizhny Novgorod. Anna Mikhailovna, with humble dependence on the will of Providence and with deep emotion, looked upon the etherealized melancholy which served as a bond between her son and the wealthy Julie. Toujours charmante et melancolique, cette chère Julie, she would say to the daughter. Boris says that here in your house he finds rest for his soul. He has suffered the loss of so many illusions, and he is so sensitive, she would say to the mother. Ah, my dear, I cannot tell you how devoted I am to Julie of late, she would say to her son. And who could help loving her? She is such a celestial creature. Ah, Boris, Boris, she was silent for a minute. And how sorry I am for her maman, she went on to say. Today she was showing me her accounts and letters from Penza, where they have colossal estates, and it is so trying for her to have no one to help her. They cheat her so. Boris's face wore an almost imperceptible smile as he listened to his mother's words. He was quietly amused at her transparent shrewdness, but he listened to her and sometimes asked her questions in regard to these Frenzensk and Nitegorodsky properties. Julie had for some time been looking for a proposal from her melancholy-souled adorer, and she was ready to accept him, but some secret antipathy toward her, a distaste of her evident desire to get married and of her affections, and a feeling of horror at thus practically repudiating the bliss of true love, still kept Boris at a distance. His leave of absence was now drawing to a close. He spent long hours, and every Sunday, at the Kerrigan's, and every day, when he came to think the matter over, he would decide that his proposal should take place on the morrow. But when he was in Julie's company, and saw her red face and chin, almost always dusted with powder, her moist eyes and the expression of her face, which seemed ready, at a moment's notice, to fly from melancholy to the equally natural enthusiasm and rapture of wedded bliss, Boris could not bring himself to utter the decisive words, although in his imagination he had for some time looked upon himself as the prospective master of the Kerrigan estates, and had many times overspent the income arising therefrom. Julie noticed Boris's infirmity of purpose, and it sometimes occurred to her that he had an antipathy for her, but her feminine vanity quickly restored her confidence, and she would assure herself that it was merely his love that made him so bashful. Her melancholia, however, was beginning to change into vexation, and a short time before the time of Boris's departure she was thinking of adopting some decisive plan. 
Just before Boris's leave of absence drew to a close, Anatole Kurigan made his appearance in Moscow, and, as a matter of course, in the Kurigan's drawing-room. And Julie, abruptly arousing from her melancholy, became very cheerful and manifested great friendliness toward Kurigan. Mon cher, said Anna Mikhailovna to her son, I know on good authority that Prince Vasily has sent his son to Moscow to make a match with Julie. I am so fond of Julie that I should be very sorry for her. What do you think about it, my dear? asked Anna Mikhailovna. Boris was thoroughly humiliated at the thought of being left out in the cold and of having wasted his whole month in arduous, melancholic service of Julie and of seeing another man, especially such an idiot as Anatole, having control of that income from the Prinzensk estates, which he was already, in his imagination, enjoying and profiting by. He went to the Kerrigans with a full determination to offer himself. Julie met him with a gay and careless mien, giving him a merry account of what a good time she had enjoyed at the ball the evening before, and asked him when he was going back. In spite of the fact that Boris had come with the intention of confessing his love, and had, therefore, decided to be tenderly sentimental, he immediately began, in a tone of irritation, to complain of women's inconstancy, pointing out how easy it was for women to shift from gloom to glee, and that their moods depended wholly upon the one who happened to be dancing attendance upon them. Julie took offence at this, and declared that he was right, that women needed variety, and nothing was more annoying to any one than to have a perpetual sameness. "'Then I should advise you,' began Boris, with the intention of winging a sharp retort, but at that instant came the humiliating thought that he was on the point of leaving Moscow without attaining his wished-for end, and at the cost of wasted labour, a thing to which he was unaccustomed. He paused in the middle of his sentence, dropped his eyes to avoid seeing the look of disagreeable annoyance and indecision on her face, and said, "'However, it was not at all for the purpose of quarrelling with you that I came here. On the contrary,' he looked at her to see whether she would encourage him to proceed." All expression of annoyance had suddenly vanished, and her restless, imploring eyes were fixed upon him with greedy expectation. "'I can always manage so as to keep out of her way,' thought Boris. "'Here I am for it. Might as well finish.' He flushed crimson, raised his eyes to hers, and said, "'You know my sentiments toward you.' There was no need of saying more. Julie's face had become radiant with triumph and satisfaction." but she compelled Boris to tell her all that was customary to say in such circumstances, to tell her that he loved her, and that he had never loved anyone else so passionately. She knew that, in exchange for her Penzensk estates and Nizhogorodsky forests, she had a right to exact this, and she obtained what she wished. The young couple, with no further thoughts of solitary trees shedding gloom and melancholy, laid their plans for the future establishment of a magnificent home in Petersburg, made calls, and got everything ready for a brilliant wedding. End of chapter 5Part 5, Chapter 6 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 6 Count Ilya Andreevich, together with Natasha and Sonya, arrived in Moscow toward the end of January. The countess was still ailing and was unable to travel, but it was out of the question to wait for her recovery. Prince Andrei was expected in Moscow every day, and, besides, it was important to purchase Natasha's wedding outfit. It was necessary to sell the Podmotskovnaya estate, and it was necessary to take advantage of the old prince's presence in Moscow in order that he might become acquainted with his future daughter-in-law. The Rostovs' Moscow house had not been warmed. Besides, they were to be in town for only a short time, and the countess was not with them. Accordingly, Ilya Andreitch decided to accept the hospitality of Maria Dmitrievna Akrovzimova, who had long ago urged them to come to her. Late one evening, the four coaches on runners, conveying the Rostovs, drove into Maria Dmitrievna's courtyard on the old Knyushinia Street. Maria Dmitrievna lived alone. Her daughter was married. All of her sons were in the government service. She was just as erect as ever. Her words were as much to the point. She always expressed her opinion to everyone in a loud and decided voice, and her whole personality seemed to be a living reproach against all weaknesses, passions, and impulses, the necessity of which she utterly denied. 
from early morning dressed in her jacket she gave personal attention to the domestic arrangements and then went out for a drive if it were a holy day to mass and thence to the prisons and jails where she had business that she never mentioned to any one on ordinary days on finishing her toilet she received applicants of every rank and condition who chanced to come to her door her charities having been dispensed she dined and this abundant and well-ordered meal was always shared by three or four guests after dinner she made up a table for boston late in the evening she had newspapers or some new book read aloud to her while she sat with her knitting she rarely accepted invitations and if she ever made any exceptions it was only in favor of the most important personages of the city she had not yet retired when the rostovs arrived as the door into the hall creaked on its hinges and admitted the travellers and their retinue of servants together with a rush of cold air marya dmitrievna with her spectacles toward the end of her nose came and stood in the doorway her head erect and gazed at the visitors with a stern and solemn face one might have thought that she was really angry and was about to turn the intruders out if she had not been heard at that very instant to give the most urgent orders in regard to the disposition of her guests and their luggage the counts bring them this way said she indicating certain trunks and not stopping to greet any of the party the young ladies this way to the left well and what are you gaping there for she cried to the maids have the samovar got ready plumper and prettier than ever she cried taking possession of natasha whose face under her hood was all rosy with the cold foo how cold you are there get off your wraps as quick as ever you can she cried to the count who was bending over to kiss her hand you're frozen most likely have some rum put in with the tea sonyushka bonjour said she to sonya showing by this french phrase and the pet diminutive her rather condescending and yet affectionate relationship to the girl when they had taken off their wraps and put themselves to rights after their journey they gathered round the tea-table and marya dmitrievna kissed them all in turn i am right glad that you have come and that you have put up at my house said she it is high time she went on giving natasha a significant look the old man is here and his son is expected from day to day you must you certainly must make his acquaintance well we'll talk about all this by and by she added giving sonya a look as much as to say that she did not care to talk about this in her presence now listen said she addressing the count what are your plans for to-morrow whom will you send for shinshin she doubled over one finger then that snivelling anna mikhailovna too she and her son are here sons to be married then Uzukoy, i suppose he and his wife are here he ran away from her but she came traipsing after him he dined with me on wednesday well then and these she indicated the young ladies i will take them to-morrow to the iverskaya chapel and then to albert chalmay's of course everything will have to be got new for them don't judge by me such sleeves they wear these days recently the young princess irina vasilyevna came to call upon me she was a marvel to see she had sleeves like two barrels on her arms you see there's some new fashion every day and what business have you on hand she asked turning sternly upon the count everything in the quickest possible time replied the count to buy the girls duds and to find a purchaser for my podmotskovanyoa land and house and so if you will allow me i will tear myself away for a little while and slip off to marinskoya for a day and leave my girls with you very good very good they'll be safe with me they couldn't be safer with the orphans aid society i'll take them wherever they need to go and scold them and spoil them with flattery said marya dmitrievna stroking with her big hand the cheek of her favorite goddaughter natasha the following morning they went to pray before the Iverskaya Virgin, and to see Mademoiselle Aubert-Chamé, who stood in such awe of Maria Dmitrievna that, in order to get rid of her as soon as possible, she would always sell her goods at a positive loss. Maria Dmitrievna ordered there the larger part of the trousseau. On their return she drove everybody else out of the room, and called Natasha to her armchair. "'Now, then, we can have a talk. I congratulate you on your choice. You have secured a fine young man.' i am glad for you i have known him ever since he was so high she put her hand an arshin from the floor 
Natasha colored with pleasure. I am fond of him and of all his family. Now, listen. You know very well that the old Prince Nikolai is very averse to having his son marry. A whimsical old man. However, Prince Andrei is not a child, and his permission is not necessary. Still, it is not pleasant to enter a family against their will. We must act quietly and with tact. You are clever. We will manage to bring him round where he ought to be. You must accomplish it by your sweetness and cleverness. That's all it requires, and it will come out all right. Natasha made no reply. From shyness, Maria Dmitrievna supposed, but in reality because it was so annoying to Natasha that anyone should meddle with her love affair with Prince Andrei, for it seemed to her so entirely above and beyond all ordinary human concerns that no one else, in her opinion, could understand it. She loved and admired Prince Andrei alone. He loved her, and was coming in a few days, and would make her his. That was all sufficient. You see, I have known him for a long time, and Mashenka also, your future sister-in-law. I am fond of her, in spite of the proverb about husband's sisters. She would not hurt a fly. She asked me to introduce her to you. You and your father must go there tomorrow. Be sure to be very sweet to her, for you are younger than she is. Before your friend comes, you will have already become acquainted with his sister and his father, and they will have grown fond of you. Am I not right? Isn't that best? Yes, replied Natasha, with little heartiness. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Seven. On the following day, by Maria Dmitrievna's advice, Count Ilya Andreyitch and Natasha went to call on Prince Bolkonsky's. The Count, in anything but a happy frame of mind, made ready for this call. In fact, he felt terribly about it. He remembered too well his last encounter with the old prince, at the time of the mobilizing of the militia, when, in answer to his invitation to a dinner party, he had received an angry reprimand for not having furnished his full quota of men. Natasha, however, having put on her best gown, was in the most radiant spirits. "'They cannot help being fond of me,' she said to herself. "'Everyone likes me, and I am so willing to do for them all they could wish.' I am so willing to love him because he is his father, and to love her because she is his sister, that they cannot fail to love me. They drove up to the gloomy old house on Vazvinhenka Street, and went into the entry. "'Well, God have mercy on us!' exclaimed the Count, half in jest, half in earnest. But Natasha observed that her father was very much agitated as he hastened into the anteroom and asked, in a timid, faltering voice, if the prince and the princess were at home. After their names had been sent in, the prince's servants seemed to be thrown into great perplexity. The footman, who had hurried off to announce them, was stopped by another footman at the drawing-room door, and the two began to whisper together. A chambermaid came hurrying into the hall, and she also had something to say to them in reference to the princess. Finally, a stern-faced, elderly footman approached the Rostovs and announced that the old prince was unable to receive them, but the princess would be glad to see them. Mademoiselle Burine first came to receive the visitors. She met them with more than ordinary politeness, and conducted them to the princess. The princess, agitated and nervous, her face covered with crimson patches, hastened forward, stepping heavily, and vainly endeavoring to appear calm and dignified. At first sight Natasha did not please her. It seemed to her that she was too fashionably dressed, too frivolous, flighty, and conceited. The Princess Maria did not realize that even before seeing her future sister-in-law she was prejudiced against her through an involuntary envy of her beauty, youth, and happiness, and jealousy of her brother's love for her. Over and above these obscure feelings of antipathy, the Princess Maria was still more agitated from the fact that when the Rostovs were announced— the prince had shouted at the top of his voice that he would not have anything to do with them, that the Princess Maria might receive them as she so desired, but that they should not come into his presence. The princess determined to receive them, but she was afraid lest at any minute the prince might perform some act of rudeness, since he seemed greatly stirred up by the Rostovs' arrival. "'I have brought my little songstress, my dear princess,' said the count with a bow and a scrape, 
and looking round anxiously, as though he were afraid of the old prince appearing on the scene. I am very anxious for you to become acquainted. I am sorry, very sorry, that the prince is ill. And, after making a few commonplace remarks, he got up, saying, If you will excuse me, princess, I will leave my Natasha with you for a brief quarter of an hour, while I slip out and call on Anna Semyonovna, who lives only a couple of steps from here. I will come back for her. Ilya Andreyitch, as he afterwards told his daughter, conceived this master stroke of subtle diplomacy for the purpose of giving the future sisters-in-law a chance to get better acquainted. But he had another reason besides, which was that he might escape the possibility of meeting the prince. This reason he did not confess to his daughter, but Natasha perceived this timidity and anxiety of her father's and felt abused. She blushed for him, and was still more annoyed with herself for having blushed, and she looked straight at the princess with a defiant, challenging expression that seemed to imply that there was nothing she was afraid of. The princess told the count that he was perfectly excusable, and only hoped that he would make his stay at Anna Semyonovna's as long as possible. Accordingly, Ilya Andreyitch took his departure. Mademoiselle Burine, in spite of the anxious, beseeching glances given her by the Princess Maria, who was anxious to have a confidential talk with Natasha, did not see fit to leave the room, and kept up a steady stream of chatter about the delights of Moscow and the theatres. Natasha was piqued by the confusion that had occurred in the reception room, by her father's cowardice, and by the unnatural tone affected by the princess, who, it seemed to her, felt it was an act of condescension to receive her, and, consequently, everything gave her a disagreeable impression. The Princess Maria displeased her. She thought she was very plain, stubborn, and unsympathetic. Natasha suddenly underwent a moral shrinking, as it were, and, in spite of herself, assumed such a reckless tone that the Princess Maria was still further alienated from her. After five minutes of a labored and artificial conversation, slippered feet were heard rapidly approaching. Into the Princess Maria's face came a sudden look of dismay. The door opened, and the old prince came in, dressed in a white nightcap and dressing gown. "'Ach! Suda Ruyinya, he exclaimed. "'Suda Ruyinya, Countess, Countess Rostova, if I am not mistaken. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. I did not know. Suda Ruyinya, for God I did not know that you were honouring us with your presence. I was coming to see my daughter, which explains this costume— I beg you to pardon it. For God, I did not know, he said for the second time, in such an unnatural tone, laying such a special stress on the word God, and speaking so disagreeably, that the Princess Maria got up, and dropped her eyes, not daring to look either at her father or at Natasha. Natasha got up, and then sat down again, and likewise knew not what to do. Only Mademoiselle Burine wore a pleasant smile. I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon. "'For God, I did not know,' grumbled the old prince, and, after staring at Natasha from head to foot, he left the room. Mademoiselle Burine was the first to recover self-possession after this apparition, and she began to talk about the prince's failing health. Natasha and the princess looked at each other without speaking, and the longer they looked at each other without expressing what they ought to have said, the more they were confirmed in their mutual dislike." When the Count returned, Natasha made an ill-mannered display of relief, and immediately prepared to take her departure. At this moment she almost hated this dried-up old princess, who by her silence had put her in such an awkward position, and who, in half an hour's talk with her, had not once mentioned Prince André. "'Of course I can't be the first to speak of him in the presence of that French woman,' said Natasha to herself. The Princess Maria, at the same time, was tormented by a similar compunction— she knew that it was her duty to say something to Natasha, but she found it impossible, both because Mademoiselle Burine's presence embarrassed her, and because she herself did not know what made it so difficult to speak on the coming marriage. After the Count had already left the room, Princess Maria went to Natasha with hurried steps, seized her hand, and with a deep sigh said, "'Wait a moment. I must.' Natasha gave the Princess Maria a satirical glance, though she could not have told what made her do so, and listened." "'My dear Nathalie,' said the Princess Maria, "'you must know I am delighted my brother has found happiness.' She paused with a consciousness that she was not telling the truth. Natasha noticed this pause and suspected the cause of it. "'I think, Princess, that it is not a propitious time to speak of this,' said Natasha, with an appearance of outward dignity and hauteur, 
while the tears almost choked her. "'What have I said? What have I said?' she wondered, as soon as she left the room. That day they waited for Natasha a long time at dinner. She was sitting in her room, sobbing like a child, blowing her nose, and then beginning to sob again. Sonya stood beside her and kissed her on the hair. "'Natasha, what is there to cry about?' she asked. "'Why should you care about them? It will all pass over, Natasha.' "'No, if you only knew how humiliating it was. I was just like—' "'Don't speak of it, Natasha. Of course you are not to blame. Then why should you let it trouble you? Kiss me,' said Sonya. Natasha lifted her head and kissed her friend on the lips, laying her tear-wet face next to hers. "'I cannot tell you. I do not know. No one is to blame,' said Natasha. "'If anyone is, I am. But all this is terribly painful. Ugh! Oh, why does he not come?' She went down to dinner with reddened eyes. Marya Dmitrievna, who had learned how the Rostovs had been received at the prince's, pretended to pay no attention to Natasha's disconsolate face and jested in loud and eager tones with the Count and her other guests. End of chapter 7「Part five, Chapter eight of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter eight. That evening the Rostovs went to the opera, Maria Dmitrievna having secured them tickets. Natasha felt no desire to go, but it was impossible for her to refuse her hostess's kindness, which had been designed expressly for her pleasure. When, after she was already dressed, and had gone into the parlor to wait for her father, she surveyed herself in the great pier-glass, and saw how pretty, how very pretty, she was. She felt even more melancholy than before, but her melancholy was mingled with a feeling of sweet and passionate love. Vos moi, if he were only here, I should not be so stupidly shy before him as I was before. I would throw my arms around him and cling close to him, and make him look at me with those deep, penetrating eyes of his, with which he has so often looked at me, and then I would make him laugh, as he laughed then, and his eyes, how plainly I can see his eyes even now, said Natasha to herself. And what do I care for his father and his sister? I love him, I love him, him alone, with his dear face and eyes, with his smile, like that of a man and like that of a child, too. No, it is better not to think about it to forget him and to forget that time, too, absolutely. I cannot endure this suspense. I shall be crying again. And she turned away from the mirror, exercising all her self-control not to burst into tears. And how can Sonya be so calm and unconcerned in her love for Nikolenka, and wait so long and patiently, she wondered, as she saw her cousin coming toward her, also in full dress, and with her fan in her hand. No, she is entirely different from me. I cannot. Natasha at that moment felt herself so full of passion and tenderness that it was not enough to love and to know that she was loved. What she wanted now, at this instant, was to throw her arms around her lover's neck and speak to him and hear him speak those words of love of which her heart was full. As she rode along in the carriage, sitting next to her father, and dreamily looking at the lamplights that flashed through the frost-covered windows, she felt still deeper in love and still more melancholy than ever, and she quite forgot with whom and where she was going. Their carriage fell into the long line, and the wheels slowly creaked over the snow as they drew up to the steps of the theatre. The two girls gathered up their skirts and quickly jumped out. The Count clambered down, supported by the footman, and, making their way through the throng of ladies and gentlemen and program vendors, the three went into the corridor that led to their box. Already the sounds of music were heard through the closed doors. Nathalie, your hair, whispered Sonya in French. The Capaldiner, hastening past the ladies, politely opened their box door. The music sounded louder. The brightly lighted rows of boxes occupied by ladies with bared shoulders and arms, and the parterre filled with brilliant uniforms, dazzled their eyes. A lady who entered the adjoining box shot a glance of feminine envy at Natasha. The curtain was still down, and the orchestra was playing the overture. Natasha, shaking out her train, went forward with Sonya and took her seat, 
glancing at the brightly lighted boxes on the opposite side of the house. The sensation, which she had not experienced for a long time, of having hundreds of eyes staring at her bare arms and neck, affected her all at once with mixed pleasure and discomfort, and called up a whole swarm of recollections, desires, and emotions associated with that sensation. Natasha and Sonya, both remarkably pretty girls, and Count Ilya Andreyitch, who had not been seen for a long time in Moscow, naturally attracted attention. Moreover, everyone had a general notion that Natasha was engaged to marry Prince Andrei, and everybody knew that ever since the engagement the Rostovs had been residing at their country estate, therefore they looked with much curiosity at the bride of one of the most desirable men in Russia. Natasha's beauty, as everybody told her, had improved during their stay in the country, and that evening, owing to her excited state of mind, she was extraordinarily beautiful. No one could have failed to be struck by her exuberance of life and beauty, and her complete indifference to everything going on around her. Her dark eyes wandered over the throng, not seeking for anyone in particular, and her slender arm, bare above the elbow, leaned on the velvet rim of the box, while with evident unconsciousness of what she was doing, she crumpled her program, folding and unfolding it in time with the orchestra. "'Look, there's Elenina,' said Sonya, "'with her mother, I think.' "'Saints! Mikhail Kirilluitch has grown fat, though!' exclaimed the old count. "'See, there's our Anna Mikhailovna. What kind of a headdress has she on? There are the Karagans and Boris with them, evidently enough an engaged couple. Drubetskoy must have proposed.' "'What? Didn't you know it? T'was announced to-day,' said Shin Shin, coming into their box. Natasha looked in the same direction that her father was looking, and saw Julie, who, with a string of pearls around her fat red neck, covered with powder, as Natasha knew well, was sitting next to her mother with a radiantly happy face. Behind them could be seen Boris's handsome head, with sleekly brushed hair. He was leaning over so that his ear was close to Julie's mouth, and as he looked askance at the Rostovs, he was saying something to his bride. "'They're talking about us, about me,' thought Natasha, "'and she's probably jealous of me, and he is trying to calm her. "'They need not worry about it. "'If they only knew how little I cared about them.' Behind them sat Anna Mikhailovna, festive and blissful, and wearing her habitual expression of utter resignation to God's will. Their box was redolent, of the atmosphere characteristic of a newly engaged couple, which Natasha knew and loved so well. She turned away, and suddenly all the humiliating circumstances of her morning visit recurred to her memory. What right has he not to be willing to receive me as a relation? Ugh! I think it best not to think about this, at least not till he comes back, she said to herself, and she began to scan the faces of strangers or acquaintances in the parterre. In the front row, in the very middle of the house, leaning his back against the railing, stood Dolokhov, in Persian costume, with his curly hair combed back into a strange and enormous ridge. He was standing in full view of the whole theatre, knowing that he was attracting the attention of everybody in the house, yet looking as unconcerned as though he were in the privacy of his own room. Around him were gathered a throng of the gilded youth of Moscow, and it was evident that he was their leader." Count Ilya Andreyitch, with a smile, nudged the blushing Sonya, and called her attention to her former suitor. "'Do you recognize him? And where did he turn up from?' asked the Count of Shinchin. "'He had disappeared entirely, had he not?' "'Yes, completely,' replied Shinchin. "'While he was in the Caucasus he deserted, and they say he became a minister to some reigning prince in Persia. After that he killed the Shah's brother.' and now all the young ladies of Moscow have lost their wits over him. Dolokhov Leperzin, and that's the end of it. Here with us there's nothing to be done without Dolokhov. They swear by him. He has made a subject of invitation, as though he were a sterlet, said Shinshin. Dolokhov and Anatole Kuragin have turned the heads of all our young ladies. Just then into the next box came a tall, handsome lady with a tremendous plait of hair and a great display of plump white shoulders and neck, around which she wore a double string of large pearls. She was a long time in settling herself with a great rustling of her stiff silk dress. Natasha found herself involuntarily gazing at that neck, those shoulders and pearls, and that headdress, and she was amazed at their beauty. Just as Natasha was taking a second look at her, 
the lady glanced round, and, fixing her eyes on Count Ilya Andreyitch, nodded her head and smiled. It was Countess Buzakaya, Pierre's wife. Ilya Andreyitch, who knew everyone in society, leaned over and spoke with her. "'Have you been here long, Countess?' he inquired. "'I'm coming in. I'm coming in soon to kiss your hand. I'm in town on business, and have got my girls with me. They say Semyonova plays her part superbly,' said Ilya Andreyitch. I hope Count Pyotr Kirillovich has not entirely forgotten us. Is he here? Yes, he was intending to come, said Ellen, and she gave Natasha a scrutinizing look. Count Ilya Andreyitch again sat back in his place. Isn't she pretty, though? asked he of Natasha. A perfect marvel, replied the latter. I could understand falling in love with her. By this time the last notes of the overture were heard, and the baton of the Kapellmeister rapped upon the stand. Those gentlemen who were in late slipped down to their places, and the curtain rose. As soon as the curtain went up, silence reigned in the parterre, and in the boxes, and all the gentlemen, young and old, whether in uniform or in civilian's dress, and all the ladies, with precious stones glittering on their bare bosoms, with eager expectation, turned their attention to the stage. Natasha also tried to look. End of chapter 8 Part Five, Chapter Nine of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Nine. Smooth boards formed the center of the stage. On the sides stood painted canvases representing trees. In the background, a cloth was stretched out on boards. In the foreground, girls in red bodices and white petticoats were sitting around. One who was exceedingly stout wore a white silk dress. She sat by herself on a low footstool, to the back of which was glued green cardboard. They were all singing something. After they had finished their chorus, the girl in white advanced toward the prompter's box, and a man in silk tights on his stout legs, and with a feather and a dagger, joined her, and began to sing and wave his arms. The man in the tights sang alone, then she sang, then they were both silent. The orchestra played, and the man began to turn down the fingers on the girl's hand, evidently waiting for the beat, when they should begin to sing their parts together. They sang a duet, and then all in the audience began to clap and to shout, and the man and the woman on the stage, who had been representing lovers, got up, smiling and letting go of hands, and bowed in all directions. After her country life, and the serious frame of mind into which Natasha had lately fallen, all this seemed to her wild and strange. She was unable to follow the thread of the opera, and it was only as much as she could do to listen to the music. She saw only painted canvas and oddly dressed men and women going through strange motions, talking and singing in a blaze of light. She knew what all this was meant to represent, but it all struck her as so affected, unnatural, and absurd that some of the time she felt ashamed for the actors, and again she felt like laughing at them. She looked around at the faces of the spectators, to see if she could detect in them any of this feeling of ridicule and perplexity which she felt, but all these faces were absorbed in what was taking place on the stage, or, as it seemed to Natasha, expressed a hypocritical enthusiasm. "'This must be, I suppose, very lifelike,' said Natasha. She kept gazing now at those rows of pomaded heads in the parterre, then at the half-naked women in the boxes, and most of all at her neighbor Ellen, who, as undressed as she could well be, gazed with a faint smile of satisfaction at the stage, not dropping her eyes, conscious of the brilliant light that overflowed the auditorium and the warm atmosphere heated by the throng. Natasha gradually began to enter into a state of intoxication which she had not experienced for a long time. She had no idea who she was, or where she was, or of what was going on before her. She gazed and let her thoughts wander at will, and the strangest, most disconnected ideas flashed unexpectedly through her mind. Now she felt inclined to leap upon the edge of the box and sing the aria which the actress had just been singing. Then she felt an impulse to tap with her fan a little old man who was sitting not far off, then again to lean over to Ellen and tickle her. At one time, when there was perfect silence on the stage just before the beginning of an aria, the door that led into the parterre, near where the Rostovs were seated, creaked on its hinges, 
and a man who came in late was heard passing down to his seat. "'There goes Kuragin,' whispered Shinshin. The Countess Buzakaya turned her head and smiled at the newcomer. Natasha followed the direction of the Countess Buzakaya's eyes and saw an extraordinarily handsome adjutant who, with an air of extreme self-confidence, but at the same time of good breeding, was just passing by their box. This was Anatole Kuragin, whom she had seen and noticed some time before at a ball in Petersburg. He now wore his adjutant's uniform, with epaulette and shoulder knot. He advanced with a supreme air of youthful gallantry, which would have been ludicrous had he not been so handsome, and had his handsome face not worn such an expression of cordial good humor and merriment. Although it was during the act, he sauntered along the carpeted corridor, slightly jingling his spurs and holding his perfumed, graceful head on high with easy grace. Glancing at Natasha, he joined his sister, laid his exquisitely gloved hand on the edge of her box, nodded to her, and bent over to ask some questions in reference to Natasha. Mais charmante, said he, evidently referring to her. She understood less from hearing his words than from the motion of his lips. Then he went forward to the front row and took his seat near Dolokhov, giving him a friendly, careless nudge with his elbow, though the others treated him with such worshipful consideration. The other, with a merry lifting of the eyebrows, gave him a smile and put up his foot against the railing. "'How like brother and sister are,' said the Count, "'and how handsome they both are.' Shinshin, in an undertone, began to tell the Count some story about Kurigan's intrigues in Moscow, to which Natasha listened simply because he had spoken of her as charmante. The first act was over. All in the parterre got up, mingled together, and began to go and come. Boris came to the Rostovs' box, received their congratulations very simply, and, smiling abstractedly and raising his brows, invited Natasha and Sonya, on behalf of his betrothed, to be present at their wedding, and then left them. Natasha, with a bright, coquettish smile, had talked with him and congratulated him on his engagement, although it was the same Boris with whom she had been in love only a short time before. This, in her intoxicated, excited state, seemed to her perfectly simple and natural. The bare-bosomed Ellen sat near her, and showered her smiles indiscriminately on all, and in exactly the same way Natasha smiled on Boris. Ellen's box was crowded by the most influential and witty men of the city, who also gathered around the front of it, on the parterre side, vying with each other, apparently, in their desire to let it be known that they were acquainted with her. Kuragin, throughout the entire entre-acte, stood with Lopukov, with his back to the stage, in the very front row, and kept his eyes fixed on the Rostovs' box. Natasha felt certain that he was talking about her, and it afforded her gratification. She even turned her head slightly, in a way which, in her opinion, best showed off the beauty of her profile. Before the beginning of the second act, Pierre, whom the Rostovs had not seen since their arrival, made his appearance. His face wore an expression of sadness, and he was stouter than when Natasha had last seen him. Without recognizing anyone, he passed down to the front row. Anatole joined him and began to make some remark, looking and pointing to the Rostovs' box. A flash of animation passed over Pierre's face as he caught sight of Natasha, and he hastily made his way across through the seats to where she was, then, leaning his elbows on the edge of her box, he had a long conversation with her. While she was talking with Pierre, she heard a man's voice in the Countess Buzakoya's box, and something told her that it was Anatole Kurigan. She glanced round, and their eyes met. She almost smiled, and he looked straight into her eyes with such an admiring, tender gaze that it seemed to her strange to be so near him, to see him, to be so sure that she pleased him, and yet not to be acquainted with him. In the second act, the stage represented a cemetery, and there was a hole in the canvas, which represented the moon, and the footlights were turned down, and the horns and contrabasses began to play in very deep tones, and the stage was invaded from both sides by a throng of men in black mantles. These men began to wave their arms, brandishing what seemed to be daggers. Then some other men rushed forward, and proceeded to drag away by main force that damsel who, in the previous act, had been dressed in white, but was now in a blue dress. Before they dragged her away, they sang with her for a long time, and at the sound of three thumps on something metallic behind the scenes, all fell on their knees and began to sing a prayer. 
a number of times all these actions were interrupted by the enthusiastic plaudits of the spectators every time during this act that natasha looked down into the parterre she saw anatole kuragin with his arm carelessly thrown across the back of his seat gazing at her it was pleasant for her to feel that she had so captivated him and it never entered into her head that in all this there was anything improper when the second act was over the countess buzakaya stood up leaned over to the rostov's box thereby exposing her whole bosom beckoned the old count to come to her and then paying no heed to those who came to her box to pay her their homage she began a smiling confidential conversation with him you must certainly make me acquainted with your charming girls said she the whole city are talking about them and i don't know them natasha got up and made a curtsey to this magnificent countess the flattery of this brilliant beauty was so intoxicating to her that she blushed with pleasure and gratification i mean to be a muscovite also said ellen and aren't you ashamed of yourself to hide such pearls in the country the countess buzakoya by good rights had the reputation of being a fascinating woman she could say the opposite of what she thought and could flatter in the most simple and natural manner now my dear count you must allow me to see something of your daughter though i don't expect to be here very long you don't either i believe i shall try to make them have a good time i hear a good deal about you in petersburg and i wanted to make your acquaintance said she turning to natasha with her stereotyped bewitching smile i heard about you from my page drubetskoy have you heard by the way that he was engaged and from my husband's friend bolkonsky prince andrei bolkonsky said she with an especial emphasis signifying thereby that she knew of his relations toward natasha then she proposed that in order to become better acquainted one of the young ladies should come over into her box for the rest of the performance and natasha went during the third act the scenes represented a palace wherein many candles were blazing while on the walls hung paintings representing full bearded knights in the centre stood apparently a czar and tsaritsa the czar was gesticulating with his right hand and after singing something with evident timidity and certainly very wretchedly he took his seat on a crimson throne the damsel who had at first been dressed in white and then in blue was now in nothing but a shift with dishevelled hair and stood near the throne she was warbling some doleful ditty addressed to the tsaritsa but the tsar peremptorily waved his hand and from the side scenes came a number of bare-legged men and bare-legged women and began to dance all together then the fiddles played a very dainty and merry tune one girl with big bare legs and thin arms coming out from among the others went behind the scenes and having adjusted her corsage came into the centre of the stage and began to caper around and knock her feet together the whole parterre clapped their hands and shouted bravo then a man took his stand in one corner the orchestra played louder than ever with a clanging of cymbals and blare of horns and this bare-legged man alone by himself began to make very high jumps and kick his feet together this man was duport who earned sixty thousand roubles a year by his art all in the parterre in the boxes and in the upper paradise began to thump and shout with all their might and the man paused and smiled and bowed to all sides then some others danced bare-legged men and women then one of the royal personages shouted something with musical accompaniment and all began to sing but suddenly a storm arose chromatic scales and diminished sevenths were heard in the orchestra and all scattered behind the scenes carrying off with them again one of those who was present and the curtain fell once more among the audience arose a terrible roar and tumult and all with enthusiastic faces shouted at once duport 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 natasha no longer looked upon this as strange or unusual with a sense of satisfaction she looked around her smiling joyously ne sais pas qu'il est admirable duport asked ellen turning to her oh oui replied natasha End of chapter nine